Hey gang, this is Ron from ITMasterKey.com. And in this video series and course, we're gonna be going through some fundamentals for IT. So if you're a beginner, if you don't really have that much experience with information technology, or if you're just trying to get a refresher on information technology, this is the course for you. So this course is gonna be going over a multitude of things. So no matter if you take an account TITF plus exam, or if you just want a refresher or just want an introduction to IT, I got you covered. So in this actual course, we're gonna be going over six core topics. So those topics are IT terminology and concepts, infrastructure, application and software, software development, database fundamentals, and security. So let's go ahead and get into the first video. Hopefully you enjoy. If you want a full course, or if you enrolled in a full course, I'm proud of you. But if you're looking for a full course for IT fundamentals, head over to itmasterkey.com and enroll. So this video series is just gonna be the lectures. Over at itmasterkey.com, we're actually gonna break it down a lot more. And it's also gonna be simulations and a bunch of practice tests to get you ready for the actual exam. So you guys wanted IT fundamentals. I listened to you, so here it is. Enjoy. All right, again, the next topic in our video series and course is going to be the importance of data. Nowadays, your data is considered an asset. So your cell phone, for instance, right? Your cell phone isn't just something that you call people on, that you text people on. Your cell phone is pretty much like your digital wallet, your digital portfolio, your digital lifeline, right? Most people can't really operate without their cell phone because they have personal information on there, they got passwords, they got GPS, that's another thing. You know, most people, if you don't have a GPS, you can't get to where you're going. So that's why data has become an asset. And data is simply defined as factual information, such as measurements or statistics used as a basis for reasoning, discussion, or calculation. So a lot of companies, right, love your data. Facebook loves your data. Google loves your data. Uh, Instagram loves your data. The FBI loves your data. All right, so if you think that um, you're surfing the web or you're doing things and nobody's watching you, eh, good luck with that, all right? Now, so a lot of people that are watching you, um, it may not be for nefarious or malicious reasons, but there is somebody watching you. And the reason that organizations want to watch you is because of advertising, right? So with your data, somebody can get your entire life, pinpoint your location, uh, where you work, your likes, and your dislikes. So with data now being looked at as an asset, it's super important that in a perfect world that your data is always private and always secure. Now, it's getting more and more important to have secure data and your privacy as well. Now, that's going to be up to you. We can talk um, about data privacy and security a little bit later on, but right now, we want to just talk about data being an asset. We're going to go ahead and go to the next slide because you should understand that data is your lifeblood. Um, with the right amount of data, somebody can literally steal your identity and become who you are. All right, so let's talk about intellectual property. So these courses that are over at itmasterkey.com, um, my YouTube channel, all of the things that I create digitally are digital products, right? Meaning that there's not something physical that you can touch, but it's something that you can digitally engage with. So intellectual property is super important. So that little guy on the bottom left that's smiling, that's me, should be pretty close, I think. Um, that would be intellectual property. This entire lecture would be my intellectual property, all right? So the actual definition of intellectual property is creations of the mind, such as inventions, literary and artistic works, designs, symbols, names, and images used in commerce, um, also known as business. 
So let's talk about the differences between trademarks, copyrights, and patents. So you see my logo and then you see some other super recognizable logos, right? So you got McDonald's, um, Nike, you got Starbucks. So if any of you guys have seen uh, Coming to America, right? Um, there's a restaurant in Coming to America called McDowell's, right? In real life, McDowell's would have probably had a problem. They would have had a problem. They didn't have a problem in the movie because um, it was called McDowell's. They had some different, whatever McDonald's did, they kind of did the opposite, but it was pretty much the same damn restaurant. So trademarks allows you to separate yourself from other people and not allow people to use your logo or your phrase um, without some kind of compensation, right? So McDonald's, everybody, no matter where you are in the world, that logo right there is McDonald's. No matter where you are in the world, everybody knows the uh, Nike symbol. If you want some coffee, uh, drop in the comments what the hell that lady's supposed to represent. I don't know what the, who that lady is, or if that's like the, the if the lady is a uh, if a, the founder is a lady or what. I don't know what that logo represents. But if you want coffee, you know that Starbucks, uh, the green uh, logo with the lady in the front, is for Starbucks. So those are trademarks, right? Now copyrights. Um, whenever you watch a movie, whenever you go to a movie, it's usually a big warning to say, hey. FBI warning, you know, this movie, this material is copywritten, right? So if something is copywritten, it means that you cannot copy, you can't license, you can't use that information without explicit consent from whoever the creator is, okay? So trademarks is usually logos and phrases and stuff like that. Copyrights is, hey, I'm going to actually ask you, can I have the copyrights to this so I can use it in a movie or use it in a music video? So let's just say that... Um, in this video, I want to play um, some. Uh, I want to play some um, the baby or something in this actual lecture, right? As soon as I upload this lecture to um, the internet, I'm going to get hit with a copyright, meaning that hey, you didn't ask this artist if you could use that music, or if I want to use some clips from um, a, a, mu a movie, I'll get hit with copyright as well. Patents. So patents, um, if you watch Shark Tank, right, uh, most of the time they'll ask, hey, do you have a patent on this? And they'll say patent pending or something like that. So a patent just means that I have an idea, this is what I want to create, or I've actually created something and I want to put a patent on it and pretty much lock down this design so nobody else can make and create this design. Make sense? Good. All right, so we kind of... Um, touched on this a little bit before when we were talking about data being an asset. So data, um, this is kind of a big thing with Facebook because like I said, Facebook collects a, a bunch of your data and then sells it to advertisers. Like, hey, this guy is in um, a group about sneakers. He um, is always liking pictures about sneakers. So let me sell this data to, face, uh, to Foot Locker and to East Bay and to um, Foot Action and to Nike's and start advertising and marketing to this guy because this is what he likes. Oh, this girl is liking pictures of Greece, and then she likes a picture of France, and then she likes a picture of Chicago, and she likes a picture of Alaska. All right, so maybe she wants to travel or likes to travel, so let's start sending her airfare and hotels.com and stuff like that, right? So, it's like this says, um, if you ever feel like somebody's watching you, on the internet, somebody's collecting that information. Uh, for example, every time you type something into Google, that is being collected and then it's being sold to uh, businesses to um, retarget advertising to you. Um, that's just, you know, not, nothing scary, but that's just what it is. So if you've ever noticed that, hey, you start looking up old muscle cars and then next time you go on Google, on the side, it's a bunch of frames for 1970 Chevelles or it's... Um, uh, tires for 80, uh, 80s uh, Trans Am or something like that, right? So they use all that to collect and pretty much build a profile on you to figure out, okay, how can we um, advertise to this person? Because you have to understand uh, those big companies like Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, TikTok, uh, and a lot of those different types of social media platforms are highly dependent on advertising dollars. That's pretty much how they make their money. So uh, they can use your browsing habits to advertise products that you may be likely to buy, improve your browsing experience. Um, they say they improve it by pretty much showing you stuff that you're more likely to like. 
So if they notice, like I said, that you like cars and your Facebook feed, your Instagram feed, you'll start seeing more muscle cars. You'll start seeing more um, mechanic hobby stuff, stuff like that, okay? Um, and last but not least, they can create a database of customers that are like you to start advertising to them as well. Okay, this guy is uh, 30 years old. He's from Detroit. He likes this. He likes that. He works here. Okay, I wonder if there's more people like him or if, it, uh, you know, most people that are from Detroit, if they do like this, and they kind of try and make a, a demographic. So, gang, I already know that you learned more than you knew about data um, before you clicked on this video. If you're watching this video on YouTube, make sure that you comment, like, and subscribe because uh, in the actual course, we're about to go into a story time kind of and just kind of drill all this stuff home if you want to enroll inside of the full course you can head over to itmagicky.com not only will you get lectures but you'll get uh, scenario questions you'll get practice exams you'll get simulations you'll get a more immersive experience over there if you're already in the course go ahead and go to the next lecture and you'll see what i'm talking about other than that i'll see you in class Hey gang, it's Rob and I want to welcome you to the first episode and the first lecture in our web series and course. So this course is going to be for people who want a strong foundation in IT, so the fundamentals of IT. So if you've been preparing for A+, and feel like maybe A+, is a little bit too much for you, and you want a precursor or a prerequisite to A+, or if you just want to get a little bit better or feel a little bit more comfortable with IT in general, this is the video series and course for you so to knock stuff out really fast I'm just going to make sure that you guys know that this first lecture right don't get scared don't get uh, nervous don't act weird just because it's some numbers doesn't mean that it's gonna be difficult right so we're gonna break down the way the computers speak the way that computers talk to each other on the network, just to give you a good representation and a good introduction to how things work. Ready to get into it? Let's get into it. So, notional systems, right? First thing we wanna talk about is binary. So binary is the language that computers speak in. Not English, not French, not Spanish but binary so that is the way that computers talk to each other that's how they compute things that's how they figure things out so binary is a system of ones and zeros or ons and offs so one will represent on while zero will represent off real simple if you didn't know before binary is the language of computers that simple let that sear in your brain if you didn't know What's a binary? If you want to look cool to somebody, tell somebody, hey, did you know that computers, I don't know if they'll think you're cool if you, anyway, so <laughs> uh, binary is uh, the system that devices and PCs use to talk to each other, ones and zeros. That is the language of computers. Sound good? Next up, so hexadecimal is an easier representation because it's less characters and less binary values than binary. If you write out something in binary, it's gonna be a lot longer than if you've written it in hexadecimal. Right there is an example of hexadecimal, and an example of something that uses hexadecimal would be your MAC address, M-A-C, your MAC address. So your MAC address is your physical address. Let's go back. Binary is the language that computers use, right? And then the MAC address, which is represented in hexadecimal, is going to be the physical address of that computer or that device. Every device has a MAC address, and devices use binary to communicate to each other. Sound good? Last but not least is the decimal format. So a good example of decimal would be your IP address. Anything that connects to a network or anything that connects to the internet needs an IP address. Binary is the language that computers use. Hexadecimal, an example of that, is your MAC address, which is your physical address. 
your IP address is your address on the network so if you're on ESPN.com if you're on itmasterkey.com if you're on google.com that network those devices know where to send the information that you're looking for okay so binary is what very good what is a example of a hexadecimal address very good what is an example of a decimal address very good and just in case y'all wasn't saying that while I was asking binary is the language that computers talk in your MAC address is an example of a hexadecimal address and that's a physical address then and decimal format is an IP address All right, so that IP address is a version 4 IP address which is represented in decimal while a version 6 IP address is going to be presented in hexadecimal you don't need to know that per se but that's just a little bit more info for you alright so before you watch this lecture you probably didn't know any of these things now you do pat yourself on the back you should be proud alright guys so in the next episode of our video lectures and our video course and our full course we're going to be talking about data types so there are five common data types in this quick lecture we're going to go over those data types then we're going to go through a small practical exercise if you're inside the course if you're not inside the course then you need to head over to itmasterkey.com and enroll inside of the course and then after that we're going to go through a quick little quiz let's go ahead and get into it all right so data types so the first data types are going to be character or chr so characters are fixed length fields it can be letters numbers or other characters as long as they're supported in whatever database that you're using next is going to be strings which is just a sequence of characters or numbers or a sequence of characters and numbers next up is uh, integers so this data type represents a range of mathematical integers and are represented as a group of binary digits called bits so quick quiz in our first lecture in our first video we talked about binary do we remember what binary is of course you do binary is just simply the language of devices It's how that computers actually talk to each other the ones and zeros next up is floats these are used to represent high precision fractional values last but not least is boolean I don't know why I said it like that but boolean uh, is a uh, true or false values so the five data types are character strings integers floats and boolean so be proud of yourself that you just learned five new data types that you didn't know before so when it comes to storage storage is a really big deal you know how much stuff can I save uh, how many videos can I save how much music can I save so on and so forth now you know when computers first came out don't quote me but I want to say one of the first computers only had like either 512 megabytes or kilobytes and pretty much it was like nobody's ever gonna need more space in that. nobody's ever gonna need more space in that. but now that we got uh, HD movies we got uh, video games we got all this different stuff you need more and more space so most phones now are at least 60 to 128 gigs right so we said that we were talking about kilobytes and megabytes but most phones now have way more space on your actual cell phone and then most PCs and laptops have at least 500 to a terabyte if not more so, but uh, most uh, PCs and laptops you're gonna be hard-pressed to find a new PC or laptop without 500 gigabytes of space minimum because but like I said everything going on and file size is getting so much bigger if you have anything less than that you're gonna run out of space really fast so real simple going down the line the smallest unit of data or the smallest storage unit is gonna be bits right there's eight bits in a byte there's a thousand and twenty four bits excuse me a thousand twenty four bytes in a kilobyte 1024 kilobytes and a megabyte 1024 megabytes and a gigabyte 1024 gigabytes and a terabyte then 1024 terabytes and a petabyte so we also have zettabytes but you don't have to worry about that now but terabytes um, is pretty much what you're going to see 
now as far as for home computing uh, if you have a petabyte I mean hey you can do what you want to but if you have a petabyte that's kind of doing a ridiculous something that's doing a lot especially if you just there's movies and stuff like that but hey who knows like I said with the more higher resolutions with the more in-depth graphics with the bigger file sizes maybe a petabyte one day is gonna be no big deal but right now it's still pretty impressive right um, but right now a terabyte should be um, a couple terabytes because um, the laptops that I have most of them are all have a terabyte and then the PC that I have has three terabytes and that's doing pretty good but like I said you know I have external drive and stuff like that that I you can definitely fill up a terabyte pretty easy right pretty easy so over time if you don't delete stuff if you're not paying attention you can definitely uh, fill that up but um, this is pretty much just the from the smallest to the biggest storage units how big so we start from bits and go all the way up to petabytes okay and uh, if you're in the course we're actually gonna go through um, a practice quiz to drill this home um, to make sure that you fully get um, what you need to get if you're watching this on YouTube no big deal just make sure that you are aware of these different sizes if you knew this great um, if it's a refresher for you no big deal if you've never seen it just make sure that your drill is in your head but like I said if you're in the course which you should be um, make sure that you drill this um, down pretty good okay all right now we're gonna talk about throughput so throughput is important when we're talking about internet especially um, with what we're going through as far as uh, the C word um, everybody or a lot of people had to transition working from home and also getting educated from home so your internet speed was super important um, if you were using a, a kilobit uh, internet I feel sorry for you because that's actually like dial-up internet and it's pretty slow and most most websites is gonna take forever for those to load so just understand the throughput is pretty much how fast data can travel alright so how fast data can travel alright so how fast it takes for something to be processed right so we got megabits per second and we got gigabits per second now the internet connection that you're probably using right now is megabits per second when we get into the gigabit speeds then we talking about fiber alright so most of the time and terabit, terabit speed is super crazy fast right um, in local neighborhoods you're not gonna really find that um, you can find uh, gigabit speeds um, it's not as wide as um, megabits but newer neighborhoods and stuff like that um, have gigabit speed internet but for the most part most of you guys are probably using megabits per second which which is pretty fast which is fast enough um, the internet that I'm using at my home um, and in my office is not the office no at the office it is gigabit no <laughs> at the office is gigabit but um, right now I'm at home uh, it's a uh, megabits right so uh, you got gigabit super fast uh, terabit is just that's, that's just pretty much soon as you before you even think about damn clicking it it's an already popped up on your screen this just lightning crazy fast okay all right so last but not least processing speed so let's say um, sometimes it's kind of hard to figure out damn what kind of computer do I need so we figured out the storage okay we figured out okay probably 500 gigabytes to a terabyte preferably a terabyte of storage what's the next biggest thing so the next biggest thing is going to be processing speed of your CPU if you have a CPU that is measured in megahertz that's a really slow processor right so we want to make sure that it's in gigahertz the more gigahertz the faster the processing speed all right megahertz no bueno gigahertz great but we want to make sure as many gigahertz as possible um, pretty much sort of be sustainable right so it's gonna be good right now and then as new technology comes out as new things come out as you're trying to add stuff to uh, your laptop or your PC it'll be able to handle all those extra processes but at the same time I don't want you spending 30 grand on a damn laptop um, but just make sure it has enough gigahertz to do whatever you're trying to accomplish hey gang it's Rob once again and in this video lecture we're gonna be talking about input and output devices so in our last couple lectures we talked about binary we talked about data types 
In this lecture, we're going to talk about different types of devices, what would be considered input and what would be considered output. Let's go ahead and get straight into it. Since you guys are super smart, I'm pretty sure that you will be able to look at the things on the left and the things on the right and understand why the things on the left would be considered input or the things on the right would be considered output. So I'm going to give you some time to dwell on that and then we'll talk about it as a family. All right, enough time. So a keyboard is considered an input device because you input stuff. So you type out your name, you type out a calculation, you type out whatever you want to type out and you input that and you give that information to uh, the device, your cell phone, whatever it is, right? Go to the next one. So pointing devices, your mouse. So your mouse, you input clicks and uh, the computer gives you feedback, you input something. Scanners, put the stuff on the scanner glass, then it scans that information into your device. Microphone, you put audio into the microphone and it takes that and puts it inside of the computer or the device, whatever you're using. And on the inverse of that, a speaker will be output. So the microphone, you input your stuff and then it comes out of the speakers. Display devices, output an image. Printers, output papers or whatever else you want it to print. Makes sense? Very good. Of course it does. You guys are super smart, so this is too easy for you. So look down this list. These will be considered both input and output devices, okay? So a flash drive, you can put stuff and save stuff on the flash drive and you actually take stuff out of the flash drive as well okay uh, external hard drive is just simply a hard drive that's outside of a, a computer or stuff like that so it's an external hard drive outside of the computer case so you can put stuff on it save stuff on it or take stuff off of it all the rest of these are the same so a cd put stuff on take stuff off network attached storage or nas is simply just a hard drive or a server that's attached to the network and that you can save stuff to it or take stuff off of it as long as you're on that network as long as you're connected to that network memory card same thing mobile media players smartphones and fax machines all of these devices you can put stuff on it or you can take stuff out make sense of course it does hey gang you just learned or you just reinforce um, different input and output devices. So our second domain is gonna be infrastructure. So how things are set up from the foundation all the way up to the most complex parts of an organization, a network, so on and so forth. So you got a lot of information in the first domain and pretty much the stuff that we talked about in the first domain, this is just gonna build on that stuff. So you ready? Let's get right into it. All right, gang, and this episode of our web series and lecture we're going to go over input and output interfaces we're going to talk about a little bit of networking and a couple of different ways to install different types of devices let's go ahead and get into it so in networking right a long time ago long time ago uh, if you use aol when it first came out nine times out of ten you were going to be using dial-up meaning that you were getting on the internet via your telephone line and if you use dial-up internet the little connector the little plastic piece on the end of that was called an rj11 now most days or most people um if they're using internet now you know i hope you know fingers crossed if you're still using dial-up god bless you but most people now are using ethernet and that is um, a picture of ethernet cable at the bottom of the screen and that little connector on the end of there is called an rj45 now with networking we got a couple different ways to actually connect to things and send information right so two things that um, are a little bit newer and are pretty much on most devices and most cell phones for sure is bluetooth so bluetooth um, just like that little Thing in the top right corner if you turn that on you can send things wirelessly or you can use devices wirelessly right through Bluetooth capability now near field communication or NFC is a proximity um, technology so you can use that for payments so if you got like Apple pay or Google pay if you have an NFC enabled device whether that's your cell phone or tablet you can actually wave your 
smartphone or your cell phone up against a payment register. I mean, it's pretty much at every um, store or places you go, whether it's Walgreens, the mall, McDonald's, you can actually use NFC, near field communications, and just wave your device up against the payment kiosk and it'll actually take the payment out. Okay? All right, so here's a few peripherals. All right, so peripheral is a big ass word. It just means that stuff that's outside of your laptop, right? So a printer would be a peripheral. A scanner would be a peripheral. A mouse would be a peripheral. A keyboard would be a peripheral. A mic would be a peripheral. All right, so just the additional attachments, the additional devices, just remember that those are peripherals. Now, this list is just a couple of different peripheral connection types and technologies. So Firewire, you only find that as much. Some cameras still use a Firewire connection, but mostly um, Firewire has been replaced by USB. Uh, most um, devices are USB. Firewire, like I said, is used on um, some cameras, but for the most part, it's been replaced by USB. Another one is a Thunderbolt, and that was introduced as a much faster way to transfer data, download stuff, so on and so forth than USB. Then, like we were talking about in the previous slide, you have Bluetooth. That's another way that you can transfer data. One a very old um, way that we used to transfer data and stuff like that or uh, use devices was RF. Now, RF is still used, um, and one of the biggest things that you probably used before is a remote. All right, only thing about RF or radio frequency, it needs a line of sight, good line of sight to actually be able to um, not block that signal, right? So it needs a clear path in between you and whatever it's trying to point to. Um, now, even most remotes use Bluetooth, right? So if you got a fire stick or you got um, some kind of other remote, a lot of times, or if you're using um, anything, it's probably gonna be Bluetooth if it's a newer device. Make sense? All right. All right, gang, so as far as those peripherals, right? So let's say we got some new speakers, let's say we got a new mouse, let's say we got a new printer. There's different ways to install those peripherals, right? So the old school way, uh, a lot of times would be, they would come with an installation CD. You pop the installation CD in there, next, 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 boom, you have your device installed. But most devices now are plug and play, which means that the drivers are actually on that device. And all the driver is, is of some software that actually tells the two devices, hey, I'm a computer, your keyboard, this is how we work together. One more time, a driver is just a software that tells the two devices how to work together. So just like the installation CD, it had drivers on it to make that happen. But now just to make things simple, you plug it in and it'll usually pop up with a notification, hey, this device is uh, installing, hey, this device is installing drivers, so on and so forth. Some other devices, it may be IP based, so um, we're gonna get into IPs um, in a few lectures, but just really quickly, an IP is just your address on the network. So you may have to put in your IP address to either configure the device or to make the device work or work a little bit better. A web-based configuration just means that we may have to go on a website, we may have to go on a portal and set some stuff up. All right, gang, so in this, episode and this part of our video series and course we're going to talk about internet service types let's get straight into it so um, as we talked about in previous lectures we got a couple of different ways to get on the internet right so we got telephone which is dial up it's kind of old if you still got dial up hey you know no judgment here but you know it's going to be rough getting on youtube it's going to be rough doing anything that uh is enjoyable on the internet, right? So most people now have ethernet. So ethernet is um, 
pretty much the standard for most people. You're probably connected with an Ethernet cable to whatever device or your router is connected to a Ethernet cable, so on and so forth, right? So one thing that we haven't covered yet is fiber optic. So fiber optic is super fast internet, right? Super fast internet. Uh, you can get up to uh, gigabits per second um, on a fiber optic network. Now, a lot of newer neighborhoods um, and things like that have fiber optic going to homes, but most of us uh, live in places where um, we don't have fiber optic um, capabilities, right? So going from slowest to fastest, dial up, of course, slowest ethernet, pretty good and fiber optic is going to be super duper fast right so we already talked about bluetooth and nfc so let's talk about wi-fi so with wi-fi you got access points it's just a wireless network so if you want to walk around your house if you want to have your laptop on your back porch you can rock out on your front porch you can have internet access wherever you are or if you're in a coffee shop or if you're at mcdonald's you can have that access through um wi-fi just in case you miss um the lectures before you need to watch this whole damn video series uh but in case you missed it or in case we need to brush back up on it uh, bluetooth simply put is just a wireless uh, ability to send data or just to connect devices without a wire right so you can use bluetooth uh, nfc is usually used for payment so you can use NFC to pay for something um, with proximity. So if you have NFC enabled on a device or on your phone and you have your credit card tied to it or your PayPal or something like that, you can use that at a McDonald's, you can use that at a Starbucks, and you can use that device to actually pay for whatever you're trying to pay for. Now, with Wi-Fi, you're good, right? Most times you're good. Um, it's not dependent on you being directly next to the access point or being directly next to the router or being close to wherever the actual signal is coming from. Now, of course, the closer you are to the signal, the stronger your internet and the faster your internet is probably going to be. But something else that people have is called satellite internet, right? Now, this is, uh, this is kind of like a... a if you have no other option, right? No other option. You know that uh, nobody else is messing with you. You can't, you can't get Verizon. You can't get uh, Comcast. You can't get Xfinity. You can't get nothing. You got to get this satellite shit, right? Um, that is very dependent on something called line of sight, meaning that you have to have have to be properly aligned and not have any obstructions in between you and the satellite, and that means any damn thing so if it's some trees in a way you're either gonna have a bad connection or no connection uh, if it's a cloudy day bad connection no connection so on and so forth um, so without line of sight you have a pretty rough day and even if you do have good line of sight it's not gonna be that fast because it takes a long time for the signal to bounce from you to a satellite this I don't know millions of miles away or however far how far it is in the um, in the uh, atmosphere so satellite is kind of like a you know i gotta have it you know and it, honestly for that it would just be hey i'm gonna send these emails hey i'm gonna do something but you're not about to be browsing you're not about to be doing nothing extra you're not about to be watching netflix or youtube or none of that hey gang in the next episode of our video series and course we're gonna go through a really quick lecture about uh, computing devices and the iot or internet of things let's go straight into it so IoT, simply put, is the devices that connect to the internet and all the other devices that it may be connected to. So in 2020, pretty much everything is smart. Everything can connect to the internet. Uh, they have refrigerators, you know, home appliances that uh, can connect to the internet. It'll tell you when you're running low on milk. It'll tell you when... Uh, something has expired it'll actually uh, some of them are actually um connected to different stores whether it's amazon or kroger and it'll actually order the food for you and you know it'll be at your doorstep um, but some of these are 
the list of devices that would be considered uh, part of the Internet of Things family. So like I said, home appliances, we got smart washers and dryers as well, home automation devices, things that that refrigerator would be considered automation because it automatically, that's all automation is, when it does something automatically without any intervention from you, right? So it'll order the milk, it'll order the eggs, it'll order whatever you need and it'll show up at your doorstep. You got thermostats. Um, you got thermostats to where you can have an app on your phone. You can turn the temperature up, turn the temperature down, or if you forgot to turn the heat off, you forgot to turn the stove off, you can turn these things off um, through the Internet of Things. Uh, security systems, we pretty much know that. You can lock the doors, unlock the doors, make the alarm sound, look at the webcam through your cell phone or through other devices. Uh, monitoring cars, that's another thing. Uh, you know, as far as uh, Tesla, Tesla has... Um, what is it called? I want to say it's called valet, where the car uh, will come to you. Uh, it'll it'll park itself, and there's a lot of other cars as well uh, that'll do that now. I can't think of nothing, but Tesla is uh, what's coming to mind right now. Uh, IP cameras. We already know what IP uh, stands for. It's just IP addressing. So when I was saying those uh, security systems, that would pretty much a security system would be part of the IP cameras, right? So you can actually look at things. Uh, streaming media devices, so that's fire sticks, um, that's um, things like that, right? Um, medical devices, uh, that's another thing that is a part of Internet of Things, whether it's something personal, where it's maybe something that monitors your insulin levels and say, hey man, it's time for you to take your insulin, uh, or it can actually uh, send a notification to your doctor like, hey, this person's heartbeat is irregular, so on and so forth. So. But the Internet of Things, it makes your life easier, right? A lot easier. Now, when we get into more difficult courses or more complex courses, we'll talk about the security aspect um, that needs to be a part of all these things. So not you don't only have the convenience, but you also have the security. But now we're actually going to touch on that a little bit. Um, a little bit later in this course. But if you want to get inside of a cybersecurity course, you know where to go. But Real quick, like I was saying, Internet of Things, there's going to be a list of things that I was talking about. What's something else? In the comments, drop something else that would be part of the IoT or Internet of Things and tell me what it does and why you think it's a part of the Internet of Things. All right? All right, gang. So, hey, gang, in this episode of our video series and course, we're going to go through networking concepts. So, Real simple overview, right? What is an IP address? An IP address is your logical address on the network, meaning that you can't actually touch it, you can't fill it, but it's your address. That's the address that the network is gonna to use to figure out, okay, this is where this email is supposed to go. This is where um, this information is supposed to go. So an IP address is your logical address on the network. And just remember every device, cell phone, uh, game console, refrigerator, washing machine, thermostat, anything that connects to the internet is going to have an IP address. It's your logical address on the network. Same thing with the MAC address. The logical address is your IP address. The physical address of the device is going to be your MAC address. IP address, logical address, physical address is your MAC address. Every device has a MAC address. Every device has a MAC address, all right? Every device has a MAC address. So if the device can connect to the internet, needs an IP address, and it also needs a MAC address. The MAC address is from the manufacturer. The MAC address is from the manufacturer. All right, just wanna make sure you guys understand that. So here's a couple of different devices. Um, that we're going to be talking about as far as networking goes and stuff like that a router so a router is what's going to get you on the internet so your router takes you from your local network onto a bigger network from your local network onto the internet and your router is going to use IP addresses to figure out where things go oh let me send this here let me send that there okay a switch is going to be used inside your network to connect multiple devices together so router is from network to network 
a switch is used inside of a network and a switch is going to use the physical address your MAC address to forward information to figure out where stuff goes okay uh, access point so we already talked about Wi-Fi stuff like that so if we have a router if we have a big area that we're trying to pretty much extend coverage to we can have our main router and then we can have access points that is connected to that router right so we can pretty much expand the coverage so we can make sure that we have a wide area of coverage right so we can have an access point downstairs an access point upstairs or we can have an access point and HR have access point and finance so on and so forth so access point gives people access to the network and it can extend the coverage of a network a firewall simply put it can permit or deny certain traffic so so we talking about where the stuff go routers switches this stuff sends stuff here this thing sends stuff there a firewall can actually stop stuff like hey I don't want this to come in whether it's going from rules that you set up or it's rules that the organization set up it can permit or deny so a firewall just stops stuff or it allows stuff to come onto your network all right, so um, network communication, we talked about local and we talked about the internet. So local area network is your local network. Your LAN is your local network. If you at home, that is your local network. If you at work, that is your local network. As soon as you leave that network, right, you go through the router, you go to another network, you are on a WAN. A WAN is a wide area network. The internet is a WAN. The internet is just a huge collection of interconnected LANs. All right, so it's connecting LANs to each other, right? So a router is your gateway onto the internet. It's your gateway to the WAN. Um, DNS. So so we're talking about the internet. DNS or domain name server, your domain name server. We'll get into ports a little bit later. The domain name server translates a website name into an IP address. Remember, everything has an IP address. Every website has an IP address because every website runs on a web server. All right, so every website runs on a physical device, a web server, but it needs a logical address, an IP address, to be able to send and receive information. And the DNS was created came up with because instead of you having to remember a bunch of random numbers you can just remember ESPN.com you can just remember itmaskey.com you can just remember google.com instead of the numbers that's related to that okay if you don't know uh, about the numbers the ones and zeros binary you need to go to the first video in this series and watch it the third domain is going to talk about applications and software so we know in today's world it's pretty much an app for anything you want to do. So we're going to talk about how applications, whether it's on a cell phone, whether it's on a PC, how that is actually developed, how it works, and how different software actually is compatible with certain things, not compatible with other things, and different varieties of software as well. Sound like a plan? Let's get into it. All right, so the next topic we're going to talk about in our video series and course is operating systems. So whatever you're using right now to watch this video has an operating system. No matter if it's on a cell phone, if it's on a tablet, if it's on a PC, it has a operating system. The operating system, simply put, is what operates the system. All right, let's dive just a little bit deeper into that. All right, so just like this says, uh, operating system is a powerful and usually large program that controls and manages the hardware and other software on the computer. All computers and computer-like devices require operating systems, including laptops, tablets, desktops, smartwatches. All of those things have an operating system. If you have a smart fridge, if you have a smart this, a smart that, all of these things have an operating system. So, two different variances in the operating system is the GUI or the GUI and the command line. So, the GUI or the GUI, the graphical user interface is what we're using right now so it's pretty pictures and buttons and stuff that we can click on uh, and graphics that we can actually see right now 
The reverse of that is the command line or the command prompt. So everything that can be done on the graphical user interface can be done in the command line. So the command line is just words, letters. If you're using Windows, it's going to be a black background with white letters and you have to have the proper command and the proper syntax and you have to put in the proper commands if you want to create a folder you have to know the command for that folder so instead of if you're in windows right clicking then say new folder you have to know the actual uh command for that actual um thing that can be executed okay so real simple graphical user interface graphics stuff like that command line you have to know the actual commands It's going to be words and commands and each one of those commands is going to execute something for you right so something called linux a linux operating system that was the basis of linux it was going to be a lot of commands all right a lot of words a lot of different letters and some people were actually scared or shied away from linux because that stuff looks scary looks creepy they don't know what the hell is this um, but nowadays the Linux base and even back then it had a graphical user interface so with the command line you can manipulate things you can move things you can do things and if you know exactly what you're doing the command line can be a lot more powerful than the actual GUI or the graphical user interface but just uh, simply put what I want you to get from this is what the hell is the difference between a graphical and the command line the graphical has graphics, pretty stuff you can click on. The command line, you have to know the commands, okay? So, no matter what operating system that you're using, you're gonna need a file system. So the operating system is what operates the system, then the file system is what organizes all the files and folders inside that operating system. So once you download an operating system, you have to apply a file system. So on this slide these are the file system by default depending on what you're trying to do which ultimate goal is you can put different file systems on different operating systems but by default as of this recording these are the file systems that you're going to get so for example if you have a, a macintosh or a mac you're going to get the hfs plus hfs plus uh, the hierarchical file system linux is going to be the fourth extended file system or ext4 microsoft which is probably what you guys are using right now or maybe not don't matter uh you know if it's apple macintosh whatever um you're going to be using ntfs for the newer versions of uh windows and you're going to be using fat32 for the older versions okay so we talked about operating systems graphical user interface stuff like this is pretty pictures and stuff you can click command line is the actual commands you have to know what to type in then the file system is what actually organizes the files and the folders and it has to be applied to your operating system where it won't function properly it won't boot up it won't do what it's supposed to do in this episode of our video series and course we're going to go over different types of software mainly focusing on productivity software and some collaboration software okay so a lot of this stuff you've probably used before so productivity software stuff that makes you more productive so one type of software is word processing software you've probably used Microsoft Word you type in uh, stuff you might need to do a book report you might need to do a presentation stuff like that so you go ahead and put your stuff in Microsoft Word now that isn't the only word processing uh, software but is the most recognizable right uh, but you can also use stuff like WordPerfect or Google Docs and stuff like that now spreadsheet software everybody's favorite um, Excel would be an example of a uh, spreadsheet so you can make uh, rosters you can make calculations and it can all be in one spreadsheet right so it can put in different formulas and you can figure stuff out Microsoft Excel, like I said, is pretty much the, uh, I wouldn't say premier, but that's like the most damn renowned one that pretty much everybody knows, right? Uh, presentation software. Now, if you've been around computers at all, you probably had to do a presentation software, whether if it was for school, if it was for uh, a business, if it was for your job, you've used PowerPoint before, so you can put 
pictures in there. You can do uh, slides. You can pretty much present the stuff in a way where people can understand what's going on. Uh, web browsers. So a web browser, simply put, allows you to surf the web, browse the web. You can use uh, Chrome. You can use Safari. You can use Firefox. You can use uh, Microsoft uh, Edge. You can use various different browsers. And it depends on which one you're most comfortable with. Most times, whichever one you use the most or whichever one you use at first is probably the one that you're going to rock out with. Well, maybe not, because I started off with uh, with uh, Microsoft uh, Internet Explorer. And I I don't even, I don't even, <laughs> I can't remember the last time I opened up Internet Explorer or now it's called uh, Edge. Um, but uh, simply put, these are our really recognizable and popular uh, types of productivity software now especially since um the damn c virus uh dropped we're having to do a lot more collaboration and a lot more working from home whether it's emails whether if it's uh zoom calls whether if it's conferencing calls but a lot of stuff you're doing from home and some people um your kids are uh, working from home as well some kids like it, some kids don't. Uh, but to me, uh, I was talking to uh, one of my students that was saying, you know, shit, you know, my students or my, not my students, my kids won't do this damn homework. You know, they said they get bored. It's not, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, hey, man, if you can get them uh, be on Instagram or YouTube for eight hours, you can, you can sit down and do, you know, some math homework or something. But that's just my opinion. But anyway, collaboration software. So um, emails, right? You got Gmail, you got Outlook, you got a bunch of different uh, types of uh, email uh, clients that you can use. Because you know nowadays people have a thousand different ways to get in contact with you. It's kind of hard to say, you know, oh, did you miss my call? Because I text you, I emailed you, I damn poked you on Facebook, uh, I liked your, your your Instagram, I DM'd you. It's just a thousand different ways to talk to somebody. Uh, conference software. So this has seen an explosion zoom you know stock price and everything else went up a lot because everybody is using zoom um another one could be skype or google hangouts or uh, stuff like that but right now zoom is the most popular okay let's let's do a zoom let's do a zoom call pretty much everybody knows what that means it's just you can see me on the camera just like this and i will see you on the camera and we will say whatever we need to say i'm um, a lot of like i said a lot of kids also are getting familiar with zoom even if they don't want to uh, instant messaging real simple it's pretty much like a text message but um it's going to be on your pc or it's going to be on your laptop it's going to be in a messaging app and you can just shoot somebody a message and then it'll get directly to them so instant messaging right um so facebook messenger uh, skype uh, and stuff like that a uh, document sharing that's um, a really big uh collaboration tool so you guys might have a project, but the project consists of one main idea or one main document, and you can have a team of you guys work through the document together. You can have version control, which means you'll see who did what, and we can save the previous version just in case if somebody hop in there and they sleepy or they didn't have enough coffee and they messed something up, we can go back to the version before that actually worked. All right, so our collaboration stuff, that's email. Email ain't working, let's hop on a Zoom call. Zoom call, uh, uh, your, your Zoom drop, so I shoot you a Facebook message, um, and then we all collab on a document. I see that Sarah was the last one to uh, make some adjustments or make some corrections, so I see the stuff that she did, and then I'll just hop on after whatever she did. Make sense? Hey, gang, in the last episode, we talked a little bit about web browsers, so let's talk about what web browsers can actually do and a few of the extra settings and things that come with web browser that we can actually kind of use to make the web browsers our own, make them a little bit more secure, make them a little bit more compatible, so on and so forth. Let's go ahead and get straight into it. All right, so web browsers. A lot of web browsers have a cache, right? Have a cache or use cookies and pretty much what that is, is that that information is saved on your hard drive. That information is saved. So when you revisit that web page, it'll load a little bit faster. So I have to load the banner, the video, the everything, little 
nibbits and little kernels of the actual website will get saved. So when you bring the website up again, it'll load a little bit faster. Um, cookies also are used to kind of uh, look to see what your habits are, to see what you're doing, to see uh, what you like, what you don't like, to kind of make your browsing experience a little bit better. That's what they say. So just to make it a little bit better. Okay. Now, um, if you're using Chrome and other things, you can actually add more functionality to your browser. So you can add an extension. So if you're using Chrome, you can use an extension to where if you go on a website, it'll automatically apply coupons to your basket. Or you can add an extension that'll tell you uh, what the weather is in five different countries. Um, or you can do um, an extension that can automatically block uh, certain advertisements. Or you can do uh, an extension, literally there is an extension for any and everything that you can think of right so um, they have extensions for uh, VPNs uh, we'll talk about what a VPN is a virtual private network they have different extensions for anything you can think of right now private browsing so whenever you're browsing believe it or not there's always somebody watching you always always somebody watching you whether it's to get your browsing uh, habits uh, whether it's to see how you're actually interacting with a website or what you're doing but somebody's always watching a lot of advertisers are watching a lot of marketers are watching it uh, if you own some weird ass websites the FBI is probably watching but uh, with private browsing it's not supposed to save any of your browsing information no history no cookies no nothing so it says it leaves no trace after you end the session technically technically doesn't uh, leave a trace doesn't leave uh, anything uh, behind. So if somebody, you know, comes and opens up the web browser after you, whatever you were doing shouldn't pop up. Now, if you're doing some weird stuff, some crazy stuff, there is ways to still recover your browsing history. And some um, websites, it may not work on their website as far as their private browsing. Now, private browsing um, is better than nothing, you know, so. Uh, you can use it but uh, just know that if you're doing something crazy if you're searching some weird stuff if you you know trying to figure out how the hell to build a rocket launcher no matter what the hell you're doing uh, you're going to end up on somebody's list or right? end up on somebody's list but anyway we'll talk about that when we get more into security but private browsing technically um, lets you browse in private without nobody seeing anything okay all right so uh, talking about private browsing, right? There's something called a proxy server. And if you use a proxy server, that can be even more uh, in depth than a private browsing, way more in depth. So with private browsing, it's like, okay, I don't want people to know what I'm doing. I don't want people to see what I'm doing, so on and so forth. With a proxy server, you can actually ask the proxy server to go to websites instead of you. Make sense? If not, don't worry about it. I'm going to clear it up. So I want to go to uh, weirdasswebsite.com, right? So instead of me going to the website myself, I actually connect to the proxy server. Then the proxy server connects to weirdasswebsite.com, and then it sends the information back to me. Okay? One more time. So I connect to the proxy server, the proxy server connects to whatever website I'm trying to connect to, and then via the proxy server, I get connected to that website. But to that website, it looks like the proxy server is the originator of the request. It looks like the proxy server is connected to the website and not me. Makes sense? All right, so, um, instead, so, so let's say that uh, I'm on a diet, right? Um, not really no display. Uh say let's say that I'm on a diet and uh I got a personal trainer. He like, hey man, you cannot eat any damn pizza. Do not any eat any pizza. I'm like, okay, man, I'm not gonna eat any pizza, just Brussels sprouts. And then I end up sending somebody to the store, right? Says somebody, hey man, I need I need a slice of pizza, man. I'm doing pretty bad. So the personal trainer is doing push-ups in the parking lot or the pizza uh, pizza hut or pizza store. Um, just so I won't come up there. So I'll send one of my neighbors. Say, hey, man, just go give me a slice of pizza, please. 
So he goes and gives me a slice of pizza. The personal trainer doesn't know it's me asking for the slice of pizza. The guy comes back and gives me the slice of pizza. So the next door neighbor got me a slice of pizza would be the proxy server. Makes sense? They connected to it instead of me. Uh, we already know what pop-up blockers are. Uh, pop-up blockers, uh, pop block-ups. Pop block-ups? Block pop-ups. <laughs> block pop-ups, right? So uh, pop-ups are, you know, hey, come uh, try this diet pill. Hey, come do your taxes. Hey, come fix your credit. Hey, you know, whatever, a pop-up advertisement that you don't want to see. So pop-up blocker um, does that. Now, with some websites, you actually have to uh, turn on or turn off the pop-up blocker for it to work correctly. And a lot of times, websites now will tell you like, hey, you have to turn off the pop-up blocker. And some other websites, um, if you have um, like an ad blocker extension or something like that, it's going to actually block ads or actually tell you, hey, man, this is how we make money. You got to turn that ad blocker off. All right. So whether it's an ad blocker or a pop-up blocker, it's going to block stuff that you don't want to see. All right, gang, so in our next episode of this video course and lecture, we're going to go through a really, 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 really quick lecture. Okay, let's get straight into it. So we've been talking about software. We've been talking about different operating systems. We've been talking about a lot of things. So with applications or software in general, there's two different types. So with some applications and software, it can be open source. With other things, it can be proprietary. So if an operating system or a application is open source, you can actually modify it without worrying about any kind of uh, um, ramifications, without anybody coming after you to sue you. You can literally make it your own. You can change the code. The source code, we talked about coding already, is available to you. So you can manipulate it any kind of way you want to without any uh, legal uh, ramifications or legal, legal. That's not a word, legal uh, repercussions, right? Now, proprietary. Proprietary means that the end user, you, don't have access to the source code. You can't manipulate it. You can't do different things to it without getting in trouble. So, for example, um, Apple. Apple is proprietary. So if you change anything to the operating system, if you do anything weird, for one, it's gonna void the warranty, and two, uh, if you create something on a mass scale and make a lot of money, they're going to sue you because it says right there, you cannot do anything to their source code. You cannot change anything. The way it is, is the way it is. So um, with cell phones, uh, there's something called jailbreaking. You can jailbreak an iPhone or an Apple device. And what that means is, is that you break into the source code and you change it to whatever you want to change it to. And the things that I just mentioned, um, it's going to void the warranty, and if you do something super duper and make a lot of money, they're going to sue you, right? So, proprietary, uh, Apple, proprietary, uh, Windows, proprietary. Now, Linux is open source. Linux is open source. You can do what you want to. You can rock out. You can do whatever, and nobody really cares, and nobody's going to say anything. Open source, you can do whatever you want to willy-nilly. Uh, proprietary, can't do anything at all, okay? So, uh, when you install an applications or any kind of software operating system, just use common sense, right? Uh, first thing, I know you're cool, I know you're super smart, but read the damn instructions, right? Um, sometimes it's just next, 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 or yes, 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 but sometimes you may have to actually set up stuff and configure stuff, and a lot of times, <laughs> believe it or not, those instructions are in the instructions. Another thing is make sure that you're reading the agreements, right? Because sometimes, um, especially with a lot of applications, a lot of apps, uh, cell phone apps, you may be agreeing to something that uh, isn't agreeable, right? It may, uh, the app may have access to things that it shouldn't have access to or you don't feel it should have access to. Um, so just make sure that, I know it's long, but you know, at least do your due diligence, especially for mobile applications. Because just because it's in, the Play Store or the Apple Store, or the Microsoft Store it does not mean that it's completely secure. So you have to do your due diligence and read what the hell does this thing I have access to and what can and can it not do. Can it delete my numbers? Can it delete my contacts? Can it copy my contacts? Can it call people? Can it save stuff? Can it down? You know what I'm saying? So just make sure that um, you're aware of that stuff. Uh, and last but not least, 
uh, see what's best is the default configuration best the basic configuration or do you want to have some advanced settings in there do you want a specific thing to happen at a specific time so on and so forth and if you change from the default settings or the basic configuration how can that actually affect your experience and can you go back if you mess up the settings make sense the fourth domain is really going to piggyback on the last domain and this domain we're going to talk more about how to create or develop software when the last domain kind of focus more on how to use different software how to interact with different applications this one is going to actually talk about more of the creation side of applications and software you ready let's get into it the next topic in our video series and course is going to be software development let's get straight into it okay so software development um, if you're using YouTube, if you're looking at this video right now, if you're looking at Netflix, you're going to be looking at code. All right. So the underlying part of that application is going to be written in code. So the coding language that is written in is what the computer uses. It's what we use to build software and applications. So it's kind of like the roadmap. If I click this, it's going to do this. If I close this, it's going to do that. So video games are written in code. Applications are written in code. Software is written in code. This website that you're on right now is written in code. Okay. So there's a couple different uh, language categories. So some popular languages are Python or Java or JavaScript or C++. And each one of these different um, languages have different uses, different strengths, different weaknesses, and different applicability depending on what you're trying to do. So language categories, we have interpreted. So interpreted languages execute instruction directly and freely. Uh, without previously compiling programs into instructions. So just like we talked about YouTube before, Python is the coding language that YouTube is built on. Facebook is also built on Python. Um, compiled languages. So a compiled language uh, is converted directly into machine code that the processor can execute. So something that uh, the PC, something that the actual CPU can execute. So an example of that is C++ which is what Windows Media Player is run on. So C++ is um, used on a lot of other um, applications and things like that, but that's just one of the things I thought would you know stand out that you would know. So Windows Media Player uses C++. Uh, query, uh, computer languages used to make queries in databases and information systems. So uh, example, FQL. So Facebook, right? So when you search for something, if you're trying to look for something, it's going to use FQL. So query is just like a question. Uh, cat videos, you type that into uh, the search box in the Facebook, and that's a query. That's a question. So it's going to use FQL, that language, to figure out what you're trying to ask it, right? So um, today we talked about coding languages. Popular coding languages, Python, JavaScript, C++, Java, so on and so forth. Code. All this stuff is built on code. Website we're on right now, all the applications that you use. Code is just the instructions that when you play in a video game, if I press X, the guy's going to jump up. Makes sense? If I am on YouTube, when I press play, it's going to play. When I press pause, it's going to pause. So all that stuff is built on code. So the fifth domain is going to be database fundamentals. So database fundamentals, whether you're using Excel or Salesforce or something else that's more complicated, a database can make your life 10 times easier. So this domain is going to cover the fundamentals of database creation and how to maintain a database. Are you ready? Let's go ahead and get into it. All right, gang, on our next video in our video series and course, we're going to be going over database fundamentals. Let's get straight into it. So a database is just a collection of data. So you can quickly retrieve information. You can quickly search for information inside this database. So different types of databases for different types of applications. So you might have a point of sale, which is pretty much just a database with 
inventory, whether it's a grocery list, whether it's different shoe sizes, but it's just a database with different types of items in it. Or you can have a booking system to where it'll be able to look up different dates, different times, different locations, and different prices. So a uh, quick, 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 quick class, uh, database uses. So in a database, you can create a database, you can import or input data, you can create a query, like I said uh, in the last episode, a query is just a question. Hey man, what is this? Hey man, what is that? Or you can create a report. Okay, on June 1st, all these things happen. On June 2nd, all these things happen. So database is just a clear and concise place where we can search for different data, different information, put different inputs, create queries, and even create reports. So there's a couple of different databases, right? We got flat file database or relational database. So in a flat file database, none of the stuff is related to anything else. All the files are our own individual standalones. So they're not related to the other files in the database. So uh, these types of databases are standalone, meaning none of the data has any relation or linkage to any other files. So what do we think relational database is? So relational database, all of the information inside the database is related to one another. So it's a lot more robust, it's a lot more dynamic. So this type of database uses a collection of tables that are linked to a common thread of data. A relational database is much more robust than a flat file. So advantages, you can scale it. It's a lot more scalability. So meaning that you can make it bigger and it's gonna be easier to scale it because everything is related. So once you put in a new file, it's gonna relate and link uh, that data to the other data that it would be linked, uh, that would be linked to or related to similar files, so on and so forth. Uh, speed, it's a lot quicker than a flat file because in a flat file, you gotta actually look into this folder and that folder, but with a relational database, if you search for something, the query is gonna bring up all the stuff that's related to that search. And another thing, a variety of data. So you can have a variety of data and it's gonna be linked to similar data that's inside that relational database. So flat file is just pretty much standalone files by itself. Relational database is just a bunch of files that are related to one another. The last and final domain is a super important domain because security is important for you, me, and every organization. With cybercrime and identity theft on the rise, we want to make sure that we have a good foundation for security. So with this being our last domain, make sure that you pay attention. Hopefully you had a good time. Hopefully you learned a lot. Well, I know you learned a lot. But anyway, let's go ahead and get straight into it. Let's go. All right, again, next video in our series and course, we're going to talk about the CIA triad or CIA pyramid, something super important when it comes to security. Let's dive straight into it. So when we talk about information security, there's three things that we always want to ensure confidentiality, integrity and availability. All right. So confidentiality just means that secret stuff stays secret or the only people that you know about this stuff are the only people that know about this stuff. So confidentiality ensures data, info, services, and all the above remain hidden from unauthorized users. Confidentiality, it's a secret. Don't tell anybody else. If you have an email, the only person that should see that email is the person that you sent it to, right? Integrity. Integrity just means that the data, the services, the communication, should remain the same. It shouldn't get altered. It shouldn't change at all. If you type an email, if you type something, once you send it to that person, it shouldn't have anything extra. It shouldn't have anything deleted. The integrity of information. Last but not least, availability. Things should be available to you when you want them to be available to you. If you want to go on itmastery.com, it should be available. You shouldn't be denied that service. You shouldn't be denied data. If you want an email from somebody, you should receive that email. So when it comes to information security, three things we want to really, 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 really focus on, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Now there's a couple of concerns with each one of those. So with confidentiality, you have to worry about snooping. So snooping is pretty much 
being nosy, snooping around, looking around, trying to figure out people's personal information, right? Literally snooping, whether it's looking over somebody's shoulder, whether if it's going through physical paperwork, if it's uh, trying to hack into somebody's stuff, that is snooping, right? So social engineering is taking that being nosy to a way more malicious um, wave, pretty much. So social engineering is literally asking prying questions to unsuspecting victims, pretty much, you know, seeming like you're just making conversation, but you're trying to get as much information as possible. Hey, how you doing? Where you work at? Oh, how long have you been working there? What's your hours? Who's your boss? Oh, how is he? What about security? Is it a security guard there at night? Oh, okay. Do y'all need passwords? Do y'all need pins? Do you need it? You know, just pretty much asking prime information where, and some people who aren't trained or, you know, maybe they tired that day, they may actually give up a lot of security information without even knowing. Okay. Last but not least, dumpster diving, right? So that's why it's always a good idea to shred information, to shred your, to shred your mail, to shred anything that um, may be personal to you because that's still a thing. People will still go through the dumpster to see if they can find any information, find any information, especially around businesses and stuff like that because maybe the secretary or whoever is the person that's in charge of doing it um, may not have shredded the information. They may throw, you know, a thousand pages of personal information, people's social security number, people's addresses, and a dumpster thinking, oh, ain't nobody going to get in a dumpster. But, you know, depending on what the payout may be or what, um, the result may be from somebody stealing that, you know, they may be extremely motivated to dump in a, uh, dive in a damn dumpster. Okay. Next up is integrity. We said integrity is we want to make sure that the stuff is the way it is or supposed to be when it gets to the receiver. So I sent it and I want to make sure it looks exactly the same way when it gets to you. So um, one of the attacks or one of the ways that people can actually manipulate um, information or data is with a man in the middle attack. So literally a man in the middle attack is a software or device or even an actual person that is in between two different points. So I want to send something to you, but there's literally a man in the middle. So I send you an email, right? And it gets intercepted by the man in the middle. The email when I sent it said, good morning, but he intercepts it. He changes the integrity of it. He changes it. And when it gets to you, it says, good morning, go to hell, right? I didn't write that, but that's what it's going to say when it gets to you because he changed the integrity. Makes sense. Another attack is a replay attack. So just like a man in the middle attack, you intercept the traffic, you change it around, and then you shoot it to whoever the recipient is. With a replay attack, they usually are in the middle, but they're capturing passwords that are capturing pins that are capturing sensitive information. And then they'll replay that information later on. So they figure out what your password and pin is. And then later on, they'll use that information to log into your accounts. Make sense. Last but not least, impersonation. So that's when somebody impersonates that there's somebody else. This can be in physical form. This can be through email. This can be over the phone. So, um, Right now, uh, there's a lot going on. So, you know, somebody may impersonate, hey, I'm the CEO of Walmart. I just wanted to see if you need anything. I know that you frequent Walmart a lot. You know, we're actually giving out this $500 gift card. If you would just, you know, fill out this quick survey, it's not asking too much. And then when you actually get through the survey, they got your social security number, where you live, your credit card number. We won't charge your credit card numbers for a free trial, blah, 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 blah. So, so on and so forth, okay? So we went over confidentiality. We went over integrity and last but not least availability so <clears throat> the expectation is that when you click on something you expect for it to work you expect for you to be able to go on certain websites so on and so forth so one attack or one concern is denial of service sometimes this is malicious sometimes it's not when it's not malicious let's say that we um try to buy the latest and greatest t-shirt right everybody in our city wants this t-shirt so the server the web server that runs the website that this t-shirt is on can only handle a thousand requests per minute but it's getting ten thousand requests per minute so the server and the website crashes thus denial of service right but at the same time 
it can actually be an attack to where there's actually a bunch of people trying to get on a website intentionally to crash it so when people that actually want to get on a website can't get on a website makes sense so denial of service it can be malicious where people are actively trying to break the website or it can be non malicious to where it's just overloaded either way uh, the availability is gone and you'll have a denial of service Another thing uh, is power outages, right? So if it's a power outage, um, the power is out. You know, the web server isn't up or the file server isn't up or the PC that you're trying to get on isn't up. And one thing that we're going to talk about a little bit later is an ups. And that's what's one thing that can actually help you with availability. So an ups or a UPS is an uninterruptible power server or system. So what happens with an ups is that when you have a power outage, when you have a, a blackout, when you have an electrical surge, something that happens that knocks out the power, the ups is pretty much like backup power. So you will have your servers connected to that or you'll have other really important devices connected to an ups. So when the power goes down, those devices will still work. So you can save stuff, shut down, so you won't have a complete losses or corrupted data, okay? Last but not least, hardware failure so things break you know uh, they may be past their lifetime it may be time to life cycle those things and get rid of those things and get some new stuff in there so with availability service can be denied you might have a power outage or stuff just might break from time to time okay all right gang so in the next video in our series and course we're going to talk about the AAA model um, we're going to talk about authentication, authorization, and accounting, and the differences between those three. Let's get straight into it. So authentication. Authentication is just ensuring that you are who you say you are. And there's a couple different factors, a couple different ways that we can figure that stuff out. All right, so we can authenticate you through one factor or multiple factors. So example of factors can be passwords, pins, biometrics, and biometrics would just be something that you are, right? So that could be an iris scan, that could be a fingerprint scan, so on and so forth. Or it can even be a hardware token. So a hardware token can be a ID badge, um, an access badge, stuff like that, right? So just understand that when we're talking about authentication, it's a couple different things. Multi-factor, multi-factor, meaning it's going to use multiple factors from that list. It's going to be something the user is, something the user has, or something the user knows. Password, something that you know. Your fingerprint, something that you, not say that you is, something that you are, something that you is or something that you are, <laughs> or something the user has would be um, an ID badge or an access badge. Make sense? So multi-factor is going to use two or more of those uh, standards or those protocols. So multi-factor would be something that you know and something that you have. So you would use your password and you would use a badge. Or it would be something that you are and something that you have. So you use a fingerprint and you would use your badge. Or you would use so on and so forth. Makes sense? So understand that a password and a pen would not be multi-factor. A password and a pin would not be multi-factor because a password and a pin is something that you know. So that's only one factor. Make sense? All right, so is, has, knows. Something that you know, something that you are, or something that you have. Make sense? So we went through all the authentication, proving that you are who you say you are. Then authorization is once you actually gain access after we actually identify and make sure that you are who you say you are. So authorization uh, is gaining access to a system, device, service, or data once authenticated. So when you talk about permissions, right? When you talk about permissions, you always want to use the model of least privilege. So there's a couple different models. Role-based access, meaning on what your role is, depends on how much, um, it depends on how much permission you have mandatory access control discretionary access control what i want you to get out of this slide though is that no matter what you have going on the pinpoint the thing that you need to remember is once you become a system administrator once you become the boss of all bosses you need to always give people the least 
privilege. All right, so that may not make sense right now, but let's clear it up. So you give people the least amount of privilege for to do their job, right? So if they just need read access, just give them read access. If they need complete ownership, then you just got to give them complete ownership. But don't go the lazy route and give people full ownership or full control when they don't need full control. Why is that? Why do you want to give people the least privilege? I don't think that the janitor should say have the same permissions as the um, head IT tech. Makes sense? Because different people have different responsibilities. So if you give too many permissions to the wrong person, they may by accident delete the wrong thing or on purpose delete the wrong thing or move the wrong thing or move things. So you want to always apply the principle of least privilege to minimize the service area of attack. Meaning that, like I said, a lot of times users do things by mistake or by accident. Sometimes it's malicious. So just give people the amount of access that they need. So if they work in human resources, they probably only need access to the human resources files. If they work in finance, they probably need the access to just finance, right? Or if they need access to human resources, they probably don't need access to certain files in the human resource. So as a system administrator, you can create groups and then put people in groups and everybody in that group would have the same permissions just to kind of uh, make things a little bit easier for you. But when it comes to permissions, don't be lazy, but always use a principle of least privilege because it's better to give people not enough privileges and then find out, okay, maybe I need to give them a little bit more. Maybe I need to tweak this. Maybe I need to tweak that. Then to give them way too many and they didn't delete some or install something or just did something crazy that you kind of can't come back from. Make sense? Okay. So we went through authentication which is approving who you are, authorization, actually giving you access after we prove who you are, then accounting. So this is actually, once you actually are uh, authorized and you own access, got access and you own the server or you in the server room or you own the website or you doing whatever you're gonna do, this is actually pretty much tracking you and accounting to make sure what you're doing, when you did it. So if there's any changes, we can figure out, was it you, was it somebody else, was it a system, what's going on, all right? So accounting, like I said, monitors and tracks what you do after you've been authorized access. So with this, um, as far as troubleshooting goes, you can go through logs and see, okay, at 8.59, you logged on, and then at 9.15, everything blew the hell up. Let's see if it was your, if it was something you, you did or if it was just something else. Um, then like I said, you can actually track people too. Um, like I said, that's another thing. Let's say that you give, you did give too many permissions to somebody and they log in at nine o'clock at nine Oh five, this file disappeared. They was the only one that was logged on. So it had to be them. All right. It's pretty much, um, deducing that. Okay. It had to be you cause you was the only person that was on the network at that time. Makes sense. So we just went over AAA, um, which is authentication authorization and account. I almost forgot my damn self. No, I didn't. But um, uh, this is really simple. Uh, may have been seemed like it was a little complex before, but um, authorization, authentication, accounting. Well, uh, actually in a reverse authentication, authorization and accounting authentication. You already say you are authorization. Let's give them access to what he pulls up access to accounting. Let's look at what the hell you're doing after we actually gave you access. Hey gang, so in today's video, we're gonna go over encryption. Let's get straight into it. So there's data in transit and data at rest. Data in transit would be emails, right? And data at rest would be something like your hard drive. So data in transit, stuff that's moving across the network, stuff that's actually moving, stuff that's actually in motion, stuff that's getting uploaded, stuff that's getting downloaded. At rest is just the things that are on your actual hard drive. Stuff that's not moving right now as we speak. So if it's data in transit, we can actually encapsulate and encrypt that information, meaning that it shouldn't be able to be read by anybody other than the recipient. Nobody should be able to peek in and see what we're doing. We can also encrypt the data that's at risk. We can encrypt the entire hard drive, or we can actually encrypt certain files and folders on that hard drive. And just so we understand, encryption just means that you make the information 
make the data unreadable to people that shouldn't be able to read it. The people that you don't want it to see, which is probably everybody other than the person you're sending it to, shouldn't be able to read it, okay? So encryption is a conversion of something such as data into code or cipher. By encrypting data, you make it unreadable to individuals that shouldn't be able to read it. So if something isn't encrypted, it's referred to as plain text, meaning that if somebody look at it, if somebody get it, they can read it. If something is encrypted, it's a called ciphertext, meaning that even if somebody captures it, even if somebody sees it, they shouldn't be able to read it. So we got plain text and ciphertext. Hey gang, in the next video in our series and course, we're we'll going through some best practices you and I need to be doing when it comes to our devices. So, of course, you know when you have any device, whether it's a tablet, whether it's a uh, cell phone, a laptop, a PC, you need to have some form of antivirus or anti-malware. If it connects to the internet, it's susceptible to a lot of viruses. Even if it doesn't connect to the internet, it's susceptible to viruses, but if it connects to the internet, the chance of you getting a virus, you know, is exponentially greater than if it doesn't connect to the internet. So antivirus, not only make sure that you have antivirus, but make sure that the antivirus is up to date. If it's not up to date, if you don't update it regularly, then it's only going to be up to date for the viruses that it knows about. But if you updated it a month ago and three weeks ago, a new virus came out. It's going to scan for everything except that virus. Makes sense? Next up, a firewall. Uh, we talked about this before. Make sure that you keep the firewall at all firewall on at all times. So quick class. We already know that a firewall keeps out the stuff that we don't want, right? So by default, it's going to stop certain things that look suspicious. And then we can actually go in there and configure it to stop things that we know are suspicious. But by default, it's set up pretty good to let through the things that we need and stop the things that we don't need and the things that may be harmful to our device. So passwords, we already know this because you guys are super smart. Make sure that you never keep the default passwords always change your passwords after this we're actually going to get inside of uh, password best practices things that we need to do that's going to be a couple lectures from now um, but passwords make sure that you have a strong password and that you change whatever the hell the default password is so updates make sure that your software is as up to date as possible when new updates come up make sure that you update your software now if it's on a personal device, uh, you can probably go ahead and update. But if you're in a production environment or if you're a system administrator or if you have a bunch of computers that you need to update, it would behoove you, it would be a good idea for you to run that update in a virtual machine or run that update on a test computer just to see how that update is going to react. Because sometimes updates may not be compatible with your devices, may not be suitable for your devices, and it may actually stop your devices from working. So like I said, most times if it's a personal use thing, it's probably okay just to go ahead and update. But if you're in a larger environment, you want to make sure that you pay attention to that stuff. Okay? All right. So software, whether it's applications, whether it's for PCs, laptops, make sure that when you're using software that it's legitimate right so make sure that you're not just picking up cds or usbs off of the ground and downloading stuff onto your devices because even if it looks legitimate right it may not be legitimate it may have a back door it may have a virus embedded into it it may have a key logger which is something that's going to actually log your keys it may have spyware on it which is something that's going to spy spy on you and see what you're doing just make sure that you get it from a legitimate software or a legitimate source and just make sure that it's up to snuff because if not uh, you may be putting yourself at risk for viruses identity theft and a bunch of other stuff you don't really want um, another thing, make sure that you remove anything that you don't want and remove unnecessary stuff too. Cause sometimes software and applications may be running in the background and may be taxing on your CPU and may be taxing on your RAM and may be taking up space and it's something that you don't even need. So a lot of times it's good to do an audit. What applications are running, what applications I need. And if it's stuff that you don't really need, get it out of there. Um, another thing, if you know you got a virus, pretty much disconnect from your network, right? So you don't 
uh, propagate that virus or so it can't replicate or so it can't get to other devices and then try to remove that virus as quickly as possible um, and then after you do that come up with uh, some kind of prevention like okay let me make sure that I don't go to that website or let me make sure that I'm running scans more often or let me make sure that you know this virus isn't embedded anywhere else but whenever you get a virus the good thing is or a good footnote or best practice is to always get it out of there get it resolved as soon as possible hey gang in today's video series and course we're going to actually talk about password best practices there's some of the things that you need to be doing on any website that you want if you has a password these are the things that you need to ensure that your password has you ready let's get straight into it so real simple real simple if you follow this stuff you should be okay now main thing as we go through these passwords and all his best practices at the bottom is one super duper uh, bit of advice if you have a super strong password but you're using it on 50 different sites it doesn't really matter uh, because once somebody cracks that password they're gonna have access to your email your bank account your Facebook your Instagram so just make sure that you use different passwords on different sites and if you just can't remember, because I know every damn thing made a password out, if you just can't remember your passwords, you can actually use a password manager. Pretty much there's a bunch of different um, applications, there's a bunch of different services that you pretty much say, hey, this is all the stuff that I use, this is all my accounts. And they'll give you one password, so you only got to remember one password, and they'll generate a random password every time you log into those applications only downside to that is that if that password manager gets cracked they got all your stuff but anyway that's never there's neither here nor there best practices if you got a password it needs to be 8 to 12 characters right 8 to 12 characters um, anything lower than that you kind of asking for trouble so 8 to 12 characters um, if you want it to be more than 12 characters, that's cool, but that's just more shit you got to remember, right? So uh, 8 to 12 characters. Uh, number two, you should have everything in your password, uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and special characters. And try to avoid things that are in a dictionary. So don't put uh, Nike, one, two, three. Um, is Nike in a damn dictionary? Hold on, that might have been a bad example. Don't put dog, one, two, three, <laughs> um, exclamation point, exclamation point, because that's going to make your uh, password a little bit more susceptible to being cracked. Another thing, try to not have anything that pertains to you, uh, even in your username, in your username or in your password. Because a lot of people like to put their last name and then, you know, it'd be Rob85 or uh jenkins 72 or whatever right so just try to make sure that you don't have anything that pertains to you inside your password or your username and just make sure to use all that stuff uppercase lowercase special characters and numbers and try to avoid anything that's in the dictionary any words that's in the dictionary another thing like i said before passwords shouldn't be repeated um most systems now won't allow you to reuse the same password because a lot of times passwords have expiration dates whether you got to change it every 60 days every 90 days every 180 days whatever it is most places have an expiration date on your password so make sure that if it is a system that you can reuse your password that you don't reuse the same password because that's going to make you more susceptible to get your password cracked because uh, that password you probably written writ, that uh writ, writ, writ. you probably didn't written that password down somewhere probably got it saved in your phone so just make sure that you don't reuse passwords and then like i was saying at the beginning make sure that you don't use the same password across several platforms because like i said when somebody cracks your password they're going to use that try to use that password across multiple platforms make sense all right, guys, so this is the last video in our series and course, and we're going to talk about continuity concepts. Continuity just means that the continuation, right? The continuation, if something happens, how we can continue on, how we can keep on serving users, how we can continue to keep on doing what we need to do. Continuity concepts, this is really important for businesses, uh, whether it's 
Master IT, whether it's Google, whether it's YouTube, continuity. If something goes wrong, if something uh, doesn't work the way we want it to, how do we recover from those things? Okay. So fault tolerance. Every business, everybody wants to have fault tolerance, meaning that how tolerant are we when something breaks? How quickly can we bounce back when something breaks? How quickly can we fix errors? All right. So the more fault tolerant that you are, the better that you'll be. So how to strengthen your fault tolerance? You can do that through redundancy and backups. Redundancy just means the same thing over and over and over and over again. The, the reason that you can actually increase your fault tolerance through backups is that if you have a fault, a terrible fault that erases everything, that corrupts everything, you have backups. So it's not going to take you that long to come back online. Instead of having to rewrite everything, having to rebuild everything, you have backups of the things that you need. Okay. So there's a couple different types of backups. A full backup is a whole shebang bang. That is everything, right? That may be a terabyte, that may be a zeta byte, that may be just a ridiculous amount of information. So most times if you need to do a full backup, if you're in a production environment or if you're even doing your personal backup, you need to do that at a time that you're not really going to be on the computer. So pretty much you let it back up overnight or you let it back up for a couple nights or you just pretty much tell everybody, hey, it's going to be a network outage or this isn't going to work, so on and so forth. So you just have a designated block of time to where you can back up your stuff because you don't want to be moving stuff around and certain stuff doesn't get backed up or it stops the backup at all because it couldn't access, access certain things. Okay. Now you have a differential backup. So a differential backup is a type of backup that copies all the data that has changed since the last full backup. Okay. So only thing it's going to save instead of doing a whole shebang and bang, if you had a gigabyte worth of information and you added two files with a differential backup, it's not going to back up the whole one gigabyte. It's only going to save those two files and add those to the original one gigabyte backup. Okay. So differential, then you have incremental. Incremental captures only the changes made since the last incremental backup. Okay. So full backup, whole shebang and bang. Differential only saves the stuff since the last full backup. Then the incremental only saves the stuff from the last incremental backup. All right. And all of this stuff, like I said, improves fault tolerance and creates redundancy. So you have the same file saved over and over again. So if you lose it, you always have those backups. Now, another thing that's going to help with fault tolerance is disaster recovery, whether it be man made, whether it be a malicious attack, but just when things happen, how fast can we recover, right? So there's a couple different sites that we can have, whether it be cloud-based or whether it be a physical location. But these are the different sites that most businesses would set up. And it depends on their size, their budget and stuff like that, what type of recovery site they'll have. So a cold site is usually just another building. Meaning that if this damn building is set on fire, at least we'll have another building. It may not have no equipment. It may not have nothing in there. But usually the electricity is on, you know, water is running, stuff like that. But it's just another building that, you know, we can start from scratch and go over there. Now, a warm site has some of the same capabilities as the main site that was destroyed. But it doesn't have everything, right? It may have you know, a couple servers, but at our main site, we have 30 servers. It may have, um, 20 PCs, but we got a hundred employees. So it's just got some of the stuff, right? Now a hot site means that it's an exact replica, whatever the hell was at our main site. We can literally, if it's, if our site or main site is here, our um, hot site is here, we can go across the street and it's going to be a mirror image, whatever we could do at our main site we can do it at our hot site now of course the hot site is going to be the most time consuming and the most expensive but it's going to be able to get you back on your feet as fast as possible now each site and each business has a different order of restoration right and another thing like we talked about a couple episodes before is that with fault tolerance uh, with disaster recovery power outages that's one of the biggest things right 
to save the information that's on your servers to save the information that's on your most important devices you always want to have them connected to an ups or an uninterrupted power supply right so that ups is used as a backup somewhat of a backup generator but just backup power just to those main devices and the main thing is just to save everything because some ups may last 30 minutes some may last six hours but the main thing is just okay let me make sure that everything is saved everything is backed up and i can shut it down properly so nothing is uh, corrupted right so for a site it may be okay let me make sure the ups is on let me make sure the main power didn't turn back on and then let me make sure that the start servers is up right or it may be okay the ups is on main power ain't working let me uh, save everything and shut down properly, right? So depending on your site and depending on your uh, modus operandi or what you actually do at your business depends on what's going to be a priority as far as what should we restore first, what should we get back online first. Hey gang, in this video, I'm going to help you pass the ITF Plus exam. Hey gang, it's Ron from ITMagicKey.com and my job is to help each and every one of you guys get certified. So the ITF Plus or the IT Fundamentals is a entry level exam that has 75 questions and you got 60 minutes to finish those 75 questions. You also have to get a 650 out of 900 to pass the exam. The CompTIA ITF Plus exam focuses on IT essentials and knowledge. In fact, They've improved the ITF Plus so much. This is the first certification that I have my students start off with when they're in a master IT program. So let's go ahead and get into some practice questions. If you never did this type of training with me before, what we do is I say what the question is, give you a little bit of time to see what you think the answer is. Then as a family, we come together and talk about what the answer actually is and why that is the answer. So I would strongly recommend that if you get any of these wrong, that you seriously consider taking the ITF Plus exam. Gerald is currently working at Little Security Inc. Within his current security posture, he is hyper-focused on data security. He wants to ensure data isn't captured via eavesdropping. Eavesdropping is a concern for which of the following? Integrity, confidentiality, accounting, interception. So eavesdropping is a major concern for confidentiality. So confidentiality is a part of the CIA triad. The C stands for confidentiality. So eavesdropping literally means that you're trying to get things that are secret, things that are you are not supposed to know. You're trying to figure those things out by eavesdropping, being nosy, trying to look at different things to see exactly what's going on. So when you're looking at this, if you didn't get this right, eavesdropping would be a major concern for confidentiality. If something is confidential, it's a secret, nobody's supposed to know. Only the right people, only the people with the proper access, the people that are supposed to see that stuff, see that stuff. If you eavesdrop that stuff, that would be a major concern when we're talking about confidentiality. Ronnie has been troubleshooting a customer issue for over an hour. He believes the same issue may have been resolved by his coworker, Jimmy, last week. What should Ronnie have done before he started troubleshooting the problem? All right, gang, so when you get out there in the real world and you actually enter trenches, the first thing you want to do is ask the user questions. They can give you a lot of information about what's going on, when things went left, when things went right, when things went wrong. OK, so if you question a user, when the last time it was working right? Was anybody else on your device? What time did you leave yesterday? How about this? How about that? So just asking pertinent questions to whatever the actual issue is. Same reason why when you go inside of the mechanic, he asks you, what kind of sound is it making? When did it start doing that? How long has it been doing that? Because the more information he has, the better he can actually assess what the problem is. And you're going to do the same thing when you become an IT troubleshooter. Jasmine works at a tech company in Detroit. The technology company is hyper-focused on security. Jasmine has been implementing biometric security devices throughout the company. 
She installs a retina scanner. All employees must use the retina scanner before they gain access to their workspace. This is an example of So biometric would be part of authentication. So authentication, simply put, is ensuring you are who you say you are, right? So just making sure that your credentials match up to who you actually are. And through biometric, we can authenticate who you are because the biological parts of your fingerprint are unique to you. You've recently updated several drivers on your laptop. You notice the trackpad seems to have stopped working. What would remedy this issue the quickest? So what most likely happened is that you updated your drivers, now there's some compatibility issues. So the easiest and the quickest way to do that is by rolling back the drivers. So rolling back, is a term that just basically means that let's go back to when this thing used to work. So you'll roll back to the previous version of the drivers as opposed to using the updated version of the drivers. If you have not liked this video, the first thing I would like you to do is to go to hell. After that, I would please appreciate if you liked this video. Naomi is unable to view any websites. After James, the head IT tech runs a virus scan, malware is found. The malware has been redirecting all of Naomi's website requests. What would be the next troubleshooting step? So when you take an account T exam, there are troubleshooting steps. There is a mythology that CompTIA would like you to follow. According to their mythology, you need to establish a plan of action. You wouldn't document anything because you haven't done anything yet. You already identified the problem. She got malware. So you just want to make sure that you establish a plan of action. I know what the problem is. Now, what steps am I, am I going to take to actually remedy the issue? So no matter if you take an ITF plus or one of the higher level certifications, troubleshooting and those troubleshooting steps are always going to come into play. So in real life, those troubleshooting steps are the same troubleshooting steps you can use. And that was the same troubleshooting steps that I would use if I was going through a problem. Mark is a system administrator. He is adding users to the domain before he heads out for the day. When assigning permissions, he needs to use the principle of least amount of power to do their job. This way it's going to reduce the attack service, whether it's by mistake or whether it's intentional. You don't want to give people too much power and too much access to the things that they do not need. So these questions were practice questions. These aren't the questions that's going to actually be on the exam. Now, if you're watching this video and you're like, man, I already know this stuff already know what's going on. I don't need to take ITF fundamentals. Obviously, you feel like you don't have the fundamentals because if you did, you want to click on this damn video. So keep studying. Make sure that if any of these questions, if you didn't get it just like that, before I stop reading it, then you probably need to take a serious look into ITF Plus. Even if you did get them right, you probably still need to take a serious look into ITF Plus because it has so much more to offer than what I could have fit in this little ass video. Other than that, I'll see you in class. Hey gang, this is Rob and in this video, I'm gonna show you guys how to pass the A plus exam. So in this actual video we're going to talk about the a plus exam so what the a plus exam is and then we're at the end of this we can go through a couple questions and answers as a family i'll ask you the question give you the answer then actually explain to you why that answer is the answer just to get you in the right frame of mind to actually pass the exam y'all ready let's get into it
The A plus exam is a two part exam. So the first part of the exam is gonna be a 90 question exam. And you're gonna have 90 minutes to knock out those 90 questions. So it's gonna be a myriad of question types. It's gonna be fill in the blank, it's going to be simulations. It's going to be choose all that apply, multiple choice. And there's going to be literally hundreds of topics that they're going to choose from to actually put on the actual exam when you take it. Now, you have to actually pass the first part and the second part of A plus to be fully A plus certified. The first part alone or the second part alone does not qualify as a certification. All right, so we know what the A plus is. So let's go ahead and go through a couple questions and answers just to get you a little bit more familiar as to what to expect. Secret, this is not the damn questions from the exam. This is not the questions from the exam. Corey lands on an official looking website telling him that a virus has been detected on his computer. The web page appears to be scanning the local computer and often reports multiple found infections. What type of malware is being described? Is it anti-IPS? Is it anti-IDS? Is it rogue antivirus? Or is it software corruption? All right, gang, so the answer to this question is rogue antivirus. So rogue antivirus simply means that it's gonna be giving you false positives, right? So it's gonna tell you, hey man, you got a root kit. Hey, somebody stole your identity. Hey, there's a virus in this file. So you can click on that notification. So you can click on that button to actually either download a virus, to download some spyware, or to have something downloaded onto your computer that's gonna actually spy on your computer, download a virus, or compromise you or that device in some sort of way. Roland believes he has malware on his computer. What is the first thing that Roland should do? Turn off his device, unplug from power, disconnect from network, or none of these. So the first thing that Roland should do is disconnect from the network. Why do we think that is? The reason that Roland should disconnect from the network is because if he keeps it connected to the network, it'll start actually going through the network, right? So it'll affect you, then it'll affect the person next to you, then it'll affect the entire department, then it'll affect HR, then it'll affect pretty much everybody on your network. So we wanna make sure that the actual virus can't propagate and it can't migrate to anywhere else on the actual network, right? We wanna make sure when there's ever malware that it's contained, we quarantine it, and then we eradicate it. Lenny wants to connect his Bluetooth speakers to his PC. He believes he's followed all instructions, but the speakers don't seem to be working. When he checks the PC's device manager, the speakers do not appear. What should Lenny try first? Should he ensure Bluetooth is turned on for both devices, power cycle PC, power cycle speakers, uninstall and reinstall speakers? So just remember, gang, on the actual exam, you want to pay attention to what the question is asking. What should you try first? What should you try next? What's the best thing to do? What's the cheapest thing to do? So on and so forth. So the first thing you should try and do is the simplest thing, right? Make sure the Bluetooth is turned on on both devices. And then if that's turned on, then you can go a little bit deeper from there, right? So you don't want to um, disable drivers or erase drivers or remove the whole damn hard drive or do something drastic when it may be something as simple as just turning on a button. So he will want to make sure that the Bluetooth is turned on on both devices and then moved on from there. Jamie is trying to download applications from the Play Store. Every time she tries to download an application, it fails. What can possibly remedy the issue? Closing all applications and updating device firmware, factory reset the device, update the UIE hub, Uninstall and reinstall the entire Play Store.
So what you would do most likely to make sure there's nothing weird is just close a Play Store, close all other applications and update the actual firmware. So the firmware is the software that came with the device. And a lot of times if the firmware is out of date, applications and compatibility issues will arise. So the easiest thing to do would be to close everything and then update everything just to make sure that everything is working. If that wasn't the right fix, you just keep on going up the ladder, right? Just remember in real life and on the exam, just to make sure you start with the simple stuff first. Now, you start with the simple stuff, but that doesn't mean that that's the answer. Just start there and then go up from there. If that doesn't work, go to something else. Lonnie is currently in his school's computer lab. He notices that his cell phone keeps connecting and disconnecting to Bluetooth devices within the lab. These connections are unintended and he doesn't want connections like these to happen in or outside the lab. What's a step he should take to ensure it no longer happens? Should he turn off discovery mode? Turn on discover when within range? Turn on discover when out of range? Both A and C. So real simple, discovery mode. Discovery mode simply means that, depending on what the settings are, which his settings are pretty much discover and connect. Discovery mode means that whenever other Bluetooth devices are around him, they can discover that device and connect to it, right? If discovery mode is turned off, nobody can discover your device. And then like I said, you go within the settings of discovery mode to have more security, less security, auto connect, so on and so forth. So the easiest thing for him is just to make sure that when he goes into the computer lab, he has discovery mode off or just to turn off his Bluetooth altogether. Which of the following most closely relates to incident reporting? Scope, chain of custody, back out plan, or hub input. So the thing that most closely relates to incident reporting would be chain of custody. So whenever an incident happens, whenever something crazy happens, there's a chain of custody. So let's say I do something weird on the internet and I'm at work, they would take my device from me, right? To make sure I didn't delete anything, to make sure I didn't give it to anybody else, to make sure I didn't damage it or anything like that. And then the chain of custody would start with me as the first responder. And then depending on how serious it was, whatever they found on my computer, I don't wanna use myself as, a, as an example, whatever they found on their computer um, would be safe, right? They wouldn't be able to delete it, they wouldn't be able to move it, anything like that. So we'll go from the first responder, maybe to somebody in legal, then it may even go to the police. So the chain of custody will pretty much document that, okay, I had it, no changes happened. This person had it, no changes happened. Now, let's say that the weird stuff that was on that person's computer was there when they gave it to me, but then when I gave it to somebody else, it disappeared. It means that the person that I gave it to either did something weird or somebody else did something weird. So the chain of custody pretty much protects everybody in that chain to know exactly when things happen and when stuff was intact and when maybe it got out of whack. Hey, if you're looking to get into IT, I would advise you to get into the Zero to IT Hero program. So most of the students in the Zero to IT Hero program are getting A+, Net+, and Security+, Plus in 90 days. Now it's not a race, but most of the guys and girls that's in the program are getting all those certifications in 90 days. You can look up any of those certifications you can see the salary, you can see the potential, you can see the opportunities that these certifications will actually afford to you. So if you like this video, if you like me, if you like this channel, if you like how I present information, come on over to the Zero to IT Hero program where you'll get training, you'll get vouchers for the actual exams, and you actually get accountability coaching and mentorship directly from yours truly. So I hope to see you in class. Blank is a set of skills that enables us to learn about and understand people who are different from ourselves, thereby becoming better able to serve them within their own communities. Would it be cultural sensitivity, demographics, human empathy training, or none of the above? So when you're working in IT, a lot of times you're gonna be working in a team. And 
And a lot of times these teams are super diverse. There may be people from different countries, different backgrounds, different genders, so on and so forth. So you have to have cultural sensitivity. You know, you don't want to say weird jokes that may offend people. You want to, you don't want to do anything that may offend people who are not uh, from where you're from, may not have your sense of humor. Because at the end of the day, remember, it's cool if the people you work with are your friends, your buddies, but everything that's funny to you may not be funny to everybody else. So just make sure that you're sensitive to everybody's needs. Janice is the system administrator for her company. She onboards five new employees daily. She always makes new users sign documentation outlining what is acceptable behavior behavior while using company devices. What type of document are new users signing? Is it an AEU? Is it an AUP? Is it an APU? Is it an ATE? Now, gang, as we've been going through these questions, some of the questions have acronyms. There are going to be a bunch of acronyms on the actual exam. So if you do not pay attention, acronyms will literally choke the shit out of you inside of the testing room, inside the testing center, okay? So you got to make sure that whenever you see acronym, you know what it stands for, you know what it does and what happens if it breaks or if it's missing or if it's not there, right? So acronyms, right? Acronyms will make your life a lot easier when it comes to passing these CompTIA exams, okay? So the user would actually sign something called an AUP or an acceptable user agreement, an acceptable user agreement. So that literally means what's acceptable on the network and what's not acceptable on the the network. All right. So that's kind of a fail safe for you as a fail safe for the company. So somebody can't just say, oh, I didn't know. Well, you signed it. So we're about to fire you and you're about to go to jail. Right. All right, gang. So let's end this with a quick little story. So this is the first week of January. Literally every student is taking an exam through Master IT has passed. Does that always happen? Nope. But uh, 2022 has started out pretty good for us. Right. I want to give you guys a couple little tips about taking the actual exam remotely. If you look in the comments below or look at the end and maybe popping up after I finish talking, that taking the test at home can be super convenient, but there's just a couple of things that you got to be cognizant of, right? One, make sure that you're in a quiet environment. If there's construction going on, if um, your baby mama hates you and she's going to be cussing you out in the kitchen, that's probably not conducive to you passing the exam, right? The next thing is when you're actually taking the exam, the proctor, the setup may be a little nerve wracking, but don't be upset. Don't get upset. There's a few things that you need to do. For one, you got to have a clean environment. They're going to ask you to do one or two things. Either one, you're going to take your camera and do a full 360 so they can make sure there's no body in the corner whispering uh, answers to you or somebody writing on the damn chalkboard and uh, throwing stuff on the ground so you can look at it, right? Or they're going to actually have you take pictures of behind you, uh, in front of you, left, right, so on and so forth. You're also going to have to have a driver's license, a driver's license that they can see or a passport that they can see that you are who you say you are. Another thing which you should already know, you can't have anything else open, no Google, can't play no music. And another thing happened um, that I just thought about that I haven't had a student do it yet and I wouldn't recommend you do it either. If you lose internet connection, right? you're gonna have to take the test over again. It doesn't count as a failure, but they're not gonna start you off from where you were. Usually if you lose internet connection, and I wanna say the grace period is maybe 10 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes or something. If you lose connection for that amount of time, they won't allow you to jump back and start from where you started from, right? You're gonna have to com completely start over again, which can kind of uh, ding your confidence, can piss you off, so on and so forth. So. Um, I actually had a trucker that was asking me, did, is it a good idea for him to pull over to the side of the road and use his hotspot to take the exam? I told him no. I know hot spots are super duper great, but sometimes they're super unreliable. And the, most of the times when they're uh, unreliable is when you need them. If you're watching them cat videos, oh, it's going to be uh, 4K, everything going to be crystal clear and going to be no lag or nothing. But once you take this damn exam, it's going to be uh, a couple kilobytes coming through there and that's about it, right? So just make sure you got a stable connection. Make sure you go in there with confidence. Other than that, uh, make sure you like the video, make sure you subscribe, and I'll see you in class.
Hey gang, so you're probably watching this video because you're thinking about taking A+. Plus. So, just to give you a quick little overview, the 900 series, which is 901 to 902, retires on July 31st. But don't worry, if you've been studying for that, you can still take that exam. As long as you get certified before July 31st, you're good to go. We actually got a few courses over at itmagickey.com that'll help you get certified before that time. But anyway, that's not why you're here. The new version is 1001 and 1002, right? So you got 901, 902, and you got 1001 and 1002. The difference between the two is that, like I said, the 900 series expires on July 31st. You can either take that or you can take the new version. The new version has a more emphasis on cloud computing and virtualization. So that's one of the major differences between the two. Both of them still have two parts. Both of them still have the same score. So you need a 675 to pass the first part and a 700 to pass the second part. If you get both of those together, then you'll pass the A plus certification. So after this quick little introduction I'm giving you guys, there's gonna be a review of A plus questions, right? So A plus question stuff to look out for tips and tricks, not tricks, but just some tips, all right? And other than that, I'll see you in class. Hey gang, let's get straight into it. All right, so we're going to talk about the A plus 1001 exam. So to pass exam, you need 675 out of 900. Every CompTIA test is going to be out of 900, except CAS plus, which is way, way down the line for you guys. All right. Um, multiple choice and performance based questions is what you're going to see on the exam. So multiple choice just means that you get a question and you have multiple answers that you can choose. Now the performance base is talking about simulations. You probably heard about this if you've been researching a little bit. Performance based simulations are um, CompTIA's way of doing hands on. So instead of just having a question and then you got to answer it, you're going to actually have to perform some kind of function, right? So it may be securing a wireless network, it may be uh, making a network as secure as possible, installing RFID, uh, installing uh, hotspots, installing uh, virus protection. Just long story short, it may be, uh, I guess I'm making the story even longer. It may be installing new components inside of a PC. It's just going to be actually applying something. If that makes sense. Instead of just a question and an answer, you actually actually perform something, all right? All right, so you get a maximum of 90 questions. Um, for most of my students, they get around 75 to 80, and you get 90 minutes. Now, looking at that can be kind of scary because, oh, shit, wait a minute. 90 questions, 90 minutes, I don't have enough time. You're gonna, that's more than enough time, trust me. If you prepare properly, uh, it's more than enough time. And if this test prep isn't quite enough for you, you can actually head over to itmasterkey.com. We have courses for the 1000 series as well as the 900 series to get you fully prepared for the exam. So this is the areas that are focused on, on the actual exam. We got mobile devices, networking, hardware, virtualization, and cloud computing. Virtualization and cloud computing that's one of the main differences, all right, between this exam and the 900 series. So this exam focuses more on that, and that's pretty much the only real um, difference that I've seen so far. Uh, and last but not least, hardware and network troubleshooting. So these are five domains that you need to focus on to be successful in the test. And now I'm going to show you a quick little video that's going to show you what it's going to be like and what it's going to feel like when you're actually inside the testing center.
All right, gang, we're back. So since we know exactly what it's going to be like when we go inside the testing center, let's go through a couple questions and answers to try and see where you're at right now. All right. So this isn't meant to be, oh, you know, I'm about to give you all the answers to the damn test. Not at all. I'm just trying to give you um, more clarity and a better perspective on what you need to know and how your thought process needs to be. Because on these exams, especially troubleshooting and critical thinking is going to um, be pivotal to actually pass the exam. Because damn near every question is, something is broke, how do you fix it? Okay? So, let's get straight into it. Ronnie accidentally spills soda onto his laptop, and Ronnie brings his laptop to you with expectation that you'll be able to fix it. What steps should you take to ensure the laptop can be salvaged? Choose two. Easy. Perfect. Remove the internal parts from the case. Take notes of screw locations. So, taking notes of screw locations, when you're taking apart a PC or a laptop, all the screws may look like they're the same size, but some of them are a little bit smaller, some of them may be a little bit bigger. So what you can do is just take notes, write down, okay, this screw goes here, this screw goes there, or even easier, since 2019, you can just take a video, right, as you're taking it apart, and then just watch the video back when you're actually trying to put it back together, okay? Next up, Jamal wants to save paper by printing on both sides. What printer setting must be on for this to happen? Easy. Duplex. So duplex, if the duplex setting is on, it's going to print on the front as well as the back. A customer comes to you about purchasing a new computer. The customer will use the computer for watching online videos while his son will use it for gaming. What feature should be the focal points that satisfy both users? So what's something that we need to focus on to make the dad happy as well as the son? Easy. So the processor is the most important thing on or would be the most important thing for this user, right? So SSD hard drive, it would make the operating system a little bit faster, but it wouldn't necessarily make the gaming experience fast enough to handle the game that he's probably going to be playing. Uh, the RAM would make a uh, startup time and things like that a lot faster, and it would actually improve the game performance as well. But if the quad core or if the processor wasn't strong enough, then it wouldn't matter, all right? If it can handle all the processes that the game is throwing at it, have, having to render all the graphics and all this other stuff, then it wouldn't um, it wouldn't work. And actually, some of the computer games now, you may need a, a damn octa-core processor just for it to run smoothly, all right? Two cooling fans. Cooling fans are important uh, no matter what you're doing, but for this, it would be um, a later thought as opposed to um, the processor, all right? Soho. A Soho router would connect. You know what? I'm actually glad I put that in there. So acronyms. Acronyms are a huge thing on um, this test, right? So if you ever see an acronym, you don't know what the hell it stands for, make sure that you go um, look it up just so when you're on the exam, you actually know what's going on, okay? So Soho stands for small office home office. So let's keep on rocking up. A Soho router would connect physically with your computer to provide internet using which cable? Super easy. Ethernet. Perfect. All right, gang. So next up, blank would allow for cloud services to be scalable. So scalable is just a big word that means that as your company grows, the network and your capabilities are able to sustain that growth. So let's say that currently you have 100 users and in 300, I mean, excuse me, in a year you have 300 users, right? If you're scalable, it means that you can accommodate that extra 200 users, all right? So out of these, what would make cloud services scalable? Easy. Rapid. Hold on. Where's my little boy there? Where's my boy? There it is. Rapid elasticity. All right, so another acronym. Like I said, acronyms can literally whoop your ass on this test, so make sure that you're comfortable with acronyms, all right? So in theory, SSO or single sign-on should reduce the number of trouble tickets received daily. Is that true or false? So single sign-on, really quick, just means that you sign on to one platform and you have access to several, right? So let's say that you sign into Facebook, and if you notice, it's pretty much integrated into a lot of other sites. You sign into Facebook, and then you go to another um, site, and it says enter username and password, or 
sign in with Facebook or sign in with Google, all right? Meaning in that you sign in one time, but you got access to several different things. Easy. It would make it true because when you get inside a help desk or working help desk, um, a bulk of the stuff you're going to be doing is pretty much just resetting passwords because people forget their passwords and unlock their cell phone. All right. Which of the following solutions will be classified as SaaS or software as a service? That's another uh, acronym. Like I said, whenever you see acronyms, look it up really quick because it's going to help you inside the test. Because a lot of times the acronym will give you the answer or the answers, the actual answers you have to choose from are going to be acronyms. And if you don't know what the hell they stand for, you're going to have a rough day, man. Easy. So a web-based calendar would be um, an example of software as a service. What is used for wireless payments made by proximity? Easy. NFC, another acronym, which I know you guys love, stands for Near Field Communications, and that's something that you can wireless pay for something via proximity. You got to hold your phone or whatever it is close to the reader, and then it'll take the payment from you. The lead technician was just asked to go to grab some. The lead technician has just asked you to go grab some RAM from the server. What should you come back with? Only two of these answers, you know, remotely uh, make sense. And then one of them is a for sure, for sure. Easy. DDR4 is a type of RAM that you will get for the server. SODEM is a type of RAM as well, but it's used for laptops. Okay. Blank is the name of the software or device that hosts a virtual machine. Easy. Hypervisor. Perfect. What most likely has happened if you have an APIPA address? Another acronym for you. I know you guys love that. APIPA. Shit, this is going to be the answer. Well, oh well, that's what we're here for anyway. So you get an APIPA address, which is a private address, if you can't get an address from the DHCP server because you can't communicate with it, you're not connected to it. So it has to assign you something, so it gives you a private address, and that address is going to start with 169. So quick troubleshooting, if you got a 169 IP address, it's because you are not connected to the DHCP server. Thus, this answer is going to be DHCP failure. All right, an RJ45 is used to terminate an Ethernet cable. Is it true or false? Terminate is just a big ass word, an unnecessary word. It just means that that's what's used to end the cable. That's what's used to actually make the cable functional. So just a little connector that you put on the end of the cable to make it plug into whatever you want it to plug into. And this question or statement is true. All right, gang. So we went through that really quick um, test prep. Like I said, if that wasn't enough for you, you can go ahead and dump, in, dump into jump into a full course over at itmasterkey.com, either whether you're going for 900 or 1,000 series, we got you covered. But this is just a bonus tip. The verbiage on the damn test is what gets a lot of people, right? So look out for this stuff. Choose all that apply. Choose all that apply. If one applies, if two applies, if three applies, click all that apply. What's the next step? Look at the scenario, look what they've done, and what's the next thing that they should do? What's the first step? So looking at the scenario, looking at what's going on, what's the textbook first step? Is it taking off your jewelry? Is it powering the machine off? So on and so forth. I put what's the next step twice because I guess it's extra important, but that it is important. I just should put it twice by mistake. What's the best option? So looking at the scenario, once again, looking at the individuals that's in the scenario looking at the organization, right? What is the best option for them? All right. All right, gang, I know it makes you super sad, but our time has come to an end. So, as I said before, if you need any more uh, in depth uh, tutoring, course, whatever, uh, you can head over to itmagicky.com and um, hop into a course. Follow us on all our social media platforms, but most importantly, um, drop in the comments if you're about to take a test, what test you're about to take, and if this test prep helped you. And other than that, I'll see you in class. Hey, gang, in this video, I'm going to help you pass the Network Plus. So if you've been looking at networking certifications, the Network Plus has probably come up in a bunch of different conversations. So in this 
video right here. I'm gonna go through some questions. We're gonna figure out the answers to help you better prepare for the Network Plus. Let's get straight into it. Mikey is the head network analyst for Zanny Freight Company. A few new clients have a unique request regarding security. The clients would like to prevent any and all authorized people from connecting to the network via ethernet. What security measure can the network analyst implement at layer two? Port security, captive hub, WPA2, ACLs. So port security ensures that physical ports are secure. So people won't be able to just plug things into those ports. So it uses MAC addresses to make sure that if something is plugged into that port that doesn't have the right MAC address, that it gets denied, it gets no connectivity. Port security is a layer two traffic control feature and enables an administrator to configure individual switch ports to allow only a specified number of source MAC addresses to the port. Its primary use is to deter the addition by users of dumb switches to illegally extend the reach of the network. Basically, it allows you a fail safe to ensure that nobody can plug in things they're not supposed to. Ron is currently working on a point-to-point -point fiber setup that may take a week to complete. He is in downtown Chicago, which is a remote site for the main site located in rural parts of Chicago. For some reason, he cannot connect to the main site. Status lights for send and receive levels are within a suitable range. SFPs were double-checked and are all working. What tool can Leon use to find the locale of the fault. DSU, MDR, OTDR, Toner Probe. The optical time domain reflectometer is not a device that allows you to travel into the future. It's actually a device that actually checks the integrity of fiber cables. So it actually takes a virtual image of the cable just to make sure there's not any breaks, not any crazy stuff going on, and that the cable can actually have data put through it and then it's gonna go to the destination it needs to go to. So it's a fiber optic instrument used to characterize, troubleshoot, and maintain optical telecommunications networks. The testing is actually performed by transmitting and analyzing pulse laser lights traveling through an optical fiber. The measurement is said to be unidirectional as the light is an insert at an extremity of a fiber optic cable link. Using information obtained from the light signature reflected or scattered back to the point of origin, the OTDR acts as an optical radar system, providing the user with detailed information on the location and overall condition of splices, connections, defects, and other features of interest. Blank defined, instead of assuming everything behind the corporate firewall is safe, the blank model assumes there's a breach and verifies each request as though it originates from an open network. Zero Trust, UITT, MITM, ITRS. So, zero trust literally doesn't trust anybody. Nobody. It doesn't trust anything. So, it pretty much treats everything that's even behind the firewall as if it's somebody they don't know right for example let's say that you go to your mama house right and you go outside the refrigerator and she slaps the sh out of you right that would be like zero trust so even though your mama knows you she gonna act like she don't right so zero trust is a way to really secure and harden your network just to make sure that things are going the way they need to you came into work this morning to discover a problem with a DHCP server it seems the DHCP server is not properly assigning IP addresses. Anytime a new device is added to the network, the new device is not getting an IP address assigned automatically. Of the following, what may be the problem? A PIPA rerouting, DHCP scope exhaustion, network cable distortion, DNS server poisoning.
So a lot of times you will have a range, right? So you'll have a scope. So you have a scope of IP addresses that you can use. If that scope is not enough, you will have exhaustion, meaning that you've used all the available IP addresses that you have for that range and for your network. So you want to make sure that when you're doing IP address and when you set up a network that you actually have enough IP addresses to cover the entire amount of devices that's going to be on your network and you actually want to leave some IP addresses reserved and left over just for expansion, right? Because more cell phones might come, more laptops might come, more printers may come and they're all going to need an IP address. Hey man, stop moving. I should have tied you up better. It's super important to make sure that the range is accurate, right? Because you don't want to have what happened in this scenario. You don't want to actually run out of IP addresses to give to devices. So like I said, you want to make sure that you have not only enough IP addresses for right now, but for the future as well. So scalability. Scalability is super important because it means that you can actually be cool right now and when you scale, AKA grow, you actually have enough bandwidth, enough IP addresses to cover those new employees that's gonna come with those new devices. You are a network analyst for Master IT. You notice that several devices on the network have been assigned an IP address. The IP addresses were not assigned by the DHCP server on the network. After much investigation, it seems the IP addresses are coming from a server that you are unaware of. What would this be defined as? A DNS retraction, server reversion, rogue DHCP, SNMP reroute. So a rogue DHCP server is a server that is not authorized to give IP addresses to anybody on the network. Now sometimes they can be malicious, other times they can just be inconvenient. So rogue, meaning that it's then done its own thing. Instead of it being authorized by you, the IT professional, it is actually rogue, right? It doesn't belong there and it's doing whatever it wants to do. Now it may be giving out IP addresses or something else that can be a rogue device is when somebody brings a home router from the house or from somewhere else actually plugs it into the network and it's not supposed to be there. So rogue is the optimal word. So a rogue DHCP server is a DHCP server on a network which is not under the admin control of the network staff. It's a device such as a modem or a router connected to the network by a user who may be either unaware of the consequences of their actions or may be knowingly using it for attacks such as a MITM or a man in the middle. Some computer viruses or malicious software have been found to be set up by rogue DHCP servers, especially for those classified in the networking category. So as clients connect to the network, both the rogue and the actual verified authorized DHCP server will offer them a IP address as well as a default gateway. If the device decides to take the rogue DHCP servers IP address and gateway, then that device can be controlled by the DHCP server and be sent malicious stuff and stuff like that. So that's one of the reasons why you want to make sure that you have security in place to where you can see when rogue devices are on your network. Hey gang, if this video helped you, make sure that you watch my last video, which can help you not only get into tech, but level up in tech. Make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe and head over to itmagickey.com where you can get certified in 30 days. Other than that, I'll see you in class. Hey gang, in this video, I'm gonna help you pass Network Plus.
Hey gang, it's Ron from ITMasterKey.com and my job is to help each and every one of you guys get certified. So if you're looking to become a network engineer or network analyst, the Network Plus or the CCNA has probably been on your radar. Which reminds me, I actually got a video that compares the CCNA to the Network Plus and which one you should go after. So in the comments, let me know, are you going after the Network Plus or are you going after the Cisco certification? I'll let you know, if you're going after the Cisco certification, I don't know if this is going to be beneficial to you. So these questions and the actual topics that we cover inside of this is going to be specific to the CompTIA exam. Now, it's going to be specific to networking too, so it might help you as well. So you might want to stick around and this may even make you want to come on this side and actually take the Network Plus. All right, gang, so if you've never seen me, if you've never seen none of these videos, what we do is I pose a question to you, that you think about it, then we come back as a family and we figure out what the answer is and why that is the answer. The main purpose of these videos is just to get you into the proper mind frame, right? So critical and analytical thinking when you're actually inside the exam room. Now, is this short ass video enough for you to pass the exam? No sir, no ma'am, but it can help you a little bit. So if it does, make sure that you like, comment, subscribe, and share with anybody who can benefit. Let's go ahead and get straight into it. Mike is a network analyst for Master IT. He's currently creating a network diagram. The diagram will help junior analysts better understand the network infrastructure. There are notes on the diagram where Mike references SIN, ACK, and FIN. What do these terms relate to most? TCP flags, Routing table inputs, Dora, or loopback? So this answer would be A, TCP flags. So TCP flags actually indicate the status of certain data connections. TCP flags are used within TCP packet transfer to indicate a particular connection state or provide additional information. Therefore, they can be used for troubleshooting purposes or to control how a particular connection is handled. There are a few TCP flags that are most commonly used, such as SYN, ACK, and FIN. SYN is synchronization, ACK is acknowledgement, and FIN is finish. What are the layers of the OSI model? So hopefully you guys picked A. Those are the layers of the OSI model. What is the OSI model? The OSI model is just a graph, a diagram, that is a visual representation of how data flows through the network. Since you actually can't see the bits and the bytes and the ones and the zeros, the OSI model was created so you can kind of see how things go from the physical layer all the way to the application layer. The Open System Interconnection Model, or the OSI, is a conceptual model created by the International Organization for Standardization, which enables diverse communication systems to communicate using standard protocols. Basically, the OSI model provides a standard for different computer systems to be able to communicate with each other. You're currently in the networking industry. You've been in the industry for a few months. You're updating several records on a server. The records you are updating are the following. CNAME, MX, SOA, PTR, TXT. What type of server are those types of records usually found? DNS, DHCP, IP, ITS. So a DNS server is what you need for a website to be resolved to an IP address. So every website has a IP address that's attached to it. The DNS server actually resolves ESPN.com, ITMasterKey.com, Tesla.com into an IP address. So once you actually type in the website or URL name, 
the website will be connected to it and then boom, the web page will pop up. Now, inside the DNS server, there are several different types of records. And depending on the website, the infrastructure, so on and so forth, depends on what type of records will be stored inside a DNS server. DNS servers resolve website names to IP addresses. DNS servers also store a myriad of record types. The types of records stored depend on the website type. For example, you may have CNAME records or canonical name records who will point a domain or subdomain to another domain. You may have MX records, which are mail exchange records. These records show which email client you are using. You may have TXT records, which records delivered security verification and data analysis information. Jasmine is currently configuring a router. She decides that the router configuration will be based on a protocol that is used to find the best path between the source and the destination router using its own shortest path first algorithm. Which configuration is Jasmine using? All right, gang, so a lot of times when you're inside the exam room, you gotta read the question and the answer may be right inside the question. So it says something about shortest path, right? Shortest path first. And if you know about any CompTIA exam, it's gonna be a bunch of acronyms. Acronyms, acronyms, acronyms. Acronyms. So if you know what the acronyms stand for, you would know that OSPF is Open Shortest Path First. OSPF is widely used in a supported routing protocol. It is an intra-domain protocol, which means that it is used within an area or a network. It is an interior gateway protocol that has been designed within a single autonomous system. It is based on a link state routing algorithm in which each router contains the information of every domain. And based on this information, it determines the shortest path. Hey gang, just a quick word from our sponsors. Whoop, sponsors here. Hey gang, if you're looking to get your next certification in the next 30 days, drop inside the description where we have free training. And also we're accepting application to the Zero to IT Hero program where you can get up to four certifications in 90 days. Let's get back to the video. By using blank, Lonnie will prevent loops between switches at the media access control layer. STFP, STP, rainbow table, subnet, mass. So STP or the spanning tree protocol prevents looping between switches at the data link layer, which is also known as the media access control layer. The spanning tree protocol is a network protocol that builds a loop free logical topology for ethernet networks. The basic function of STP is to prevent bridge loops and the broadcast radiation that results from them. Spanning tree also allows a network design to include backup links providing fault tolerance if any active links fail. Hey gang, I want you to do something for me right now, right now. I want you to watch my last video. It should be popping up somewhere. And if not, it's down in the description. That's gonna help you not only pass your exam, but it's gonna help you level up in IT. Make sure that you like this video, subscribe. And other than that, I'll see you in class. Hey gang, it's Rob. In today's video, we're gonna go over some questions, some answers and scenarios that's gonna make the test a little less scary than it is right now. So make sure that you stay around to the end of the video and let's not waste any more time. Let's get straight into it. All right, gang, now we're gonna get into the Network Plus test prep. So let's not waste any time. Let's get straight into it. So to pass Network Plus, you need a 720 out of 900. On the actual test, it's gonna be multiple choice, scenario questions, and some performance-based questions. You're gonna have 90 minutes to pass 90 questions. So let's get to our first question and we're gonna go through it. I'm gonna read the question out to you. You're gonna figure out what it is. Then we're gonna come back as a family. I'm gonna tell you what the answer is and I'm gonna tell you why that's the answer. Sound good? Let's get into it. Sharon is a network engineer for a startup. She currently is troubleshooting several servers. The web server she's having performance issues with 
She's hold on. I know how to read. The web server seems to be having performance issues. She has gathered data from all the servers that include the web server. Which of the following pieces of data would allow Sharon to understand the normal performance for all servers? Well, for her to understand the normal performance for all servers, she would just have to look at the baseline. So the baseline just shows you, okay, this is what things look like on a day-to-day -day basis under normal operating conditions. Malik just installed several fiber links. Malik wants to certify the performance of new fiber optic links and detect problems with any existing fiber links. What tool can he use to accomplish this? Very good. He can use an OT. DR, OTDR, all right, so the optical time domain reflectometer. So I wanted to switch it up a little bit in this one. Usually I throw some acronyms at you, so both ways can kind of mess you up, right? So if you're only used to seeing OTDR, once you see optical time domain reflectometer, you might be like, what the hell is that? I don't know what that is. So make sure that you know the acronym and what the acronym stands for and what it actually does, okay? If you have yet to do so, like the video and share it with somebody that can benefit. Anybody that's going after Network Plus. Okay, you are going through the DNS records for your company. Which record allows you to see which port is being used for specific services? All right, gang, so all these are DNS records, but the one that's going to be able to show you what services are being used is S. R B. Okay. Raquel is a security engineer for Master IT. She is currently looking for weaknesses within a company. Once Raquel's reconnaissance is complete, she will exploit all flaws found. The company she plans to exploit has given her permission and even paid her to compromise the company. What is Raquel doing? Very good. Hopefully you guys said a penetration test. So a penetration test just shows you how many layers can I penetrate? How far can I get inside of a company? Where can I actually exploit different vulnerabilities and different flaws? Now, if you went through my test prep for A plus that we released uh, two weeks ago and last week, you already noticed like, man, there's some security questions on A plus. And then this is, a, I thought we were doing network plus. Why the hell is this, a, this security question on here? Because every um, exam has security portions in it because nowadays that is a super important factor for personal use as well as companies, okay? Like this damn video and subscribe. Next question. Uh, Candace is a network analyst for a law office. The firm is renting out a new office space downtown. Junior techs are running network cables through the ceiling of the office. What cables should the techs be using? Okay, gang, hopefully you said plenum rating. When wires and cabling is ran through the ceiling, it needs to be plenum rated. These cables, if they, if a fire happens, you know, God forbid, if a fire happens, these cables will not melt and give off toxic gas or fumes. So plenum rated if it's running through the ceiling because if things are on fire, that can be closer to the exhaust fans, it can get into the air conditioning system, so on and so forth, and people don't need to breathe in that type of stuff. So. Before I get to the next question, why do I keep on telling you guys to like the video and subscribe? Because um, for me to continue to make this kind of content, I need uh, the support of you guys um, liking, subscribing, sharing. And my plan by this time next year is to be at 10,000 subscribers. And I would appreciate if you would help me get there. I'm giving you this damn test for free. So, I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't. But anyway, uh, Ronnie has implemented a UTM on the outer portion of a company network. The main office connects directly to the wide area network port on the router that was placed on the edge of the network. Although the router is on the outer edge of the network, it's still on the main network. 
Ronnie needs to grant access to an outside party. The only access needed is to a file server. Ronnie does not want the third party to have access to the main network. Where should this file server be placed? So gang, this question is one of the biggest examples of something you might run into and uh, something I like to refer to as a bunch of shit that you don't need, right? So some of the questions that you'll see has a bunch of arbitrary stuff that doesn't really matter when it comes to answering the actual question. So only thing that you really need out of this is when it says Ronnie needs to grant access to an outside party, everything after that, right, is what's pertinent for this. So if you want to give a third party access to something, but don't want to give them access inside your network, you can put it inside of a demilitarized zone, okay? Jimmy will be setting up a wireless network for a company. As a network technician, Jimmy knows the office space will be crowded. He wants to ensure the wireless network incurs minimal interference once complete. What should Jimmy do? Jimmy should do a site survey to see where different devices are going to be to see how to set up the routers so they'll incur minimal interference from each other and from devices that will be in use. Most times, a network spoofing attack is when someone impersonates another device or user on a network in order to launch an attack. How does this differ from a DDoS attack? Hopefully you guys picked A. So usually a DDoS attack doesn't really require impersonation, doesn't really care about impersonation. It mostly just tries to get as many computers as possible to attack or many devices as possible to attack one singular um, device, whether it's a server, whether it's a website, which is ran on the server, so on and so forth. So it's usually multiple locations, multiple devices that's all coordinated to go after one single target. We made it through the Network Plus test prep. As I've said through the lecture and through the entire test prep, like this video, subscribe, share it with somebody that can actually um, benefit from watching this video. In the description below, you can find our full Network Plus exams, our full Network Plus course, and we also have our bundle course in there that includes A+, Net+, and Security+, Plus, all in a self-paced online course. Other than that, I'll see you in class. Hey, in this video, we're gonna help you pass Security+. Plus. Hey gang, it's Rob from ITMaskey.com and my job is to help each and every one of you guys get certified. So in this video, we're gonna be going over some questions and some answers for Security Plus. If you don't know, Security Plus is a super popular certification and it can really help you in your cybersecurity journey. It's actually the first certification that most people go after when they wanna start their cyber career. You recently got hired at Jimmy's Jump House. Karen is taking you through the onboarding process of the following. What would outline what's allowed on the network? An OTP, an SLA, an AUP, or an SSO? Now this one is pretty straightforward, but there's acronyms. Remember, acronyms. Acronyms will be on the actual exam. There's gonna be a bunch of acronyms. You gotta be careful that you know what those acronyms stand for. So in this instance, it would be an AUP. AUP stands for Acceptable 
user agreement. So that literally says what's acceptable on the network and what's not acceptable on the network, with the devices, with the other employees, so on and so forth. Jenny has put in an incorrect password five times. A message is displayed stating her account will be unavailable for the next 24 hours. What most likely has been implemented? Would it be account lean, account lock in, account break, or account lockout. So what's been implemented is account lockout. When you are a system administrator, when you have power over users, you wanna have a couple fail safes in place to protect those users. So if somebody's trying to guess their password, do some extra stuff, do some weird stuff, account lockout may be one of those fail safes. Because if you know your damn password, it shouldn't take you five attempts to log into your account. So if somebody's trying to compromise that account, you can have account lockout, actually implemented or turned on and after those five attempts is going to lock the account and you as the system administrator, you as the person that has power over the users is the only person that can unlock that account. Your network has recently been exposed to malicious software. The incident response team has contained and eradicated the malware. What's next? Lessons learned, after action review, recovery or reduction. So once you've contained the malware and eradicated and got rid of the malware, the next step would be to recover, to get back to where you were. So if things were damaged, if things were deleted, if things were messed up, you wanna make sure that you recover things so you can go back to the state that you were at before the incident happened. Tina is a new intern for the Neptune company. She goes out to the parking lot for some fresh air where she finds a USB flash drive laying on the ground. She decides to pick up the USB flash drive and take it back inside. Curiosity gets the best of her and she decides to plug the drive into her work laptop. Soon thereafter, she gets a notification stating malware detected. The malware seems to be replicating itself over and over again. What type of malware does this describe? Does it sound like a worm? Does it sound like a Trojan? Does it sound like bloatware? Does it sound like a replica? So this most likely is a worm. So a worm's main purpose is to duplicate itself. So there's one worm, two worms, 10 worms, 10,000 worms if you don't stop this virus in its tracks, right? So this type of malware is all bad. Like I said, it will not only affect your device, it'll actually try and replicate throughout the network if you're connected to a network. So the best thing to do, first thing, unplug, your device from a network or disconnect from Wi-Fi just to make sure it only propagates on that device, then turn the device off. And then if you are part of the incident response team, do what you need to do. If you're not, make sure that you get in contact with the proper personnel so they can get rid of that stuff for you. Jan has illegally obtained secure information about Billy's Bowling Equipments, CEO, CTO, and CFO. Jane could have taken data from mid-level executives, but decided to only target personnel she deemed as most important. This type of attack would be considered what? Whaling, spirit fishing, linkage, none of these.
All right, gang, so this would be whaling. So whaling is going after the biggest, the most important, the crucial characters or the crucial companies that would be most important to an organization. So whether it's Google, whether it's Billy's Bowling Equipment, whatever company it is, if you're going after the most important people in that company, that would be called whaling. So where I know what fishing is, fishing just pretty much is you're trying to fish for information, whether it's the secretary, the security guard, or the CEO, wherever you get, you get. Spirit fishing is a little bit more calculated, so I wanna get maybe this guy or that guy, but importance doesn't really matter. I just know I want this port, uh, person, but welling is specific to the most important people in an organization, and you wanna get that information out of them, you wanna get that information from them, you wanna attack the most important, crucial personnel in that organization. Karen was involved in what seemed to be a horrific accident. The alleged incident was all caught on tape. The video went viral across the internet. Soon thereafter, Karen set up a YouFundMe account to receive donations to pay for her medical bills. An influx of donations poured into her account. Soon thereafter, Karen was arrested for fraud due to faking the entire incident. What has Karen just pulled? A prank, a hoax, a bump, None of these. Simply put gang, it is a hoax. So no further explanation really needed. It was a hoax. She was lying, tried to get the bag. She got the bag. Now she got to go to jail. A blank attack is a security exploit in which the attacker seeks to compromise a specific group of end users by infecting websites that members of the group are known to visit. Would it be an SQL dump? Would it be typo squat? Would it be DNS leak? Would it be a watering hole attack? All right, gang, so this is a watering hole attack. This is when somebody spies on you. This is when somebody knows the sites that you frequent a lot, the sites that you go to every day, the sites that you are gonna be on for sure, and they'll put some type of malware on that website to advise you. So a watering hole is a term that's been used for a long time for where people meet up, where people like to hang out. So that's where the name watering hole attack comes from. They know these are the sites that you like to visit, so they're gonna make sure they have malware on each one of these sites until you click on one of them and get it. Ryan has been anticipating the new Bolo 6 game for months. It finally releases and Ryan downloads it immediately. As soon as the game downloads, he attempts to play online only to get continuous errors. If he checks online forums to find that nearly everyone who purchased the game is unable to play online, the makers of the game console blasts out a tweet stating that the servers are at capacity and have gone down. This is a classic example of which of the following. Brute Force, DOS, DDOS, MITM. All right, gang, so every server has a capacity. Let's say that the gaming server could handle 100,000 users a minute. 100,000 users, we good. Any more than that, it goes down. So this happens a lot when new games come out. This happens a lot even with Netflix or uh, Disney or any of those types of services when it's something new and it's an influx of people trying to watch something, an influx of people trying to use it. 
So DOS stands for denial of service. So denial of service means just that. You deny that service. And the reason that you deny that service is because it's reached capacity. 100,000 people can be on there at once, but 250,000 people are trying to get on there. The server can't do it. The server don't know what's going on. It's overworked. It just shuts down. It's not letting anybody on because there's way too many people trying to request access to that server at that time. Jasmine is currently interning for a startup in her hometown. She is trying to log into the company's portal to update several log events. Every time she enters the URL, she is rerouted to a site she's never seen before. The site requests credit card information. She tries a website on several other computers with the same result. What most likely has happened? Typo jacking, DNS poisoning, server retargeting, ARP adjustment. What most likely has happened is the DNS has been poisoned, right? So when you poison a DNS, instead of the DNS pointing to the website that you wanted to go to, instead of the website resolving to the website that you wanted to go to, it actually retargets and repositions and goes to another website. So the DNS, right, the name DNS, is domain name service, right? So domain name service or server or system, whichever one you want to put in there, right? But the main purpose of the DNS is to resolve a website name to an IP address or an IP address to a website name. So every website has an IP address. The IP address is just the address on the network. That's what the computer is looking for. But since humans aren't built to memorize a bunch of numbers, that's why the websites come up. Whether it's Google, ESPN, itmsq.com, everything has an IP address. The DNS server looks at for the IP address, then looks and sees what website name actually correlates to that IP address, boom, the website comes up. Now, if you poison a DNS, instead of the correct website coming up, is going to retarget to a completely different website in hopes that it'll be able to compromise somebody. Now, a message from our sponsors. Hey gang, it's Rob, and I'm super excited to introduce the Winner's Circle program. It's our all new program, and you guys are actually the first ones to hear about it. So we're going to start enrolling in the Winner's Program on the 1st of February. 1 February is when we're gonna start enrolling. So what is the Winter Circle? The Winter Circle is an immersive program that helps me take you to the next level as far as IT is concerned. So it includes everything that was in the Zero to Hero program, plus live training, plus resume optimization, plus LinkedIn optimization, plus if you go inside of the testing room or you take the test at home, and you fail, things will go the way you want to, we'll pay for you to take the test again, right? So one of the biggest things is the live sessions. So I, me, Rob, your favorite instructor in the whole wide world, actually takes you weekly through the actual course. So you have everything that's in the Zero to Hero program, plus you actually have me as a coach every week teaching you guiding you, coaching you to make sure that you get the advantage when it goes inside of the actual testing center or taking the actual exam. So with the Zero to IT Hero program, coupled with the Winter Circle, there's almost no way that you can lose, right? So if you're not familiar with the Zero to IT Hero program, it includes ITF+, Plus, A+, Plus, Net+, Plus, Security+, Plus, plus three bonus Microsoft training courses. We include on-demand training and about to detect the actual exam. Most students that were in the Zero to IT Hero program were getting their first certification in 30 days. Now, with the winner circle, we're looking to put that down to about a week or two for you to get your first certification. So if this sounds like something that you are interested in, go ahead and click apply below 
and apply to the program. So the Zero to IT Hero program was open enrollment, meaning that you're gonna enroll whenever you want it. This program is gonna be a little bit more exclusive. We're only opening up a certain amount of slots every month to let students enroll. This month, I think we're opening up 12 slots. Once those slots are filled, it's over with. And pretty much throughout the year, sometimes it may be seven slots, sometimes it may be 10 slots, sometimes it may be no slots at all. So long story short, do not wait, apply. And another thing, everybody that applies, everybody that applies will not be accepted, okay? Everybody that applies will not be accepted. Even if you're not accepted, we'll give you some guidance on a way that you can actually break into IT that may just not be with us. Like I said, we just want the best and the brightest and the people that we feel would be best for the program. So we want so what's best for us and also what's best for you, right? So if that sounds good to you, click apply below. And other than that, I'll see you in class. Ronnie has found a software vulnerability that allows him to elevate his privileges. The vulnerability has not been patched or made known to the public. Ronnie exploits the vulnerability to gain access to company data. What type of attack has Ronnie performed? Zero day, Trojan exploit, Trojan horse, Smurf. So this will be a zero day attack. So a zero day attack are vulnerabilities that are there soon as the software, as soon as the device comes off of the production line. So unfortunately, a lot of times things may be rushed. Things may not be quality tested up to the amount that we want it to be tested just to get the things to market. So the developers, the creators may know this isn't as secure as we want it to be, or this may not be as great as we want it to be. Let's just put it on the market and see what happens. So, since hackers, cyber criminals, people in general who want to do bad stuff know this, as soon as something comes off of the assembly line, as soon as a product comes out, as soon as software comes out, hackers will start hacking away at it to see what the vulnerabilities are. And if they have prior information to know like, okay, they left a back door, they left this code out. They did this, they did that. This framework isn't as secure as it's supposed to be. They can actually go after that and go ahead and take over those vulnerabilities. And a zero day attack is literally taking the vulnerabilities that are in this software, in these devices from day one and exploiting them. Angel works in HR on the Northwest corridor of Comet Connections. This side of the building is notorious for having horrible Wi-Fi. She decides to bring an access point from home and hopes it would boost the Wi-Fi signal. She begins to plug in the access point when she's stopped by the CSO. What will the chief security officer most likely tell her about the AP? So this would have been part of the acceptable use policy that, hey man, you can't bring stuff from the house and connect it to the network. So most likely that would be considered as a rogue access point. If it's an access point that the security team, that the network team didn't actually put on that network, that is considered a rogue access point and that is a no-go. Not supposed to do that, shame on you. You read, you should have read the damn AUP, you know we're not supposed to be doing that. So a rogue access point literally means that this access point that I took from the house, hey, I wanna be cool, I'm gonna plug it up on this network. Right now, I just wanna take a little bit of time, just a little bit, and thank each and every one of you guys for subscribing to the channel, for liking this video, and sharing it with anybody who can benefit. I also wanna send a special 
Shout out to uh, Jesse, Tim, and a few others. I'm sorry if I didn't uh, name you who actually joined the channel as members. It's very much appreciated. If you're looking for training, if you're looking for coaching, if you want to join the program, everything is down in the description. Other than that, I'll see you in class. Hey gang, in this video, I'm gonna help you pass Security Plus. Hey gang, it's Rob, and my job is to help each and every one of you guys get certified. So if you're looking to get into cybersecurity, one of the certifications that probably pop up is Security Plus. It's actually one of the most popular certifications when it comes to cybersecurity, and it's the number one certification according to the Department of Defense. Actually, if you want to work for the Department of Defense, a lot of times you have to be Security Plus certified for them to even think about giving you the job. So Security Plus is not easy. It's not easy at all. And I tell my students that they probably should go after A Plus and Net Plus before they even think about tackling Security Plus. Now, can you take Security Plus and pass it without any prior knowledge or any prior certifications? Yeah, it's people on the moon. Anything is possible. But I think the best thing for you to do is get certifications and then start applying for positions, applying for things that correlate to that certification so you can get experience along the way, right? So if you get A+, plus, get, a, get a help desk job, get a server administrator job. If you get network plus, get a networking job, get a, so on and so forth, right? So you get experience. So by the time you get to Security Plus, you've worked in an environment, you worked in a team, you've had hands-on experience and Security Plus, once you get that piece of paper, it'll be a lot easier because you kind of have that troubleshooting down, you have that analytical thinking down, and then it just helps you go a lot further, a lot faster if you get those certifications before, right? Now, at first it may seem like you're going slower, like, damn, I just want to get Security Plus. But from what I've seen, including myself, when I began my journey, getting A Plus and Network Plus first helps Security Plus be a lot easier, and I think it works a lot better over the long term. Before we get into the question and answer, I just want to thank the people that's actually joined the channel. If you want to join the channel, you can click the Join button down below. I appreciate all you guys' support. Also, we've had a ton of new students. I want to welcome you guys to the family. My job, as I said at the beginning of this video, is to help you guys get certified. And at Master IT, I'm doing just that. So other than that, let's go ahead and get straight into the questions. Mike is a marketing genius who is well-respected. He spends $100,000 on a targeted email campaign. His target is Frank's Furniture. Weeks pass and none of the emails reach a single employee. What most likely happened? He should have spent more money. He has a wrong email list. The mail gateway recognizes the email as spam and is disregarding them. The network is IPSECX enabled. So gang, most email platforms, whether it's Google, Yahoo, whatever you decide to use, actually has a spam filter. Some of the stuff may go to promotions, some of the stuff may go to malicious, some of the stuff may go to so on and so forth, right? So a lot of different email platforms have filters to where they can kind of read the email, look at the verbiage, look at the pictures and kind of tell, okay, this is a promotion, this is an advertisement, this is something that this person may not want in their inbox. Let me go ahead and put it to spam. Erica is a system administrator for Lou Chip Company. She is creating an account for an employee that will primarily work in the front office. Erica gives the employee full control on all folders on the share drive. What problems can administration errors such as this one lead to? Access abroad, data theft or deletion, RFID error, no issues would be found.
So gang, when you actually are in a position to be a system administrator and you're actually giving people permissions, you always want to go with the principle of least privilege, meaning that you want to give them the minimum amount of privilege that they need to complete their job, right? If this person is a janitor, they don't need full control of the server, right? So just make sure that when you get in the real world that you actually give people the least amount of privileges, the least amount of permission that they need to do what they got to do. Because if not, even if it's by mistake, even if they just click and stuff, don't know what they're doing, they can delete stuff, they can move stuff, they can see confidential stuff, they can have access to stuff that they should not see. So the principle of least privilege would be the best to avoid deletion, moving around, or just having access to stuff that they shouldn't have access to. Clara is using FTP to send data throughout her network. She has been working on a huge project for months. The day before the project is set to launch, she gets an email from her competitor with all the information she sent to her team over the last few months. How is this even possible? The competitor uses a scope to see the data. The competitor uses a sniffer to capture the clear text data. The competitor is performing a hoax. The competitor is using wire snake. Okay, gang, real simple. A sniffer just means that somebody can actually see the information that you're sending. And since the information was sent in clear text, he didn't have to decipher anything. He didn't have to decrypt anything. He could literally see everything that was sent to her entire team. So that was going to give him an advantage to be able to move on stuff before she was able to, to steal her ideas, so on and so forth. So that answer would be that he was probably using a sniffer just to decode or just to see all the information that she was sending to her team. Angel has just finished updating settings on her existing wireless router. For some reason, new devices cannot find the name of the wireless router to connect, but old ones are connecting with no issue. What most likely is happening? Router firmware is corrupted. SSID is not broadcasting. Passphrase is out of sync. The WP button is depressed. So gang, the SSID, simply put, is the name of the network. Now, if you're not broadcasting the SSID, new devices wouldn't be able to find your network. Older devices that were already connected to the router would be able to pick it up because they would be remembered in their cache of routers that they had connected to. So if you're not broadcasting, new stuff wouldn't be able to see it, but old stuff would be able to see it. Mr. Davidson is concerned about zero day attacks exploiting the network. Of the following options, which is best to guard against unknown threats? Put a content filter at IPS source. Run cloud diagnostic sync with NPS. Behavior based IPS with direct link to a cloud threat feed. Anomaly based ISP. But this one, we're going to say a behavior based intrusion prevention system server and have it linked to a cloud feed, right? So the cloud is constantly sending this IPS updates on new threats, new things, new baselines, the way that the network should be reacting, the way the software should be reacting to keep it on its toes at all times. So that would be the best way to pretty much judge the baseline of how things are supposed to go and the behavior, the normal behavior of the network and people on the network against 
the baseline against the threats that are in the cloud that keep on feeding the IPS. Hey, this is a new threat. Make sure we don't have this. Hey, this is a new threat. Make sure we don't have this, so on and so forth. Hey gang, before we get to the next question, here's our sponsors. Hey gang, this is Rob, and if you're looking for coaching, if you get all the certifications, I'm proud of you, but if you need coaching on resume writing, if you need coaching on where your actual career should go, if you need coaching on motivation, how to stay in it, how to win it, you can drop in the link below, hop on my calendar, if I have space, <laughs> hop on my calendar and we can sit down, we can chop it up and I can help you along the way. Now, if you're looking to get into training, there's also another link that you can go ahead and apply to the program. Make sure that you apply as soon as possible because as soon as slots fill up, they fill up and you have to wait until our next iteration or our next enrollment period. Other than that, I'll see you in the video. Tim, an analyst, has developed code for a new program. The program is currently being evaluated by team members. The feedback from Tim's team members will be used to improve any issues with the code. What is this process called? Gray box testing, white box testing, peer review, or baseline? So you guys are super smart, so you already know it's peer review. Peer review, real simple, means that your peers, your coworkers, people that are in the same space as you, look over what you've done, they give you critiques, they give you feedback, and with that feedback, you go and take that back to your code, or you take that back to your team, or you take that back to whatever you're working on and try and implement whatever fixes that they have for you. You are currently conducting a non-credential vulnerability scan of the following, which would most likely appear. And active local accounts, self-signed code, new patches, or audit programming. And in non-credentials vulnerability scan, you're literally looking for the people who are accessing the machine, the people who have access to the machine, who don't have to necessarily be credentialed, don't have to have credentials, don't have to enter credentials. And that would be people that have a local sign-on account. So they have a local user account, not through the network, not across anything else, but right there on the machine, they have an account that can directly access the machine. So you own Wally's warehouse and want to purchase insurance in case your warehouse is damaged. What are you doing in regards to risk? Are you mitigating? Are you transferring? Are you multiplying or are you avoiding? All right, gang, so in this case, if you have insurance, you're transferring the risk from yourself to the actual insurance company, all right? So risk mitigation, risk compliance, risk transference, risk avoidance, all that stuff is gonna be a big part of your job when you get into cybersecurity after you get Security Plus certified. So gang, I got a really, really, really quick story for you. So when I, First was going after Security Plus. I think the first version of Security Plus I took may have been in the three or the 400s. I think they own a 601 now. Yeah, they own 601 now. And that test was actually one of the easiest tests I ever took, right? That was one of the easiest tests I ever took. So why was it easy for me, right? I actually made um, a, a tired video about this. So the reason that Security Plus was one of the easiest certifications I ever took was because I took so many certifications before that. I had took A+, I had failed A+, I had took Network+, I had passed Network+, 
and I went ahead and tackled Security Plus. I got all these three certifications um, really just from self-study on my own, uh, a lot of self-study on my own, in about six to seven months, right? That's why in the Zero to Hero program, we pretty much pump people through in about 16 weeks because I know it's doable. So all of the knowledge I got from A+, all the knowledge I got from Network+, Plus, made Security Plus super easy. Um, a lot, well not super easy, I didn't get a damn perfect score, but it made it a lot easier because just so you know, Security Plus is taught as if you already know all that stuff anyway. It's taught as if you know everything on ITF Plus, A Plus, Net Plus. So once I got to Security Plus, I didn't really have any jitters because I knew exactly how the testing process went. Um, and a lot of the actual topics from all the previous certifications were on Security Plus. It's just that Security Plus had a focus on Security makes sense. So long story short, get certified, you'll gain confidence, you'll gain confidence, and you will land a gig, right? So the first thing is just to start. If you start with me, fantastic, but you need to start somewhere. Other than that, I'll see you in class. Hey gang, it's Ron from itmasterkey.com, and in this video, I'm gonna help you pass Security Plus. Security Plus is one of the most popular certifications when it comes to cybersecurity. In fact, it's usually the first cybersecurity certification people go after when they decide that they wanna be in cybersecurity. So what is Security Plus? Security Plus is a CompTIA certification. What is CompTIA? CompTIA is a really big IT vendor certification. Actually, I'm a CompTIA partner, meaning that CompTIA trusts me to give you guys what you need in the training program, the winner circle to be exact, um, to actually pass the Security Plus and A Plus and the Network Plus. So CompTIA is the vendor. So when you go to college, the college is XYZ College. And then the degree programs underneath that are the degree programs. So CompTIA is the college a plus, net plus, security plus would be the degree programs. You understand that correlation? Of course you do. So with security plus, I always tell my guys and my girls to get A plus and net plus and then tackle security plus. Do you have to do that? Of course not. It's people in a minority that go ahead and take security plus first and pass it and knock it out the park. There's two reasons that I tell you to get security plus after you get that other stuff. Because most likely, if you get A+, if you get Net+, you're gonna have some experience that goes along with that. So my students, I tell them to get that stuff just so they have a well-rounded knowledge, right? Because even though Security Plus is cybersecurity focused, if you don't have a strong foundation, Security Plus is difficult, and then when you actually get inside the real world and actually start doing cyber stuff, it's gonna make stuff a lot harder if you don't have that foundational support you're going to have foundation underneath you so my guys and my girls they actually start off with itf plus so they got a super strong foundation and they get a plus and they get network plus now like i said do you have to do that not at all you can go ahead and go straight for security plus so security plus is a 90 minute 90 question test now you may not get 90 questions you may get less than that it's a maximum of 90 questions and the passing score is 750, 750 out of 900. So every CompTIA exam is on a scale of 900 and you gotta get 750 out of 900 to successfully pass the Security Plus. So as I always tell you guys, my job is to help you get certified. So that's what this video is all about. We're gonna go through a couple questions and answers just to get you a little bit more acclimated to how you need to be thinking when you actually get inside the testing center and when you actually take the actual exam. You ready? Let's get into it. Blank technology is a capability of a computer system, electronic system, or network to deliver uninterrupted service despite one or more of its components failing. Does that sound like fault tolerance, fault interceptor, scalability, or disruptive allocation?
The answer to this is fault tolerance. The more fault tolerance you have, the better. Literally, fault tolerance means that your device, your network is more tolerant to faults. So when things break, it won't actually break completely. When things don't go right, it's actually more tolerant. And the reason it's more tolerant is because you put things in place that make the faults not just crippling. It doesn't actually melt down the whole network. It doesn't actually break the entire system. You have things in place that when one thing goes down, something goes up. This goes down, this comes up. All right, so backups, power supplies, whatever that fault tolerance comes from, it makes the network, it makes the device, it makes the organization a lot stronger if fault tolerance is in place. Make sense? A blank is a form of physical security and is most susceptible to blank attacks. All right, gang, so the form of physical security that we're talking about in this is gonna be a security guard. And what's most susceptible to social engineering would be that security guard. So social engineering is a big word that simply means being nosy. So you're just asking a bunch of questions, ask a bunch of probing questions to see if you can get valid information, if you can get valuable information from a person, right? So you befriend or try to befriend a security guard. At, hey, how long have you been working here? Oh, okay. What time do you get off? Oh, okay. That door over there, is it usually locked? Oh, okay. Oh, you got a security badge? How does that work? Oh, okay. Is this camera up here, is it working or? So basically it sounds like it's just harmless chitter chatter, but it's actually somebody trying to probe into what you're doing, what you got going on to use that information against you and your organization. Key escrow is a method of storing important cryptographic keys. A key escrow is like a blank for your user's keys. Cryptographic keys encrypt and decrypt. So it makes stuff secret and then allows you to read that secret stuff and only allows you or the person that has the decrypt key to read that stuff. A key escrow would act as a valet. So it would take those keys and store them in a safe place until you return. Now that's what the valet is supposed to do, but I, I've seen videos on YouTube, you know, valets doing donuts and Lamborghinis and all kind of crazy stuff like that. But a key escrow wouldn't do that to you. It's gonna take the key, keep it safe until you return, until you actually need to use it to either encrypt something or decrypt something. Jimmy is doing a scan that detects and classifies system weaknesses in computers, networks, and communication equipment and predicts the effectiveness of countermeasures. What type of scan is Jimmy doing? A vulnerability scan does just that. It scans for vulnerabilities. So it looks for weak points inside of an organization, inside of a network, inside of a device, and it tries to actually alert you, tell you, or whoever actually is in charge that, hey man, you got these vulnerabilities. I found it on this scan. These are some of the things that you could possibly do to prevent these weaknesses and these weak points from compromising your organization. James just got fired from his job as a software engineer. Before turning in his laptop, James starts injecting client-side scripts into web pages of the company's website. What type of scripting is James using? On the actual exam, sometimes they're gonna be things that you've never seen before. You've never seen them before, don't remember studying them, and a lot of times that's because it doesn't matter. That's not the answer. They throwing that in there just to throw you off. So the answer to this is cross site scripting. Those other answers are just shit I made up, right? So XSS is cross site scripting. So if you're ever on the exam or if you're ever looking at anything, you see XSS, it just cross site scripting. The X stands for cross. Cain and Abel is most closely related to which of the following?
Can enable is a password cracking tool. And the weaker your password, the easier it is for can enable to figure out what your password is and to start using it, so on and so forth. There's a lot of password cracking tools and most of them literally just sit there and they just try and guess your password. Guess, 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 until it figures out what your password is. And once it figures out what your password is, it's probably going to use it across as many sites as possible. Because unfortunately, you know, pro tip, make sure that you're not using the same password across everything. Your damn Facebook password should not be your bank password. Your Netflix password should not be your Instagram password. Try to switch it up. Try to be as safe as possible. Make sure that you're using strong passwords across all platforms. Because if you're using the same damn password across all platforms, once a person has one thing, they got everything. Now, a quick message from our sponsors. Speaking about having everything, the Winner Circle has everything. The Winner Circle is our all new program and we're actually accepting applications right now, right now. If you're familiar with the Zero to Hero program, it's pretty much the Zero to IT Hero program on steroids. So you get everything that was in the Zero to Hero program, plus you get weekly live sessions with me, plus you get to take the exam twice. I said that you go in there, you're nervous, your stomach hurt, stuff ain't go right, you can take the exam again on us. Last but not least, we have an industry professional come in once a month and talk to you guys just to tell you how it's gonna be when you actually break into IT. As you already know, we got ITF Plus, A Plus, Net Plus, Security Plus, plus a bunch of bonus training. And most of the students are getting those four certifications that I just talked about in about 120 days, in about 90 to 100 days. So about three or four months. So if that sounds like that's something that you would want to do, make sure you click the link below. You got to apply. You got to put in your application. And if you accept it, I'll see you in class. Rebecca works for Yosemite Piping Corporation. She receives a call about providing her login details for her account from the IT team. The caller requests she provide her password for an information assurance audit. What should Rebecca do next? When you guys are actually in the field, when you guys are actually working in IT, when somebody calls you or just in everyday life, when somebody calls you asking you for your password, that's probably a red flag. That's probably somebody that's trying to do something bad to you. But just to verify, just like Rebecca did, she's gonna call the IT department. Hey, are y'all calling around asking people for their passwords? The IT department gonna tell her, hell no, and then she can hang up the phone and go ahead about her life. The action or process of integrating a new employee into an organization or familiarizing a new customer or client with one's products or services. What does this statement describe? Real simple onboarding just means getting somebody on board. Hey man, this is how we do things, this is how things are gonna go. So it's pretty much just an introduction to how you do things and how they need to conduct themselves. Gary Reynolds is running for governor. He recently made several controversial statements that upset several groups of people. A hacker named Iron Wolf decided to hack the potential governor's campaign website. Iron Wolf would be best described as a So a hacktivist, real simple, is a activist who's a hacker. So a lot of times a hacktivist has some kind of political motivation. Just like Mr. Reynolds said something he wasn't feeling, he wanted to go after him as a politician. So usually it's politicians, senators, governors, lawyers, judges, it's people that have some type of political influence or some type of political ties. And the hacktivist actually tries to hack their campaign website or tries to hack something that would pretty much stop them from doing whatever they're trying to do. Do you see how the questions are kind of bouncing around? There's not one common theme. So there's hundreds, literally hundreds of topics on the actual exam. And the way the exam is set up, it's not going to have 10 questions about social engineering and then five questions about intrusion detection. It's going to have questions just about a little bit of everything. So that's why you got to be extremely focused, know what to study, 
know how to prepare because there's only gonna be 90 questions out of hundreds of topics. Which of the following are types of social engineering? Choose all that apply. Phishing is a way to get information from a person, usually via email. So the email isn't going to look professional. It's going to have misspellings and it's probably going to ask you something crazy. If I'm going to say something like, hey man, I got a million dollars, but it's tied up in an overseas bank account. I just need to use your account to have the money in there. And just for putting the money in there, I'll give you $50,000. I just need your bank account and your social security number. So that's phishing, kind of casting a wide net hoping that somebody bite, hoping we get some kind of sucker to take part of this. Now, whaling, usually we don't want to go against anybody. We want to go against the biggest person, right? We want to go for the CEO. We want to go for the biggest company. We want to go for the most important person, right? So whaling is social engineering as well, but you're trying to get information from a super important person. Fishing is like, I'm just trying to get information from anybody gang i want you to do one thing for me make sure you watch my last video it should be popping up somewhere around here that video can help you break into it as always like this video subscribe and other than that i'll see you in class hey gang in today's video we're gonna get you ready for the new version of the security plus exam Hey gang, it's Ron from ITMetalSki.com. And if you've never seen me before, hey, how you doing? Glad to meet you. I am the founder and creator of Master IT, an online training program that's getting students just like you certified. So if you're not aware, depending on when this video drops, either today or in a couple of days, the version of Security Plus, the 501 version of Security Plus is going to be expired. You're not going to be able to take it anymore, all right? So, because that version of Security Plus is retiring. So, the new version of Security Plus is the 601, right? So, from right now, right now, moving forward, the only version of the exam that you actually can take is going to be the 601. So, the 601 exam is going to cover the following you're going to have attacks, threats, and vulnerabilities architecture and design, implementation, operations and incident response, governance, risk, and compliance. So the actual exam is 90 minutes long and you'll have a maximum of 90 questions. To pass the Security Plus exam, you'll need a score of 750 out of 900. So if you've never done a test prep with me before, if you've never went through this, this is how we do it, right? So show you what the question is, show you the various answer types, and then I'll let you figure out what you think the answer is. And then as a family, we figure out what the actual answer is, okay? So if you can do me a quick favor, make sure that you like this video for the YouTube algorithm. And then other than that, man, let's just get straight into the test. Ricky recently started working for Master IT. He has been in the security field for over 10 years. He specializes in penetration testing. He has been tasked with hardening security for a law firm. The client at the firm has given Ricky zero information about the firm. The client has not given Ricky access to the network, employees, or even the building. Ricky only knows that he's to perform a penetration test. What type of testing is most likely to be performed? Is it gonna be a white box test, a gray box test, a black box test, or none of these. All right, so gang, I hope that you picked black box. All right, so a uh, black box penetration test just means that you don't have any information. You're literally going in there in the dark. You don't know anything about anything. You don't know what type of security they have. You don't know what type of uh, parameters or boundary that you have. You just pretty much are acting like a hacker that doesn't know anything about the company and you try and uh, penetrate their defenses. Jasmine is the head of a huge account for a marketing agency. She's well-respected in the advertising space. She recently launched an email marketing campaign for a new fitness apparel brand. 
Her target market are individuals who are 25 to 35 and live in inner city New York. She segments the emails into groups. She notices that the segment she sent to Goldie's Gym had a 0% open rate. Jasmine was depending on Goldie's employees to spread the word about the new brand. What most likely is the reason no emails reach the employees? Is it because the network has IP6X enabled? Is it a DOS attack? Is it DNS poisoning? Or is the mail gateway recognizing the email as spam and disregarding them? All right, gang, so depending on how you have your email gateway, your email server set up, a lot of advertising and a lot of different types of emails may be looked at as spam. And these emails are being caught by the spam filter and actually going inside the spam folder. And a lot of people aren't looking inside the spam folder for these emails. So most likely, that's another thing. When you're going through the test, you gotta look at those keywords. Most likely, first thing to do, last thing to do, most expensive, least expensive. Make sure that you pay attention to that stuff when you're inside the box. Jamal has been a developer for three years with over a hundred projects under his belt. Jamal was told that the company he works for will be going in another direction and most likely would have to part ways with him. Jamal was furious due to the company waiting until his last project was done before letting him go. Before Jamal leaves the company, he decides to leave a break in the code on the current program he is working on. This will allow him to manipulate, edit, or destroy the program at any time. What has Jamal created? So Jamal created something known as a back door. So literally like a back door. So he's pretty much created a way for him to always have access to the code, to always have access to um, the program or software that he was working on. So if he gets pissed off or he wants to do something, he can always go back in there and change things or completely destroy it if he wants to. Hey gang, if you're enjoying the test prep so far, once again, make sure that you like this video and make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you don't do those two things, it's gonna be really hard for me to continue to make videos just like this one. Lenny is currently interning for a startup in Detroit. He is trying to log into the company's network portal to update several log events. Every time he enters the URL to the portal, he is routed to a site he's never seen before. The site requests credit card information. He tries the website on several other computers with the same result. What most likely has happened? So most likely what's happened is something called DNS poisoning, right? So your domain name service or domain name server is responsible for resolving your IP address to a actual name, right? So if you're trying to get to a certain website, it tries to figure out what's the IP address for that website and then it resolves it to a name. Or you can do it in reverse. It actually looks at the website name and then sees, okay, what IP address is attached to that, and then once it figures that out, whoop, it brings up the um, website address, right? But if your DNS server is poison, we can actually reroute you to different things. So you wanted to go to itmagicky.com, but it's actually taking you to itttech.com, which you don't want to go to, right? So DNS poisoning is what's most likely happening, right? Like I said, always make sure that you're paying attention to um, those little nuances. Um, as we've been going through this, as you've seen, a lot of times on the, hold on, let me preface this. Um, these are not the actual questions that's gonna be on the test, okay? These are uh, simulations. These are kind of like the questions, just, I, I mean, I know, you know, um, that's real damn dumb, but I just have to preface that this is not the real questions, right? But when you actually get inside the box, you have to really be quick um, with deciphering what the hell they're talking about, right? Because a lot of times, a lot of the information that's in the question, you don't necessarily need it, okay? 
Talking about things that you need, you need to be in a zero to hero IT program over at itmagicy.com. We start you off with ITF plus, and then we run you all the way up to security plus, making sure that you have the fundamentals and you also have the certification that our employers are looking for. So I don't know what you're waiting for. I'll see you in class. James works in HR on the Northeast corridor of Metroplex. This side of the building is notorious for having horrible Wi-Fi. He decides to bring an access point from home and hopes it would boost the Wi-Fi signal. He begins to plug in that access point when he stopped by the CSO. What will the CSO most likely tell him about the AP? Would he ensure all firmware on the AP is up to date before connecting? Would he ensure that all firmware on the access point is up to date before connecting? Would he tell him rogue access points are not allowed on the company network? Would he ensure he puts the AP in a place where it will not cause interference with other devices? Would he ensure that he uses WEP with TKIP 256-bit encryption? So the CSO stands for Chief Security Officer, right? That's another thing. There's gonna be a lot of acronyms on the exam. And AP, I already said it, stands for Access Point. But if you didn't know those two acronyms, it might be kind of difficult. Like, who the hell is a CSO? What the hell is an AP, right? It would be kind of hard to figure out what the hell they're actually talking about. So most likely what he's going to tell him is, hey, man, you can't be bringing shit from the house and think you connect it to the network, right? So the answer would be uh, no rogue access points are allowed, right? Because we don't know what you're trying to do. We don't know if the device that you're using is secure, unsecure, pretty much they don't want anything that's out of compliance or could be out of compliance on their network. All right, gang, so if you really, really, really enjoyed the test prep today, make sure that you watch um, the video that I got linked in the description. I may put a picture up uh, somewhere here that's gonna tell you about the things that you need to do to land an IT job, all right? So that's it, that's all, I'll see you in class. Hey gang, it's Rob. In today's video, we're gonna go over some questions, some answers, and scenarios that's gonna make the test a little less scary than it is right now. So make sure that you stay around to the end of the video and let's not waste any more time. Let's get straight into it. All right, gang, now we're gonna get through a cybersecurity test prep for Security Plus. So the goal of this test prep is to get you a little bit more comfortable, like I said, with the actual exam. So how are we gonna do it? I'm gonna go through the questions, right? Then I'm gonna tell you what the answer is. Then I'm gonna tell you why that's the answer. But pretty much we're gonna go through all this as a family and figure it out together, okay? All right, gang, so on the Security Plus, what you're gonna expect is you're gonna to have to get a 750 out of 900 to pass the exam, okay? Um, you're going to have a multitude of different types of questions. Some of the questions are going to be multiple choice. Some of them are going to be performance based. Some of them are going to be simulations. So you're going to have, it's not just going to be multiple choice. It's going to be a variation of different types of questions. And on the actual security plus, you'll have 90 minutes to knock out 90 questions. Now that might seem like a lot. That may seem like, I don't know if I can do that, but once you actually drill this stuff into your head, once you actually get inside of the box, especially if you're going through one of my courses, once you get inside the box or if you go to the testing center or if you're taking a test at home, all the stuff is going to be like second nature. And you won't even need, because if you, you know, you're good at math, I know that, that means it's one minute per question. You won't even need that. You 30, 45 seconds, boom, boom, you'll be rocking through it. So when we go through these questions, don't look at how long it's taking us to go through these questions. Don't treat that as a barometer of how long it's going to take you, because remember, we're waiting, we're explaining stuff, so on and so forth. Let's get into it. <laughs> Vicky is a security specialist for an IT firm. Today, she spent most of her time reviewing server certificates. She examines a numeric string created by a certificate authority. This numeric string can represent how certificates will work with policies to control how various programs behave. Which of the following is Vicky most likely examining? Now this may be uh, difficult, but don't worry about it. 
So the numerical string that she's looking at is going to be the OID. So all certificates, the digital certificates that's created by a certificate authority or a third party come with an OID. And you can look at that to kind of see how the policies and different things are going to make whatever the application is, how to, pretty much how that certificate is going to make the application behave. So that's what she's looking at. Okay, well, how is this? going to affect my application is it going to change the behavior or how is it going to behave or how does it normally behave okay so a test result which incorrectly indicates that a particular condition or attribute is absent what does that best describe so you guys are super smart so you said false negative a test result which inaccurately indicates that a particular condition or attribute is absent. So pretty much you say, hey, man, this don't work, but it actually does work. Now, if it said a test result which inaccurately indicates that a particular condition or attribute is present, then it would have been false positive. Make sense? Hey, gang, do one or two things or do both of them. If you're not subscribed, subscribe. If you haven't liked this video, like this video. Donnie is the chief security officer for Master IT. He believes that Master IT will grow at a rapid pace for the next five years. He notes that the company is growing by 50 users a month. He ensures that the company is prepared for the growth by increasing laptop servers, UTMs, employees, and real estate. What Donnie has done has improved which of the following for Master IT. Answer is going to be elasticity. So pretty much being able to handle the growth that's going to happen. All right. So the growth that they're expecting, he has the elasticity, elastic, being able to expand, being able to hold down all the new employees, all the new users, everybody that they're going to have. So they're planning the scale, right? So they're planning the scale. They're planning to have more and more devices, more and more people, more and more things going on. So the more elasticity you have, the more prepared you are for that growth. Make sense? All right, Jean is in the office working late. She looks around and notices she is literally the only person in the office. She attempts to access data that is above her current access level. Mm. She receives an error stating access denied, contact admin. What access control model is in effect? made this I made this made all these questions I don't know why I said mm, like that was a surprise but all right so what's an effect is mandatory access control so with Mac or mandatory access control you only have access to the things you need access to you only have access to the things that you need to perform your job with DAC or discretionary access control you're going to have full control to whatever you have access to. So instead of having certain levels of access, you'll have full access. With Mac, you only need what you need. You don't have access to anything extra. Okay? You are a web developer for a school district. You are disgruntled and decide to hack the school's homepage. You manipulate several HTML frames by injecting JavaScript code via the web browser. What type of attack does this most closely align with? Like the video, like the video, like the video. So hopefully you guys said XSS, which actually stands for cross site scripting. All right. So if you see X, it just means cross. Cross site scripting is what you would do to inject that JavaScript code. Cross site scripting also seen as XSS. As I said in other videos, why I keep on saying like these videos and subscribe and share is because that's the only way that um, I'll be able to continue to do these videos for you guys, right? Is if you uh, like the video, support, 
and share. So if you continue to do that, it's too easy. I'll continue to make the videos. If not, next video. I mean, next question. So this is a super duper question. Um, like I said in some of the other videos, this is what I like to call um, a bunch of shit that you don't need, right? So this is a perfect example of how to decipher the information that you need to get to the right answer. Let's get into it. The Edelman firm has been making headlines recently. The CEO has been charged with running a Ponzi scheme and stealing more than $400 million from investors. The FBI sees all laptops and computers from the firm's headquarters. A rookie agent put all the devices into a storage locker. Once Edelman's trial began, all information on those devices was deemed inadmissible. Edelman's lawyer reviewed the security tapes of the storage locker to find that it was unlocked for several days and three non-agents accessed the devices. What did the FBI mishandle in this case? Very good. Chain of custody. So they didn't have a proper chain of custody, pretty much meaning that they didn't know exactly where the devices was and who had the devices at every point before the trial. So the purpose of that is that if you don't have proper chain of custody, somebody could have removed data, added data, so on and so forth. So they couldn't actually use that against Edelman in the trial. And this is just a scenario that I made up. This isn't real. So don't look for Edelman. Um, another thing I want you guys to look at is sometimes on the exam, you will see a question this big and you automatically get scared. Like, oh, I ain't going to get this right. But like I said, just look at the keywords and figure out exactly what you need to see and exactly what you need uh, to get out of there. Because like I said, a bunch of this stuff is stuff that didn't even matter. Um, pretty much all you needed was from after it said the stuff was admissible, you could have got the answer just from using that stuff. Okay? Jerry's drowning in college debt. To get even, he is working hard to crack the passwords to the servers of Fannie Mae. Once he cracks the servers, he hopes to wipe everyone's student debt clean. He's using huge databases of pre-computed hashes. The database's reduction functions have one color for plain text on the top and another color for the hash functions. What is Jerry using to help him crack the server's passwords? So another thing with this is uh, keywords as well. So hopefully you guys got rainbow table. So two of the key things from this was going to be pre-computed hashes, which rainbow tables use, and then when they brought up the colors. So like it says, re re uh, reduction functions have one color for plain text and another color for the hash function. So rainbow table would be the answer to this. Today's world is more connected than ever. Take Trevor, for instance. He loves technology and wants everything connected. His smartphone is synced to his PC, which is linked to his virtual assistant, which is linked to his smart fridge. Unbeknownst to Trevor, the fridge has become a zombie. The fridge has, or excuse me, the fridge was a part of a coordinated DDoS attack to take down a popular news website. The fridge is part of the following. Choose all that apply. Very good. Hope you said IoT and botnet. So IoT is Internet of Things, things that connect to the Internet. Uh, botnet um, is part of a DDoS attack. So you have a DDoS attack, right? And all of the devices that are part of the DDoS attack are called zombies. All of the zombies make up a botnet. Make sense? All right, gang, so we rock through the Security Plus test prep. Hopefully you feel a lot more comfortable. If you don't, oh well, I tried. So if you want to get Security Plus certified, if you're looking for some courses, if you like the way I teach, you can drop down into the description and you can roll inside of my full Security Plus course or you can just get some more practice questions um, as well, depending on what you need. So make sure, like I said at the beginning, that you like, comment, subscribe, and share this video with somebody that can um, benefit from it. And other than that, I'll see you in class. In today's video, we're gonna talk about why I think Security Plus is the easiest certification I ever got. I 
got a story. Want to hear it? Well, here it go. So I've been in IT since 2007. Um, throughout that time, I've been a multitude of things, all in IT, fortunately. I was doing networking pretty heavy for a while, then I was doing cybersecurity stuff uh, really heavy for a while, and I was a project manager. I was help desk. You know, I kind of did that back. I was help desk first. I, went, I didn't go all the way to being a damn project manager and then fall back down to being help desk. Ain't nothing wrong with help desk. It's actually where um, I learned a lot of stuff, a, a lot of stuff um, in help desk, to be honest. Um, so I was in IT since 2007, but I didn't get my first certification until around about 2010 or 11. So I've been working in IT for a couple years, right? So the first certification I got was called A+. So I knocked out A+, got that, fantastic. Um, about six to seven months after that, I started to study for a certification called Network Plus. So I was studying for Network Plus. Um, Network Plus seemed really difficult because A+, plus, just for me, not, uh, this is just my opinion, I, uh, other shit was harder for you, that's you, but I'm talking about me right now. So um, A+, plus, um, just seemed like a lot of stuff, right? It was some networking stuff on there, but it just seemed like just a smorgasbord of shit that I didn't know. So, um, Network Plus this was hyper focused, right? It was hyper focused. It was all networking stuff. It was all troubleshooting stuff, but it was all network, um, networking um, focus. And it just to me it was difficult. It was it was a really hard test for me. Um, I passed it on my first try. I actually never failed a Network Plus. I've been taking it, I don't know, three or four times. You know, every time I have to renew it. That's another thing, just in case um, if you're going on um, your journey, uh, count TIA certifications. Um, specifically, uh, you have to um, recertify every three years. I want to say, yeah, every three years. Um, most certifications you have to recertify every few years just because technology changes so fast, right? If you got um, a certification from 10 years ago, that um, technology is probably obsolete. Anyway, so I knocked out Network Plus. Um, and then maybe because once I got a plus I kind of was like I got the ball rolling like every six to seven months I was taking or at least I was taking a cert or two a year, right? Anyway, so I knocked on network plus um, Where the hell did I take security plus? At? I can't remember where the hell I was at when I took security plus but I knew It wasn't too far after um, I took network plus so I kind of had a um, Study a regimen down and it pretty much was I was just studying my ass off. I probably was studying too damn much. I was probably studying like three to four hours every day and I would give myself um, 30 days at a minimum and then 60 days max, which I didn't really need to do. I was kind of over preparing, but um, anyway, when I went and took um, Security Plus, right, I had knocked out A Plus, had knocked out uh, Network Plus, I had my study regimen down, I kind of knew um, the types of question, not what was going to be on the damn test, but kind of how CompTIA asked questions. I know they kind of, you know, um, they're not straightforward. You know, it's going to have a bunch of extra shit in the question that I don't really need. So I had all that um, experience, so I kind of knew that um, what to expect, right? So anyway, so I'm studying, 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 studying. Um, and back then, it was kind of harder to kind of figure out where to go what to do, uh, who to study, where to study from. And then when I was going through it, man, whew, shit, that's kind of why I uh, made this program and I make these videos. When I was going through it, you know, it's cool, but it was a bunch of just just people that was born as hell, man. It's like, cause you know, this IT stuff is cool. You know, they kind of want to, you know, in the movies act like it's all hackers and you're going to be in a dark room and doing some cool shit, man. And when you learn it, it was, it was rough, especially if you have a super dry teacher that act like they need a damn Red Bull IV to have any kind of energy. It's just kind of rough, man, it's rough. And then, um, uh, but I know my ultimate goal was, you know, to get certified, so I was like, whatever, whoever I gotta get this shit from, I get it from. So I just had um, a multitude of resources, probably too many resources. Um, drop in the comments what you think about that. Do you feel it's better to have a bunch of resources to learn from or one or two, you know, um, resources to learn from. Me, personally, I like it better when it's just one 
you know, source. I can get all the shit I need from that one source and then that's the way it is instead of me having to get a little bit over here and a little bit over there. And then a lot of times, um, if you're listening to a bunch of different instructors, a bunch of different YouTubers, a bunch of different damn people that's never going to uh, pass the certification any damn way, uh, they'll have different uh, viewpoints. And a lot of times those viewpoints will confuse you. You'll know what the hell's going on anyway. So, the name of this video was Security Plus was the easiest exam I ever took. And that is true, just for me. The reason I think it was easy, because I crushed that shit, man. I think I, I, I took Security Plus um, the first time, and I was in there for maybe an hour. And it was like, you know, the other ones I kind of was like, eh, I think I passed, but I don't know. That one I knew I passed it. Like, I knew I passed it. And. I think the reason that it was so easy was because I had already got those other certifications, right? Um, even with me working in the field, when I first got, um, when I first started studying Security Plus, I was still in networking and was trying to get into cybersecurity and security and stuff, right? So I wasn't actually working in security just yet. So that was one of my motivations to get it was so I could, you know, move around a little bit easier, get promoted, that kind of stuff. Um, what the hell are we talking about? So Security Plus, it was easy because I had already had the knowledge from A Plus, right? And Network Plus. Now, if you've taken a CompTIA exam before, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, the certifications are kind of um, taught like in a ladder method, right? So if you got A Plus, everything um, that's on Network Plus, or some of the stuff that's on Network, how, how can I say it? Okay, this is a better way to say it. The way that the shit is taught on Network Plus is as if you already know the stuff that's on A Plus, right? The stuff, the way the stuff is taught on Security Plus, or the way that the stuff is presented on Security Plus is as if you already have A Plus and Network Plus. That makes sense, All right? So that's why um, a lot of times I tell people like, "Hey, can I just be a Security Plus?" Like, yeah, you can do a lot of stuff. It's people walking on the moon. Would I uh, suggest you do that shit? Not at all. But you can do it, you know, if you want to. You know, there's a bunch of people. I won't say a bunch. That may be a treasure. But there are people, you know, who pass um, Security Plus without any other experience um, all the time. But a lot more often, there's people that fail Security Plus, right? And pretty much crush their whole dreams. They pretty much say, oh, I'm stupid. I can't do this just because it took Security Plus first without having any prior knowledge, any prior experience, never taken another test um, before. And that Security Plus, if you don't know any of the acronyms, you're not talking about acronyms, whoop your ass inside of the testing center. Um, if you don't know the basis of networking, if you don't know the basics of the way operating systems work, if you don't know the basis of, you know, all this stuff is gonna be pretty tough, right? So uh, Security Plus, um, like I said, was my easiest. Um, certification because I already had those certifications so that's another reason um, why you know the 15,000 students that I have taught that's why I set them up the way I do um, I have them take if they don't if they're really really um, I don't want to say behind but if they um, need a little bit more help you know I usually start them off with something called ITF plus um, so I'll throw them in um, our ITF plus course Get them sped up and then had to move on to A plus, then network plus, and then security plus. Now, you know, you all are grown men and women, y'all can do what the hell y'all want to, but you know, my that's just my suggestion for my students. Because I even have students that go directly for security plus, boom, and get it. But more often, um, the students that go through that ladder progression that go through um, those steps, they end up passing security plus more often. Um, now, I do get a lot more like, hey, your, your course is great blah, 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 damn, I should have listened to you. I was like, yeah, I told you, like, I know <laughs> the course is good. You ain't got to tell me that, I know that. But Security Plus, you know, even though I give you what you need, it's still, once you get inside the box, it's still going to make me some things that pop up that if you haven't taken A Plus, you haven't taken Network Plus. Because also, um, in the Security Plus course, I give you everything that you need. But even I, you know, I kind of step back a few times, but most of the times I even teach the stuff as if you already know A plus and network plus because that's pretty much what I set you up for. Makes sense? So anyway, um, in the comments below, uh, let me know um, what certification that you're taking. If you've taken a certification, um, 
what are some tips and tricks that you use um, that you like? Like I said, do you like to study from um, one spot or several spots? Um, another thing for the YouTube algorithm, make sure you like this damn video. Um, make sure you subscribe so I can continue to make videos like these. Without you guys' support, um, I won't be making these damn videos no more because um, believe it or not, those likes, they help a lot um, with visibility, so on and so forth. Um, but other than that, if you need a full course, like I said at the beginning, uh, I'm the creator, curator, a proud father of the uh, Become a IT Master program, which is helping students every day get certified and actually get inside of um, the IT industry. And other than that, I'll see you in class. Hey gang, in this video, I'm gonna tell you exactly what you need to do to get certified. Hey gang, it's Ron from ITMasterKey.com and my job is to help each and every one of you guys get certified. So, I don't want to waste anybody's time, right? Don't want to waste your time. So what I'm going to do is tell you the truth right now. If you don't want to get certified, specifically if you don't want to use Master IT for training to get certified, this video may not be for you, okay? So if that's not you, go ahead and click off good luck on your journey so this is the most commonly asked questions i get about the zero to it hero program so stay tuned so you know exactly what to expect when you enroll so how long does it take to finish the zero to it hero program so the program is self-paced meaning that you can go as fast or as slow as you like but most students usually finish the program in about three to four months so usually recently people have been finishing in 90 days which is three months. So be looking at about three to four months of study time to get all the certifications that's within this program. Another question I get is, is there any live training? So believe it or not, the best instructor this side of the Mississippi, your favorite instructor, me, yours truly, actually is adding live training to the Zero to Hero program. Yep, you heard me right. Once a week, one time a week, we'll meet together as a family. Everybody's in the program and we'll go over the exams, the certification every week, we'll pick a different certification to talk about and to kind of give you that edge when you go inside of the exam room. And just because I want you guys to win, it's had no additional cost. Now, most times when programs add additional features, add extra stuff, they add to the price tag. I decided that this year and moving forward, I want you guys to win and pretty much there's no way for you to lose if you have self-paced training that you can rock out whenever you want to and you have live training, right? You got the source, but if you got any questions, any comments, any concerns, I got you. So when you enroll, when do you actually start? Right now. So go ahead and cut this video off, click enroll, and you will start right now. There is no grace period, there is no 24 hour hold, there is no process. As soon as you are enrolled, as soon as you are deemed applicable, fill out the application, we accept you, you will be able to start training right now. Like literally, after you enroll, you have complete access to everything that's in the Zero to Hero program. So how long do you have access to the program? So the program is self-paced, right? But you have one year, you have one year to complete everything that is in the program. Why? Because it shouldn't take you more than a year, especially when students are getting finished in three to four months. Also, with these exams updating all the time and all this different type of stuff, we want to make sure that you are in the proper window. So one year, you got an entire year, which is more than enough time, double, triple the amount of time that you actually need to get certified and finish the program. But to make the stuff real clear, you get one year access. Now, the program includes a myriad of different certifications. A question that I get a lot of times is, can I go in any order I want to? You're an adult, you can do whatever you want to. But what we found is that we've created a certification success roadmap. And if you follow that roadmap or students that follow that roadmap are a lot more successful. So can you go in any order? Yes. Do we recommend that you go in any order? No. If you follow that roadmap, you'll be successful. So what if you're rocking out in a self-paced course and you have a question? Is there anybody that you can ask? Yes. There's always somebody there. So in every lecture, in every program, in every course, you can actually leave a comment or a question. And within 24 hours, somebody will respond to that question. 
Don't want to wait 24 hours? No big deal. We have a community chat. We have a group of students just like you. I'm in a group chat. And also it's everybody in the Master IT team in that group chat. So if it's not me that grabs the question and answers it, it's going to be one of the team members or maybe even one of your fellow students. So you'll always have somebody there to answer any questions. That Say you that have. you enroll in the course isn't what you want it to be. It's not what you expected. That usually is not going to happen. I'm almost guaranteeing that's not what's going to happen, but let's say that it does. We have a 14 day money back guarantee. So if you enroll into the program and you say, Hey, I'm not feeling within the first two weeks, we will refund you. No questions asked, right? So within the first two weeks, I don't like it. We'll give you your money back. We'll wish you well. Another question I get all the time is, is it free? We also provide bonus courses. So the core of the program is going to be CompTIA certifications, the ITF plus the A plus the net plus and the security plus some of the most popular certifications in the industry. But to kind of sweeten the deal a little bit, we actually added Microsoft training. So you'll get Microsoft training for networking, Microsoft training for security and Microsoft training for operating systems. Why do we choose Microsoft as additional bonus training? Because as of right now today, Microsoft operating systems are the number one operating systems in the world. We also introduced something called exam insurance. Now, sometimes when we take the exams, we're nervous. We got into a fight with our spouse. We got a flat tire on the way to the exam center and we're just not in the right frame of mind when we're taking the exam and we end up failing the exam. That's why we introduce exam insurance. If you purchase exam insurance, we'll give you one additional retake for each exam. So to give you peace of mind, when you go in the exam room and things don't go the right way, don't worry about it. Just go take it again. Since we want to make sure that this is accessible to everybody, we have flexible payment options. So if the total cost of the course is too much for you, you can actually have a payment plan, a flexible payment plan that will allow you to stretch out the payments throughout the duration of the actual program. So again, this video should answer any question that you have. I got one question for you. When are you enrolling? If you want to enroll, just go to itmatchkey.com, click the three little dashes on the top right corner if you're on your mobile. If not, then the options will be displayed on the top bar. All you have to do is click apply to the Zero to IT Hero program. You will answer a few questions. And if you qualify, then you'll actually get a chance to hop on the phone with me and I'll go through what the next steps are, everything in the program, and just to see if the program is really for you. Because if the program isn't for you, I'd rather you not enroll and I'll actually guide you in a different direction for a program or some people that can help you better than we can. I just want you to win. And even if I can't assist you, I'll help you and guide you to somebody that can. So other than that, I'll see you in class.
Hey gang, it's Ron from ITMaskin.com, and my job is to help each and every one of you guys get certified. So do me a favor, please, if you're just not coming in here, drop a one in the chat so I can make sure that you can hear me, that you can see me. Drop a one in the chat and let me know where you're checking in from, just to make sure I'm not wasting my damn time, just to make sure that um, you guys can hear me and that you can see me. So we're going to go over just a few things um, today. and it's some pertinent information and hopefully, you know, the internet connection stays the way it needs to stay because um, it's stunning and lightning here. And I'm just hoping that, you know, uh, the damn internet stays on. So, like I said, just do me a favor, uh, drop a one in the chat so I know you guys can hear and see me. Uh, and then let me know where you're checking in from. So, while you guys do that, um, <clears throat> First things first, I hope you had a great weekend. Hope that things uh, went the way you wanted them to, so on and so forth. Let me make sure, because ain't nobody saying that. Let me make sure that y'all can actually, I'm not damn muted. Let me see. Oop. Okay, I'm on. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. And like I said, if you could, uh, drop in the comments. Uh, if you can hear me, if you can see me. All right, so. Um, first thing I wanted to talk about was something that China is doing, right? China is doing something super interesting. They're doing something that um, is something that may need to happen in the U.S. as well, right? So what they're doing is, is okay, bet. All right, so people finally, it's popping up. Maybe slow on my end. So you can hear me, you can see me. So I have confidence that I can start now. So China is doing something that may be something that needs to be implemented here as well. So we're in the social media age, we're in an age to where as long as you got a camera, as long as you got an internet connection, you can hop on social media, you can hop on YouTube, you can hop on anywhere and pretty much say anything. Doesn't matter your credentials, doesn't matter if you're lying, <laughs> doesn't matter if you're scamming, so on and so forth, right? So that's kind of uh, one of the, the bad things about social media nowadays is that Literally, anybody can get on social media and say anything. And, you know, unfortunately, some people may fall for what they're saying. So China is actually implementing something where you kind of have to verify that you know what the hell you're talking about before you can actually talk about it. So I'm going to just share this um, article with you guys and then we can break it down. And once again, uh, if you're coming in, like the video, share with anybody who can benefit from it and just let me know where you're checking in from all right so you guys should be able to see this so it says chinese influencers must now have a qualification to talk about certain topics like law and medicine so nowadays like i said somebody can literally get on the internet they can talk about finance they can talk about law they can talk about medicine you don't know if they got a degree. You don't know what qualifications they have. Now, China is implementing this, and they're actually, um, I actually read another article where they're thinking about making it even broader. So like I said, finance, um, crypto, all these different types of, well, maybe not crypto, because they, they never really fill in crypto, but finance uh, for sure. But they're making sure that people that live stream, right, people that are influencers, that they're actually influencing people the right way. So let's read a little bit into this a little bit more. So online influencers in China must now have a qualification to talk about highly professional topics such as law, medicine, regulators said on Tuesday. There has been a push from China for greater control over areas such as basing, saying and influence society, including video games, live streaming and celebrity culture. Now, China, as we already know, um, is somewhat, I guess, of a dictatorship and pretty much whatever the hell they tell you to do, that's what you're going to do. Whatever type of time they're on, that's what you're going to be on, right? So this is kind of, unfortunately, another part of that. But I think, you know, one small piece we could take uh, from them would be that it would be nice if uh, people on social media, uh, live streams, YouTube or so on and so forth, that you could actually ensure that they knew what they were talking about, right? That they at least had some kind of background, that they did this before, that they had other people do this before. So uh, China is kind of trying to actually enforce that now. 
Um, it says the latest rules from the two Chinese government agencies lays out a code of conduct for online influencers. And that's another thing about influencers, right? Or just having influence. So many people want followers. So many people want likes. So many people want this stuff. But what are you actually influencing people to do? What do you want all these followers for? Like you following them to go where, right? So online influencers in China must now have a qualification to talk about certain topics like law and medicine. For content that requires a higher professional level, live streamers must hold a corresponding qualification to talk about those subjects. Wow. China's State Administration of Radio and Television and Ministry of Culture and Tourism said in a joint release. So just like anything, this is kind of like a double-edged sword, right? So it's got good parts. And they got bad parts, right? So the good part is supposedly these people will be qualified. Supposedly these people will be knowing what they're talking about. But the bad thing is if there is any dis disinformation, if there is any things that aren't right, they're going to be the only people talking about it, right? So there won't be any other voice, right? There won't be any contradiction. There won't be any criticism. There won't be anything. So pretty much they're going to have somebody on there. This is the facts. So you either rock with it or you don't now like i said a small portion of this would be nice here just to make sure that you know nobody's giving out disinformation whether it's crypto whether it's certifications whether it's tech whether it's finance whether of a ppp that's one of the things that um a lot of people got messed up on now a lot of people knew what the hell they was doing but i think a lot of people actually got screwed with the ppp because there were a bunch of youtubers a bunch of finance people, a bunch of influencers that were telling people, hey, man, just sign up. Don't worry about it. Just say you got 10 employees. They'll give you 10 bands. And a lot of people are now, you know, in jail doing federal time um, for that. So this is one of the cool things, like I said, that I was looking at, that they're actually making sure that now when they say qualifications, I'm not sure if they mean like a, a certification or if you need a degree. It says influencers must show those qualifications in the live streaming platform they use. Those qualifications then need to be reform, be reviewed by the platform. So I'm guessing it's um, you got to have some kind of credentials, whether it's a certification or a degree, whatever the hell you're talking about, you got to be able to prove to that platform that you know what the hell you're talking about. It says live streamers are not allowed to publish content that weakens or distorts the leadership of the Chinese. So that's one of the bad things, right? So say you're talking about law and medicine and it actually makes the chinese government look bad or they're not feeling it that shit is not going to work for them right so you gotta understand they got a completely different government but i think like i said the small little thing that um we could take from this that i think will be pretty good is um you know actually verifying people know what they're talking about what does this say influencers are also not allowed to use something called deep fake technology so if you don't know what a deep fake is right so deep fake technology is somewhat like um, filters, right? It's filters pretty much on steroids. So a deep fake, the purpose of it is for the video or the imagery to look so real that you can't tell that it's fake. So you got President Biden in a deep fake video. Um, it looks like he's saying something that he's not. Or you may have um, the leader of... Um, the Communist Party in China have them saying something that looks like they're not, so on and so forth, or even on a smaller scale, right? You're trying to get a business loan or you're trying to take out a mortgage. You can create a video, get on Zoom with a deep fake video, and it actually look like that person, right? So that technology uh, is a little scary. Um, uh, basically, like I said, just like for a long time, uh, people were using this filter that would make you look like an old, super old person, right? So that would kind of be um, like a deep fake just on a smaller version. But the more intricate, the more um, advanced deep fake technology is a lot more advanced. And it literally look like me. I'm rocking. I'm doing whatever I'm doing. I'm saying whatever I'm saying. But it's not actually me in the video. OK. All right. Next thing we're going to talk about is AR. Right. So augmented reality. Augmented reality. Apple is trying to make a play for augmented reality, right? They're trying to figure out how can we be the leader in this space? How can we be the leader when it comes to augmented reality? Now, you guys are super smart, but just in case you're not, 
Um, augmented reality, simply put, is augmenting your reality, right? So you put on a headset and it actually put images, roller coasters, rocket launchers, cars, whatever you want inside your reality, right? So if you had augmented reality glasses on right now, you would see me in my office, but you would see an octopus or something behind me, right? So it literally just augments your current reality. Now, Apple right now is in a race. I guess you can call it a race with Microsoft and Facebook, right? So it's Apple, Facebook, and Microsoft, or excuse me, Apple, Meta, and Face. Apple, Meta, and Microsoft are all in a race trying to figure out these headsets, right? Because we're not that far advanced to where we can figure this out without a headset. So Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, um, thinks that he has a way to figure that out for them to be pretty much when you think of augmented reality, when you think about that type of stuff that you would think about Apple. So I'm not sure if you guys remember, but uh, one of the biggest uh, tech giants, Google, Google tried this some years ago. Google tried to figure out augmented reality um, and from the mockups, from the different uh, videos that I saw years ago, it looked really cool. For some reason, Google ended up scrapping that idea. And instead of having a big ass headset, it pretty much was glasses just like this. But you would have all your information in there, right? So it'd be a small little window on the glass. You would see your GPS, you would see your text messages, you would see your augmented reality if you wanted stuff to be there. But for some reason, uh, Google scrapped that idea. Now, when it comes to Apple, Tim Cook gives the clearest hint yet that Apple's building a headset. So like I said, Microsoft um, is already doing this and Meta is already doing this. So like I um, told you guys in the last live stream, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, he said that he's pretty much hedging this entire company on the metaverse. And one of the biggest things that has to happen for the metaverse to work is for them to come up with a great headset that people will actually wear, right? So Tim Cook, Apple CEO, recently gave the closest thing to a confirmation that Apple's building a headset. I couldn't be more excited about the opportunities we've seen in the space and sort of stay tuned and you'll see what we have to offer. So that's one of the complaints about Apple for a lot of people uh, that they haven't been as innovative as they used to be. Right. They haven't really came out with anything technically new. They made updates to the iPhone, the iPad, so on and so forth, but it's something brand new, something groundbreaking like the iPod or the iPad or something like that. They haven't really brought anything new to the space. So this is one of the things that they're hoping to pretty much crush, right? So Tim Cook says that Apple CEO Tim Cook recently gave the closest... Uh, uh, Cook was asked in a recent interview with China Daily USA, what he thinks the key factors are for augmented reality or AR to succeed in the consumer market. I'm incredibly excited about AR, as you might know, and the critical thing to any technology including AR is putting humanity at the center of it. He said, echoing comments he's made in the past about how important AR is to the company. So you have to kind of look at what the movers and shakers are doing to kind of see Where's the future? Like me and you may be like, ah, I don't give a damn about virtual reality. I don't give a damn about augmented reality. But obviously all these huge companies do. They may know something that me and you don't, or they know something that we do know, that people want a more immersive experience, right? Uh, people want to be more engaged, right? They want to pretty much create their own reality. And I think another thing that kind of, you know, lit a fire into people, was the um, the lockdown, right? So when they were on the lockdown, or when we were on the lockdown, uh, we kind of thought that we was always going to always be in the house. We was going to have to figure out things and do things virtually. Although that is not the case anymore, and hopefully, hopefully it never happens again. These companies are still looking towards um, virtual reality and augmented reality. And like I said, one of the biggest things, one of the biggest key factors for that to work is a headset, right? Because you got to think about how cumbersome it is to every time you want to get into the metaverse, every time you want to do something, you have to put on this big ass headset. And I think that's one of the things they're trying to figure out it has to be comfortable. 
Um, the experience has to be user friendly. So basically anybody should be able to put on the headset. OK, I understand what's going on, so on and so forth. And also uh, one of the things that they're looking at is they have to make it safe. Right. Because people are used to you know having this headset on. They may forget they got the headset on, lose their balance, hit the head up against the wall, so on and so forth. So there's so many different things. It's the tech. So not only do you have to make sure that you got a great product, a physical product, you also got to make sure that the software is cool and you got to make sure that the Internet, the space, the users, everybody is ready for this change. Now, I think this is going to come uh, sooner than later, but um, that's actually what Tim Cook is uh, cooking up, trying to figure out how to beat um, Mark Zuckerberg and uh Microsoft when it comes to who is the number one leader when it comes to um, these headsets. OK, now, another thing that I wanted to talk to you guys about was uh, Bitcoin. Right. So uh, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not no crypto advisor. Do I have Bitcoin? Of course. Do I have crypto? Of course. Um, should you have crypto? I don't know, uh, but I have it. Right. But one thing I will say is with Bitcoin, as far as you investing, you know, money and thinking that you about to get a hundred thousand return on your investment, that's probably over with. Right. Um, now, according to a bunch of experts in the space, Bitcoin probably is going to continue to dip. It's going to continue to go down. Now, one of the reasons why I'm an investor in crypto is because the underlying technology, right? The underlying technology of Bitcoin and every other uh, digital currency is the blockchain. Now, the blockchain is an amazing technology, right? So if you do invest, that's cool on you. Go talk to your financial advisor. But just know that Bitcoin isn't going to just disappear. Ethereum isn't just going to disappear. All this stuff isn't just going to go away. It's going to be here to stay. But like I said, if you think you're about to invest $5 and make $500,000, probably not going to happen. But if you invest a little bit and you're able to stay around for the long term, you'll probably be okay. So according to a crypto expert, dip, uh, Dipcoin, well, shit, that is a, a good damn word, I guess. But uh, Bitcoin is probably going to uh continue to dip so right now it's around twenty thousand uh twenty thousand or maybe nineteen thousand from a high of i think at the tippity top one bitcoin was six sixty some thousand right now if i'm talking to, uh, above you guys heads backstory real quick cryptocurrency is just a decentralized currency right so just like you got dollars you got coins this is just a digital version of that, right? So you and I can exchange this digital currency for other currencies, for items, for services. It's just another way to uh, monetize things. It's another way to buy things. It's another way to store value in something. Now, most people don't use it that way, to be honest. Right now, most people don't use Bitcoin, Ethereum, or any other cryptocurrency as a currency. They, move, they use it more as... Um, a place to store value, a place to store cash, a place to invest, to hopefully make more money, right? So hopefully um, I explain it in a way to make you understand. So cryptocurrency, just another uh, currency uh, as opposed to pesos, dollars, rubles, whatever, euros, whatever you use, wherever you're watching this from, right? Now, according to this, they think it's going to dip even further, 13,000, right? Going to go all the way down to 13,000 or lower. So Ian Hernett, co-founder of Absolute Strategy Research, said past crypto rallies show Bitcoin tends to fall roughly 80 percent from all time highs. Such a drop in 2022 would likely drag the world's biggest token down to thirteen thousand dollars. The crypto world is on edge as investors grapple or grapple with the impact of higher interest rates and liquidity issues at major industry players. So. Why are we talking about this? Right. This is not an investment channel, but this is a technology channel. And that's one of the things that I kind of want you guys to be aware of. Bitcoin, once again, like I said, the technology that Bitcoin, Ethereum, 
and all these other um, altcoins and other cryptocurrencies that are built on is built on the blockchain. If you think that cryptocurrency is just going to disappear, just going to go away, it's probably not. Some of the biggest financial firms in the world are actually investing into the blockchain. And another thing, some of the most smart engineers from the biggest schools in the world, what are they trying to do? They're trying to figure out some way to work on the blockchain because the majority of people that are investing in Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, currencies, they're trying to get rich. The people that are there for the long term kind of understand the utility of the blockchain, understand the utility of these different cryptocurrencies. And those are the people that are going to be around for some time. All right, gang. So we've been rocking out for a while. If you haven't liked this video, shame on you. Uh, make sure you share it uh, with anybody who can benefit. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you have yet to do so. So um, quick quiz, super quick quiz. Um, in the comments, tell me what technology is Bitcoin built on? If you get this wrong, unsubscribe. What technology is Bitcoin built on? Real simple. What technology is Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, Dogecoin, any coin uh, when it comes to cryptocurrency? What technology is that built on? As y'all are filling that out, let me go through some of these comments. All right. So we got Fresno, California. Hey, Miss Kelly or Miss Bailey. How are you? Um, we got uh victoria in the house how are you we got uh rob lyons uh bitcoin going to zero or 100k hell if i know uh you probably know better than i do um but like i said if you got money to invest invest it if you don't have money to invest i, I wouldn't i wouldn't do it man all right so uh calisthenics arts Advanced blockchains used in regular web usage. True, 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 true. Good, good, good. All right. So pretty much everybody got it right. Uh, block change, almost. Block chain. You probably just was typing too fast. No big deal. All right. So next thing, right? In the comments, tell me what is the biggest difference? What's the main difference between AR and VR? What's the difference? What's the difference between AR and VR? What's the difference? Got Tech G in here. Uh, blockchain is absolutely correct. Hey, gang, if you are not subscribed to a Tech G's channel, you got a bunch of different uh, certification um, videos, stuff like that. Um, here's another one that uh, he gives away stuff for absolutely free, uh, no charge uh, against my advice. <laughs> but, you know, that he does what he wants to. But he's a great YouTuber that you might want to uh, check in with. Um, but like I said, everybody got blockchain correct. Good, 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 good. But like I said, the next thing is what's the main difference between AR and VR? Somebody tell me in the comments and then we can keep on rocking out. Then we got Kendrick Williams checking in from Misao. I want to say that is in Germany. Good, good, good. Uh, Tech G once again, AR puts simulated images into the real world. VR puts you into the VR world. Too easy. Good, good, good. Let's see what calisthenic arts said. Uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. I assume like metaverse use of VR. Uh, sure, uh, but pretty much uh, I think we lead, need to lean more towards what Tech G was saying. I think you were kind of saying the same thing, but augmented reality augments your reality. VR puts you in a virtual reality. All right, so uh, we've been rocking off about 30 minutes and um, I think the, the limit is about 10 minutes on uh, cussing for YouTube live. Uh, so I'm probably gonna start cussing pretty soon. And then if you have, um, haven't been hugged recently, if you haven't been told that, hey man, I'm proud of you uh, recently, if you are sensitive, you know, put on your earmuffs or turn off the live right now. So what we wanna talk about right now, right now is that you need to make some more money, man. It's, it's, it's just that simple. You gotta make some more money. Um, I got a video dropping tomorrow, I wanna say. And before inflation, 50K was not enough. Now, 
50K, damn sure ain't enough. Now that I'm about to be a proud papa pretty soon, I decided to do a little bit of research, right? How much does it cost really to raise a kid, right? How much does that cost? So I found this little article that states that, and this is from four years ago, uh, before I share it, let me see. It's from 2015. So <laughs> I don't tell how much it costs now, but let me share this article with you guys right quick. If you only making 50K, it costs a quarter million, a quarter million dollars, right? 250 from 2015. So it probably costs, I don't know, 300 grand now. It costs $250,000 to raise a damn kid, man. So you have to, you have to figure out a way to make some more money. You have to figure it out. I, I don't know. I don't know how that could be an argument. I don't know how that could be. I mean, goddamn, it costs $250,000 to raise a kid. Now, supposedly, supposedly, the average is $50,000 a year. I don't even think that's true. Um, so for the Zero to Hero program, right, there is a application process because we got a couple different tiers as far as training is concerned. And I will say we got over, it ain't even ended a month yet, and we already got over 200 applications, right? And I want to tell you this, I would say about 70 to 75 percent of the people. Right. And even not, not even on the applications, even on the YouTube channel and the community tab. I've been kind of putting a lot of polls trying to get as much data as possible. I'm going to say the average person probably make 30 to 40, if that. And this isn't people that are single. This isn't people that um or by themselves this is people that got a whole damn family trying to survive off of 40k now like i said if this hurts your feelings i mean whatever man you got to get some more money uh and one of the ways that you can get more money we'll get into that later on but you have to figure out some kind of way man some kind of way to get um some more money because like i said from the coaching calls that i have from these applications that we receive from people that i talk to the average person don't make 50k right and you got to think about it let's say that the average person does make 50k that means that if you make them below 50k they mean you're below average right um and then with let's say even if you are making 50k great i'm proud of you fantastic with inflation that 50k is gonna feel like 30k anyway right so um let's look at um what this says and then like i said this is from 2015 so you know with inflation they don't tell how much um it costs now and of course this is talking about until 18 right this isn't talking about every year and then like that but they're talking about from the time they come out the womb till the time that they um graduate supposedly cost two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. all right so uh, oh they got it atomized okay great all right boom 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 it says according to the u.s department of agriculture middle income american parents can expect to spend a total of two hundred and forty five thousand dollars to raise a child who was born in 2013 or 2013 because like i said this is old data here we break down the number to seven major expense categories so let's see what they say seven percent or number seven is six percent on clothing because you got to think you know kids grow you got to keep on buying stuff as they get bigger health care you got to make sure that the kiddos is healthy uh miscellaneous toys video games this kind of random stuff transportation on or getting them from where they need to get to damn it says uh shuffling your kids to soccer matches recitals flying them around flying them away that's probably not going to be a lot of y'all a lot of y'all you know probably ain't gonna be flying them nowhere especially if you're making less than fifty thousand. Uh, the amounts uh, to almost $35,000. Food is going to be a big one. You already know that. That's about 16%. Education. Let's see what they say. Education and child care. So this is a big one. Um, I think education and child care is 18%. So um, child care is one thing that um, I'm going to have to start dealing with pretty soon. And that's one of the reasons why I decided to tell my wife, ain't no point of you working anymore. Right? Um, because if you guys don't know, I'm about to have twins. So I'm about to have, I'm going to have double this. I guess it's going to cost me 500000 to raise my kids. Um, pretty much said, hey, it doesn't make sense for you to go to work. It costs thousands of dollars per kid to 
um, send them to daycare. And also, I don't want, you know, a bunch of strange people dealing with my damn kids. So you have to figure out how to make more money, man. Let's see what let's see what the next thing is. And I don't even think this is I don't even think this is uh, talking about like college. Uh, yep, we're not talking about college tuition here. Just primary and secondary education costs plus any child care expenses. The expense category will take the second biggest bite. Now, housing is the number one. Of course, you got to have somewhere to stay. Uh, you got a mortgage. Uh, you got rent. So that's going to take um, the most amount of money. And then, like I said, um, I did a poll um, and most people just aren't making that much money, man. And the scary thing is inflation is going up like crazy, but wages aren't. Wages aren't, especially if you're in any kind of job that's repetitive. If you're in any kind of job that literally anybody can do, it's pretty much a wrap. It's pretty much over with. Um, so I would highly recommend, you know, if you don't want to make more money um, for yourself, you need to at least do it for your family. And the good thing is, you know, in IT and tech, you can kind of write your own check. If you got the right skill set, got the right network and actually are working, right? If you're actually putting in the work, actually doing what you need to do, you should be OK. Um, unfortunately, for the average American, for the average person, a child is not a blessing. It's a burden, right? People can't feed their damn selves. So how are they going to feed their kids? So if you can hear my voice, I just want to tell you that you need to figure out how to make some more money, man. Um, Making 50 grand is just, and this isn't to hurt your feelings or nothing like that. It just ain't no fucking money. It's not, it's no money. It's no money. It's no money. Trust me. Another thing, like I um, told you guys in the last, last stream, another part of it is keeping the damn money. Because I know I got buddies that's making 100, 150, 200,000, and they broke as hell too, right? So not only do you have to make more money, you got to figure out a way to keep a lot of your money. Uh, you ain't got to flex. You ain't got a damn, uh, you know, Every time you get a raise, you're giving that, you're getting a new car, get some new clothes. Just keep on getting money, 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 taking out instead of uh, investing it back into um, yourself. Let me actually uh, take a break, go through some of these comments. Always, please like this video and uh, share with anybody who can help. All right. So duh, 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 duh. let me scroll up a little bit. Uh, here we go. All right. So, well, PowerShell says, get off your ass and get to work. Agreed, agreed, agreed. Uh, Kendrick says, he think it costs about $450,000 per kid. Great. PowerShell says, again, 20 k a year in child care. That's a lot of money, man, especially if you're only making 50000 That means that you got, you're making 50000 pre-tax, and then you got to spend 20 k of it. It's on child care. That's a lot, man. Uh, Calisthenic Arts uh, says work alone is not a solution when your paycheck is not breaking even. If your job is not paying enough, probably need to up the skills. You got to figure out something, man. So in today's age, you have to keep on progressing. You have to keep on figuring out another way and some more avenues to get to some revenue. Um, because the whole thing is inflation is going like this, and wages are either staying stagnant or they're or they're going down, right? So you just got to make sure a way to figure that up. Uh, you and Dewan Lightfoot is all I listen to. That's my man too. Uh, so if you guys aren't subscribed to uh his thing is called Lab Every Day. No, his his YouTube channel is called Dewan Lightfoot. So you guys go over there and uh, subscribe to that. So Rob Lyons says that's not bad. About twelve k per year. That is horrible if you're only making fifty grand. If you're only making fifty grand, that's that's a lot of damn money. That's a lot of damn money if uh if you're only making fifty grand. And like I said, most of these people are making less than that. So that's a big chunk. All right. Trapped up times two. Kids are forever. Right. Kids are forever. And another thing is, you just want to make sure that this is what I think. Right. The way I grew up, right, if my kids are going through the same hardships, the same struggles that I had to deal with, then I'm a failure, right? If they still got to struggle. They got to figure out, you know, paycheck to paycheck, can't get this, can't get that, you know, may have some of my needs, none of my wants. Basically, if it's not progression, right, if I don't do better than my parents did and then my kids don't do better than I did, then something is wrong, right? Something is going seriously, seriously wrong. All right. So as always, what I found 
the people in my life, in my circle, people that I mentor, the people that um, I see that are really winning, have a certain level of education and have a certain level of discipline and hard work. Now, when I say education, that doesn't mean a degree, nothing like that. This means that they're always trying to learn, always trying to figure stuff out, right? Um, like I said, for me, for example, I'm always trying to read, always listening to audiobooks, always listening to podcasts, always doing things that's going to allow me to level up. That's another thing is just make sure that whatever you put inside your brain, whatever the hell you're digesting every day, is something that's going to help you be more productive as opposed to just entertain, right? That's another thing I think is a problem. Um, people are looking to be entertained. Um, I was on the phone um what was that yesterday? Whatever the hell day. No, it wasn't yesterday. It must have been Friday. Um, with a guy, he was 47, right? 47. He worked as a elevator technician, right? Elevator technician, they make really good money, which I wasn't aware of. They make really good money. Um, he was making over a hundred thousand dollars a year, but he was working like 70 hours a week, right? 70 hours a week. And he the first thing he said was, Man, you know, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to uh into your program because it, you know, it seemed like it was a little bit more. Uh, what the hell he say? Basically, he wasn't dry. Like he was dry, man. You know, I need just a little bit of entertainment. I just had to tell him like, it's about the information, right? Now, my program, I do try and make it spice it up a little bit, but it's more about the information because it's cool if you get into a program and it's laughing, you laughing, and it's jokes and it's fun, but you don't learn shit. No point, right? So I think it's another thing is look at the information, right? Absorb the information, get the information. Uh, don't worry about being entertained, right? Um, and then I told him, like, you're almost 50 years old, man. Like, you talking about entertainment. I don't know how much more time you got. That's another thing about me is um, the time factor, right? You have to be real cognizant of your time. That's one of the reasons why, like I said, after I get done with uh, by September, you know, I'm booked out to September for coaching calls. After that, I'm cutting that shit off because I don't have time. I don't have time to be on the phone with people that are... Uh, I don't know. People are just, I don't know. <laughs> they just want somebody to tell them that everything going to be okay, everything going to be fine, and it's not. It's not. Um, and then another thing is, like I said, you know, uh, I can just be doing more productive activities as opposed to um, being one-on-one. -on -one. That's one of the things, you know, I could be reaching a bunch of people instead of just being on the phone with, um, with one person. So I think one of the ways that you can do that, um, like I said, is through education. Another thing is Stop being a fucking spectator, right? A lot of people are spectators to their own lives. So they just sit on the sidelines and whatever happens to them, happens to them. That's not a good idea, man. That's not a good idea. So um, the Most High gave you free will. He gave you, or he, it gave you the power to become whatever you want to become, right? And just to go back to some young people that are watching this, Let's say that you're 18 right now, right? 18, 19, 20, and you're kind of a piece of shit. You're lazy. You ain't got no ambition. You ain't got no work ethic. I got great news for you. Where you are right now has nothing to do with where you're going to end up. At 18, I would be unrecognizable. Like, if I could see myself now when I was 18, I would, I would not. I'd be like, ain't no way in hell that's me, right? You just got to make a mental shift, right, and stop acting like life is just going to happen for you. You got to figure it out, man. You got to figure it out. And then um, another thing uh, I can't wait to call cap um, on a lot of people that's, oh, I got kids. Uh, I got blood because I'm about to have kids, a business. And I'm actually about to start another business. Uh, but that's uh, neither here nor there. And a family. Right. So all these people, that's the one thing I couldn't say. Like, I don't know. Maybe maybe that is too much. But I'm about to have all this stuff and all of this stuff is going to keep on clicking. All of it. I don't use no excuses. I still work out, still read, still learn, still hang out with my fucking family, still hang out with, you know, my kids when they get here. Now, is it going to be easy? Of course not. It's going to be extremely difficult. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. But you got to do what you got to do, right? You have to do what you got to do to to get to where you want to get to. Um, and like I said, wherever you are right now, it don't have nothing to do with where you can be. I promise you, 90 days, man, 90 days of really getting it in or change your whole life. And then another thing is, let's say that you're winning right now. You think you're winning or you're doing pretty good. Always challenge yourself. Always have something else to do. Because right now I'm doing something called, uh, one of my guys introduced me to it. It's called, uh, 
it sounds weird as hell, but it's called 75 hard, right? So you do 75 days and, you know, you sacrifice some stuff. So me, I was drinking energy drinks a lot. So I sacrifice, so no energy drinks uh, for 75 days, work out twice a day, meditate once a day and read every day, right? So, uh, and it's one other thing that I can't damn remember right now, but I just think that you need to definitely start focusing in and sacrifice on a few things, just get focused on what you need to get focused on. And like I said, stop just going through life aimlessly. You can do this, you can figure it out, just gotta plan it out. Everything, everything that's live, everything that I do is planned out. Now, um, you know, the most high has a sense of humor too. You know, you may throw a couple options in there, whatever, but whatever I can control, I control it, right? Um, and another thing is, especially because most and mostly guys watch this channel um is how you feel does not matter that shit don't matter man you don't feel like doing it <laughs> that's why you're not gonna do it you don't feel like doing it come on man you gotta figure out a way to no matter how you feel no matter what's going on you can still do it for your family do it for your mama do it for somebody you know because that's another thing you gotta do things that are bigger than you right so I have uh, I teach a class every Monday for, you know, all the students in the zero zero program. Right. I'm responsible to these people. Right. These people have paid me. These people have invested in themselves and people. These people believe in me that I can get them to where they want to get to. So I have to show up for these people. Right. You got to do stuff for bigger for, uh, for something that's bigger than you. Right. I have employees. Ah, who would have thought I got employees. So I got to get up. I got to go to work. I got to I got people. I got a family. Not just the people that are in my close family, but I got, you know, I got other family that has been dependent on me, too, because uh, I'm the damn unicorn, I guess. The only damn person that decided to do anything with their life. That's not true, but shit, that's what it feels like sometimes. But you got to be responsible. Like I said, if you can't find a will to, to make it happen for yourself, make it, you know, make it happen for uh, for your family. Um, so there's pretty much uh two big reasons that you know people aren't winning like i said lack of discipline feeling sorry for themselves and then in today's culture there's always an echo chamber there's always a room there's always a place that you can go to where other people are on the same sorry shit if you like oh kids are too much i don't want to raise my kids you can find a tribe that's on the same type of time if you say oh man i don't want to work i just want to stay at home i just want to get a check uh, it'd be other people like, yeah, man, that's unfair, man. The government should help us, blah, blah, blah. You have to, um, even me, right? If you don't uh, agree with what I got to say, agree with what I got going on, cool. Go find somebody else that is on the same type of time as you. But like I said, you have to focus on yourself, on your goals, what you got to do. And like I said, just try and make sure that everybody that's in your circle aligns with the same type of time. Um, another thing is, you need to work on your emotional intelligence, right? And learn how to master your emotions, especially if you're gonna be doing anything that is in the public eye, right? If you're doing anything that is going to be um, criticized, right? Somebody might be on this uh, live stream like, oh man, blah, 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 I got something to say. I might post videos, they might have something to say. I may be on Instagram, they may have something to say. But you have to fortify your mind, right? You have to know that's another thing, you know, that you have to know who you are, know what you are, know what you ain't, know what you're gonna go for, know what you're not gonna go for. And one of the best books or one of the, the best things that I've done that's helped me uh, with this is something called mastering your emotions, right? So I never had self-esteem issues, I never had confidence issues, but I did have a little bit of a temper, right? <laughs> did have uh, anger issues, I guess you could say, right? And a lot of times that's wasted energy, right? That's wasted energy. Instead of being angry, a lot of times you're like, ah, whatever. Um, if somebody, let's say that you do, do have a, a, a live platform or a public platform, you have to understand you've already won. They're on your shit. They're coming on your page. They're watching a video that they didn't have to watch, right? So it's just like, ah, whatever, and just keep on moving. But then even at your job, your coworkers piss you off. Your boss piss you off. Master your emotions. Take a couple deep breaths, and then you'll be good. But last but not least, gang, last but not least is you have to understand that 
nobody cares. Yep, sorry to tell you, nobody cares. Nobody, 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 nobody. Nobody cares about how you grew up. Nobody cares about your hardships right now. Nobody cares about anything. Winners win, just like this live, right? Some of you guys might have saw the, the notification. I said I was going to be here at 3.30. If I'd have been like, oh, man, blah, blah, happened. And I do this over and over and over again. I keep on canceling. And eventually, y'all not going to give a damn. It's going to be like, oh, we don't care that your mama got sick. We don't care that your dog died. It, none of that matters. You have to figure out a way to win. And like I said, if you're solely progressing every day, salute to you. But if you're literally just waiting and waiting and waiting, I'm telling you, man, you're going to be 60 before you know it. So you got to figure out a way to win right now. So I'll go back through these comments. Then I'll probably let you guys uh, go say the world. Unless y'all got something else for me. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Do, 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 do. Kendrick, thank you very much for the compliment. Rob, same to you. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you once again. Uh, 19, watching you now. Made that mental switch at... 17. Luke, man, keep it going. Keep it going, man. I'm telling you, if you are, I promise you, grown ass men, grown with kids that are my age, I counsel these guys, mentor these guys, coach these guys, and they have some of the same problems or same uh, mental blocks that you may have had or that you still might have at the, at the young age that you are, right? But the whole thing is you have to um, do what you got to do, man. You have to um, continue to move forward, right? Um, but another thing is, Luke, I'll tell you this, though. Go hard, but don't go too hard, right? Still enjoy yourself. Still do, you know, still live your life a little bit because you got a long time for the grind, right? The grind never stops. The grind never stops. Um, I don't want you to get down just, oh, I don't want to talk to girls. Oh, I don't want to go to a party. Oh, no, there's time for that, right? Um, but also focus on your goals. But like I said, live life too, because I promise you, man, you the grind is a shit. I don't, I'm going to be, I'm one of them guys that are probably never going to retire, right? And not because I'm going to be broke. It's because I always need a project. I always need something to go on. I don't want to retire for what? And wait to die? No thanks. Um, but like I said, uh, Luke, a good job on um, locking in. You know, hopefully you find um a mentor you know i wish you could have got him uh um, on my mentor list or mentee list but that's a wrap for right now um are you saying it's too late at 50. uh it's never too late you're not dead but you need to hurry the hell up uh miss miss ak you gotta hurry the hell up man um you gotta think about luke in here is 17 right? Or 19, however, 19. He in here at 19, making that mental shift, trying to figure out things, trying to really get it going. So you got to definitely, you know, go ahead and uh, make that change. But it's definitely not too late, man. Definitely. Let me stop sharing this shit. I think it's the last one. It's definitely not too late. Never too late. Never, ever, ever. I have people in their 60s that join the program and they do good. They do really good. Um, like I said, that's another thing is when we're talking about the beginning, the Chinese government wants influencers to know what the hell they're talking about and be verified, right? And have credentials. That's what I would like as well. Cause you got to understand you're talking to somebody that's actually living it, actually doing it. Talk to literally hundreds, maybe I don't want to say thousands, but at least hundreds of people a month, every month I'm talking to hundreds of people. Right. I mean, if it's not me, it's one of my uh, student success coaches and we see kind of the trends. We kind of see what's going on. And what we found is this millennials, they can pivot. Oh, this is what we own? Great. This is what we own? Great. This is what we own? Great. They can move, right? Move and shake and do something different. But a lot of times their work ethic isn't there. The damn older people are completely different. So people in Gen Z, no, Gen Z is the Generation X and above, they have a terrible time pivoting. They have worked their ass off, but they don't want to pivot. They still under that. I'm going to work here for 30 years and retired that's over with man that's probably over with right so um uh, miss uh, ak you good to go i believe in you believe in yourself and just do what you got to do and you'll be good uh amber wilson says hey dude hello uh 
I'll check it uh later, I guess. Because I got some of my team in here, but I don't know where the hell they at. But anyway, um Amber seems to agree with me. Great, great, great. Uh I am not uh doing pen test plus, um, but I'm pretty sure you can find um some stuff that'll work for you. Uh, Rob said he knocked out uh, CCNA last year. Great, 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 great. Um, so Miss AK says, um, I passed ITF plus. Great, great, great job, man. Great, good, good, good. Keep it going. Like I said, just keep on doing what you need to do. Um, just need to kind of be on an expedited, um, expedited timeline, right? And just make goals for yourself. I'm 50. By 52, I'm going to have this done. By 55, I'm going to have this done. No bullshit. I know exactly what I'll have accomplished by the time I'm 50, right? Um, come hella high water, um, I'm going to at least be super close. Because um, a lot of the goals that I had for myself when I turned 40, I didn't I didn't shoot high enough. A lot of them I already, I already accomplished. So I would say keep on rocking out and, um, and you'll be good. And don't doubt yourself. Um, if I doubted myself, I wouldn't have a company. I wouldn't have a degree. I wouldn't have all these certifications. I wouldn't have no students. And a lot of confidence, right? The confidence comes from competence and wins. That's another thing. If you try stuff, you're going to fail. But those wins always outweigh the damn failures. You know, I failed a bunch of times too, but um, the wins always uh, outweigh the failures, right? Um, so um, actually, uh, talking about winners and failures, this it's not going to drop this Friday, but I got... Um, a student interview. I'm actually going to start uh, interviewing my students. And um, I got a guy that just passed A plus, net plus, and security plus. Um, they went through the Zero to Hero program. And I'm um, going to start interviewing them just so you can see for, you know, yourself that it's possible to do this, right? It's possible to um, go ahead and get into IT and pass these uh, certifications. So as always, um, if you're looking to get certified, it's down there, or is it? Uh, head over to um, itmagicy.com and enroll into the Zero to Hero program. Um, well, not enroll, apply. Uh, apply to the program. If you get accepted, then um, we can go ahead and start you on your journey. But just to uh, preface things, most likely you will not get accepted, um, but you can go ahead and still apply. Um, we're probably rejecting eight out of ten people right we just want to make sure that we get um people that are best suited for the program and that can actually get stuff done right like i said um the person that you're looking at on camera this is who i am uh don't accept any excuses for myself and i'm not going to accept any excuses from you guys so if you're in the program great if you're not um you can apply like i said if you get rejected don't uh take that as this isn't for you uh just keep on uh, rocking out uh, doing what you need to do on your own. All right, so I'm going to uh, read the rest of these comments. Then I'm probably going to go ahead and tap out. All right, so Luke Reed, I passed A-plus from watching your videos two weeks ago. So, uh, bam, you got people passing um, the certification right there. Luke is only 19. Uh, great job, uh, Luke. Uh, let's see what CBN Tech Talk says. Shout, shout to you, Master T. You're doing great work in this space for sure. I already know, but thank you for the confirmation. Uh, Miss AK, thank you. You and a few others inspire me to go for it. You help with less fluff. Great. So that is literally all I got for you, gang. I would love to hang out with you um, a little bit more, but um, I got to keep on rocking out. Um, so uh, let me see if we got some more. Uh, shout out to Erica. Thank you so much for the super chat. Um, great job teaching folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's another um, great person to follow. Erica Williams. She's um, an absolute beast when it comes to this. She's actually an inspiration uh, for me when it comes to work ethic. Right. So that's one of the things that you guys got to work on, man, is your work ethic. Right. Um, and like I said, not using anything as an excuse. Now, when my children get here, uh, like I said, I'm probably going to call a cap on a lot of people. A lot of people are like, man, I can't figure out how to do it, man. I got to get them, uh, got to work out, got to, well, y'all ain't working out. Got to um, go to work, come home with my family. Oh, I do have something to talk about. And sometimes people get mad at me about this, but oh well. 
hey man, if you are grown, right? If you're in your 30s, 40s, got a spouse, got kids, you shouldn't be playing video games as much as a lot of you guys do. And I keep on thinking about different coaching clients. So I got another coaching client. He's, I think, almost 40. He works, you know, a regular job, works 40, 50 hours a week, got a wife, got kids. I think he had three kids. And the, the main reason he was calling me was um, I think he was he wanted to make he wanted to make more money. What was he doing? I want to say he was in construction, if I'm mistaken. But anyway, so we on the phone and, you know, I'm trying to give him advice, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, OK, what do you do in your spare time? He was like, well, you know, I play um, Call of Duty. Yeah, he's like, yeah, I play Call of Duty. I'm like, okay, how often do you play that? Like, how many hours do you think? Man, this man told me that. <laughs> this man is like, okay, let me check right quick. Because I guess I don't know if you can see the stats or whatever when you play the game. And it said that he was, he was on average playing 37 hours a week. Come on, man. How the hell are you playing a video game as much as you actually going to, going to work, right? And not even, you know, we're talking about tech. We're talking about getting certified. We're talking about all this type of stuff. But what about time for your family? Hello? What about time for your family? That's another thing um, that um, I would like to talk to you guys about. Um, if you are in a relationship, if you are married, if you have a significant other, you need to make sure that y'all on the same type of time. You have to make sure that y'all on the same wavelength, right? Because if you're a man, if you were a woman, she should be inspiring you, motivating you, because anything you do is going to benefit y'all. Anything she does is going to benefit y'all as well. That's what I was saying. Having, you know, conversations like that. Like I said, my wife has an entire career, got a degree, did all this other stuff. But since, um, we're on the same type of sign on the same wavelength. I just told her, I was like, hey, cutie pie, you probably should quit. It don't, it don't make sense for you to keep on working. She, yeah, you're right. You know, it makes sense. You got to, that's another thing is it don't matter if you're married, don't matter if you're boyfriend, girlfriend, make sure that you align with somebody that just ain't combative, always want to argue, always want to be the man or the woman of the house, always want to be in charge. Just make sure that you're with somebody that's um, doing what they need to do. But like I said, we need free time. We need I'm a way to decompress and stuff like that. But we also need to have a different type of work ethic, right? Um, before, uh, before, what can I say? Before, um, damn, he just threw me off. Man, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Anton. So Ant is another great guy. Um, he has the Black Heights channel. Actually, you probably heard me talking about him. On the last live, this is a great guy making great money. Obviously, he just gave me a hundred dollars. Uh, but he is a great guy, great YouTuber. And I'm not just saying that because of the super chat. Um, and I'm always looking out for uh, the community. Now, I don't do the one on ones, but this guy does. So this guy getting to the bag, doing what he got to do, and he will get you to where you need to get to. Um, he has a coaching program and also has a, um, a Discord community, Patreon, blah, blah. Subscribe to his channel and do um, what he just did uh, and get $100. No, but um, what the hell was I talking about? Thank you so much, Ant. Uh, he threw me the hell off. Anyway, do what you got to do uh, to, get what, to get what you got to get. And another thing is, like I said, do it for something that's bigger than you. Um, you got wonderful people in this community like that. Um, you got a network. You got to be able to uh, branch out a little bit. But another thing, though, in life and YouTube in general, always, always um, lean on your uniqueness, right? The way that I say something isn't a way that Ant would say it. The way that Ant says something isn't a way that a textual chatter would say it. The way that textual chatter says something isn't a way that uh, Professor Black, uh, Professor Black Ops will say it the way that he says it, and the way that Kev Tech Help Desk will say it. Right? You got to always kind of leverage your uniqueness. And another thing is, don't look at this as competition. Whether it's a job, whether it's in life, none of these guys are me, and I'm none of these guys. And they're not trying to. We're not trying to be each other, right? Because, like I said, you always want to leverage um, your uniqueness, right? Um, now, the sad thing is. Most of you guys on here are watching it live or watching replay. You're not going to do anything. That's the whole thing. 
my if, if this shit didn't have if, if, if y'all got what y'all needed to get and y'all tapped out and went and executed i would be happier than just staying around because the whole thing is even me i was noticing that that for a minute i was watching youtube for educational purposes but i wasn't executing remember education without execution equals entertainment you're just being entertained you just want to feel good oh i'm watching some smart stuff uh, blah 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 but are you really doing what you need to do then like i said gang time is going by super fast and you got to get what you got to get let me go through um a few more of these uh a few more of these comments this is another great guy uh before the billions uh, make sure that you um go ahead and tap in with him um he's another guy in the tech space uh, working in the trenches that can you know help you get to where you uh, need to get to he's an expert him and Ant are a way better at um, this live stuff uh, than I am. I don't really go as live as much as I should, I guess. Um, but um, I'm gonna do it weekly. But shit, you know, these guys kind of do it all, almost every day or every other day. Uh, let me see. Uh, what's good with you? Okay, yep. So the uh, CBN knows him. Good, good. good. Da, 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 da. Okay, Juke Joint says, "Oh, that's everywhere, fam." Uh, uh, I don't know what uh, he's talking about, but I'm pretty sure he's just agreeing with whatever I said. Um, and then we got CBN, a uh, Tech Talks. Um, he's been in the field for over 20, 20 years, right? So um, one thing that I used to say, um, this wasn't on the docket, wasn't on the agenda. One thing I used to say is, man, it ain't that many people, ain't that many people that look like me in tech, right? That's what I used to think. And I still hear a lot of people say that. I don't think it's true, man. On this damn live stream alone, it's five, six people that are working in tech right now. A lot of times it's what you're looking at and what you're looking for. Because you got to remember YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, all this stuff is made by some of the smartest people in the world. So they're going to show you what you're looking for. If you like some fuck shit, they're going to show you all the fuck shit. If you like black people in tech, they're going to show you black people in tech. If you like people in tech in general, it's going to show you people in tech in general. So I would just say make sure that you're following um, people that are actually aligned with what you're trying to do. Right. Um, like I said, for me, I a little bit I'm, I'm not going to say pass, but for me, um, you know, I kind of go a little bit deeper than YouTube um, as far as training goes, as far as coaching goes. And that's another thing. If you do have a coach, if you do have a mentor, if you're looking for one. The first question you should ask this person is, do you have a coach? Do you have a mentor? Right. Your coach needs to have a coach. Michael Jordan had a damn coach. He had a shooting coach. He had a, a strength and conditioning coach. I'm um, not Phil Jackson, but I'm just talking about just coaches in general. I can't remember the guy's name, but he had um, one coach. Um, he got a couple books. What the hell is this dude's name? But I know it's his strength and conditioning coach, uh, Michael Jordan's, because um, he used to be kind of frail, kind of kind of small. And then he once he got with him, he bulked up and got a little bit stronger. But. If you're looking for anything, um, like I said, you can rock out with me through the Zero to Hero program. You can go through in other mentorship programs, but you got to have somebody that is further along in the race than you that can help you. I didn't have any shit when I was when I was trying to figure this stuff out, right? I didn't have no mentorship. I didn't have wasn't no you. I mean, I guess it was YouTube, but I wasn't watching it. I didn't know nothing about it. Um, but now you have the advantage of um, with your cell phone, you can connect with anybody. Anybody, right? Uh, Erica Williams, which is uh, was on here. I, well, guess how I met her? YouTube. Guess how I met Ant? YouTube. Guess how I met Before the Billions? YouTube. Every damn body that's on YouTube that I talked to, I met them on YouTube, right? And one of the ways that I did that, for one, I would hope that they could see the work ethic. I can well, hope that they can see the sincerity, you know, in me. But also providing value first. Man, you need anything? Anything I can do for you? Uh, I do this, I do that. Maybe we can do this. You know, just trying to figure out what can I do for that person first, and then you know, by the law of recipro uh, reciprocity, it's gonna come back to you uh, ten times, right? Ten times over. Um, let me uh, scroll up and get to some more comments. Now, if you guys are uh, just coming into the show, this is kind of like extra credit. I kind of already went over the whole shebang and bang. So, if you wanted to uh, look at the agenda, I talked about those things. I'm not just on here uh, running my damn mouth. I'm just trying to uh, show you guys some extra love. Engineering Cannabis, good day. Caught this live. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, thanks for the support. Um, 
call him Master IT because he is a real deal and very positive. So um, thank you so much for the compliment. Um, as far as being positive, right? I guess I am. <laughs> I guess I am. Uh, but to be honest, I just try and tell people, you know, what it is and just try and be as transparent as possible, right? Just pretty much want to give uh, people things the way that I want them to give it to me. And if you're full of shit, you're full of shit. If you're not, you're not. You know, just pretty much just telling people exactly what they need to know. Uh, to go through a couple more compliments or uh, not compliments, but uh, comments, and then I'm going to get up out of our kids. We deep in tech, but quiet. So, right, right. So a lot of times, um, I think that is true. I think that there's a lot of people in tech, right? Uh, you know, people of color and uh, tech, whether it's black, brown, whatever. But I just think that we are a little bit more quiet. And also, I think that our inner circles a lot of times aren't um, don't look like us. Because I can't say that when I was, you know, really working in tech, really in the trenches, a lot of times, a lot of places I was the only one, the only guy. And then if it was some other um, tech people there, we may not have, um, you know, jailed or whatever. Because I'm the type of guy... Like I work and that's it. I'm not really trying to be, you know, if we cool, we cool. But I'm not really trying to like, you know, if I got to be with and work with you all damn day, I probably don't want to hang out with you. Right. Uh, it happens every now and again, but not so much. Uh, there's nothing wrong with being transparent, but being real is needed. People don't know we need more black folks in tech. We just need more people in, in tech in general, I think, man. Uh, and a lot of I think a lot of things is or a lot of times the purveying thing is that it's just you got to be smart you got to be from a certain background you got to be from a certain place and that's just not true that's just not true um i didn't have a computer in my house until i was shit i don't know i know i was in high school i didn't have a computer until i was like 16 or 17 right i didn't grow up loving this i didn't grow up uh just a we as kids you know barely graduated high school like literally once you find something once you find your niche that's pretty much how i am now i wasn't like that I wasn't like, I'm not like Luke, just, you know, it's a, um, just a bad guy to hold with his whole life. I'm just, you know, I just maybe in early twenties is when I kind of, okay, I need to get my shit together. Um, and the whole thing is now, you know, once I get in the lane, I just go as fast as I can, you know, as hard as I can, um, with no breaks. Right. All right. So Miss AK back again. Thank y'all. Anybody that's uh, tapped in today. Thank you so much for, um, the support, but like I said, I'm gonna try and keep my word and do this uh, every week, <laughs> every week, even when these kids go, uh, just to um, tap in with you guys, just to check your temperatures. Uh, Miss AK, yes, you are positive, but you pull no punches, play no games. Yes, ma'am. It would be great feel for black women too. Remote was great, man. I'm gonna tell y'all this. So my best students are women. Uh, women just have, um, and that's the funny thing. Uh, every it's kind of diverse with everybody else, but as far as women, almost all my students are black women. Uh, oh, did that come out right? Everybody else is diverse, but as far as women go, almost all of them are, are black women. Uh, but just women in general, uh, I like to work with them uh, more than I like to work with guys. I like them as students more than I like guys, and I don't know weird shit, but just in general. Just seem like to me they execute a lot more. They just execute is like, oh, that's what we're doing. Well, I guess if they if they feel like you're not full of shit, they'll execute, right? They'll kind of like, okay, I guess you know what you're talking about, and they'll do it. Guys are kind of like, I don't know, man. It's got analysis, paralysis by analysis, or I want to compete, or I, I'm not really sure what it is. Now I've led men and been cool with guys and work with guys, and guys want to work with me, but my preference would be whether to work with with women. But there's some bad guys out there too. It's just got to be. The no excuses thing. That's my biggest thing. Um, as a man, like you don't really have no, you shouldn't have no excuses. If you're not winning, and then if you do, at least be accountable for them. Why are you not winning? I'm lazy as hell. Oh, okay. Why are you not winning? I just I just don't want it that bad. Okay, just be honest with yourself. Don't say the government, don't say racism, don't say you you grew up messed up, because all of us, <laughs> all of us had to deal with that, right? Um, and then me, you know, not getting I'm not about to get you know super personal, but my shit wasn't sweet either. Nobody's is. So you just got to figure out a way to win, man. Okay. Amber says, women rule the world. Uh-oh. Uh, I agree as well. I do have a channel plus co-host, a podcast, 
with a coworker of mine from past projects talking about tech. Awesome. So uh, if y'all want to tap in, or not if y'all want to, go uh, tap in with CBN's uh, Tech Talks. Um, and I'll subscribe as well. Uh, CBN Tech Talks. If I don't subscribe, I apologize. I just forgot. Just tap in with me. Either hit me on Instagram or something. Like, hey, man, remember. And I'll make sure I subscribe. Um, all right. Uh, this is true. You can't ignore that there is a bias in the tech industry. Even I have come across that companies would rather have others than you and IT. But regardless of anything, we innovate for sure, for sure, for sure. Uh, there are a lot of great remote tech jobs out there for now until companies make those changes. That is true. Uh, I think I'm gonna end on this note. Remote is still an option, right? Remote is definitely still an option, but it seems that uh, a lot of companies are kind of moving back towards y'all got to bring your ass in office. Y'all got to bring your ass in office, um, as opposed to remote jobs. Now, if you got the right skill sets, if you do what you need to do, if you kind of show your um, skills, they'll kind of let you kind of do whatever you want to. So this is what I've noticed when I was working with other people and I was working in general. I always, right, always, 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 always annotated and wrote down what I did, right? Because believe it or not, your boss don't know what the hell you're doing. Unless you fuck up, your boss does not know what you're doing. They don't know that you saved the company X, Y, Z. They don't know that, you know, this department heavily depends on you. They don't know that you're the only person that this employee are listening to, right? So as far as monetary is usually the first thing. If you can't figure out anything monetarily that you... um Provide it to the company. Just figure out other ways, right? That you can um, figure stuff out. Because I was the one that I was going to ask for a raise, right? And once I got that no, that would be an indication for me. I got to get I got to get up out of here, right? But without having that brief for the person, like, hey, I just want to let you know, in the last ninety days, I did boom, 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 boom. Damn, you did, yeah. And I just show it all to them, right? Or you just got to make sure that um, you can back that stuff up. Now, like I said, remote jobs are great. And most a lot of jobs will set you still will still let you uh, work remote, but for some reason there's a change in culture where a lot of those big companies want you to come back into the office. Uh, uh, I think I don't know. I don't know if Elon sometimes just be saying shit just to say shit, just so everybody is like, I don't know. But he was saying basically it's, that's about to be a wrap at Tesla. If you're working on he said something like if you're working remote, you need to pretend like you work somewhere else or something like that. So you just got to be careful. And another thing is. This isn't like you work on an assembly line. This ain't like you're working in a warehouse. If you do get fired, laid off, you can get another gig in tech. As, as long as as long as you one of them guys and them girls that's about your business, you'll be fine. You'll be good. Go through some more comments. Okay, uh, this is true. The real estate for businesses to have individuals back in the office is starting to become a huge demand. People are loving flexibility and wanting to work from home so that's true um but just to i need to write that down because that's actually i think that's gonna be a topic for um another one of these lives the only bad thing sometimes about remote work now i'm not saying this is all companies because the people that work uh for me or work with me i'd rather say as long as you do what the hell i need you to do i don't really give a damn um, cause one of the guys that worked for me, he's in uh, California, California. No, he's in San Francisco. Same shit. He's in San Francisco. Um, and he was like, Hey, do you want me to, um, install this, um, monitor, right? Where I can literally log into his screen, see what he's doing, make sure that he typing. And I said, hell no. He's like, well, he's like, you don't, you know, they usually want me to have this monitor. I'm like, no, if I say do one, two, three, you do one, two, three job's done you know i'm a, a realist when it comes to this shit nobody if you if you work at a job for eight hours nobody's gonna work for those whole eight hours man come on um so mines are more like task related do these four tasks today and because i know how long this shit take somewhat and i just know it like a day is more than enough time right so i think that's a better way to do it that's only one of the bad things is that some of the remote jobs especially if it's six figures and up they're gonna be on your ass as far as Hey, what you doing? Hey, you okay? I know that it's say that you're supposed to work nine to five. I know it's six thirty, but we just need you to hop on this thing right quick. Da da da. And then, you know, that's what they're gonna be saying is. Now, I'm not saying all companies, just some companies, just kind of you know giving you guys uh, a different perspective. 
Um, they may be like, well, if you don't like it, just come back. You can work nine to five if you come into the office, right? And another thing I've seen with bigger companies is starting to snatch shit away. Cool. You want to work from home? Great. No health insurance. Huh? Cool. You want to work from home? Then we don't pay for this. We don't pay for that. Now, like I said, the good thing is, just like with anything else, if you are a beast, can get a job anywhere, they're going to do whatever you tell them to. But if you kind of somewhere in the middle, then that can kind of be, um, can kind of get a little foggy. Uh, let me see. Facts on documenting your work helps for raises and when job hunting uh, to talk about projects. Right. Right. So if they say past performance, you can say, man, shit, at this company, I did one, two, three, X, Y, Z. Because you even got because you got to think about it. a lot of times you don't even know what you did. If you don't, if you're not annotating, like, damn, I did do that. Oh, man, I did do that. Right. Uh, so you just got to make sure that um, when it comes to races, like I said, that's the first thing your boss going to say is. So what did you do? Why, why should we give you a raise? And another thing is. Um, no matter where you're working at, even if you're not in tech, even if you um, are doing something else, don't ever let them compare you to somebody else. Because, you know, that's, you know, happened to me. And I always came at them like that ain't got shit to do with me. Right. Well, Gene is making X, Y, C. Why, why should you make uh, make the uh, make more? Y'all do the same thing. No, the hell we don't. And then that's when you break it down. Boom, boom, boom. This is what's going on. Luke is back. Let's see what he got to say. Uh, do, do, do. Any advice for my situation? Worked as a cabling technician for my current company from 17 till now. And I have my ITF plus and A plus certs, but they have refused my proposal to moving to help this. Hmm. No, nah, I really don't. What I would do is ask them why. I'm pretty sure they'll they'll be able to tell you. Um, and if that answer is not sufficient to your liking, or you like that's just some bullshit, you gotta move on, right? Um, the thing is a lot of companies don't expect you to progress, right? A lot of a lot of companies or people in general. They'll put you in a box and you have to stay there. Luke is the cable guy. What the hell are you talking about? He want to be on uh, help desk. So it's not going to work. No, no, no. We, we're not about to do that. Not saying that that's your situation, but just in general, a lot of times what happens, you are what you are. People won't let you become something else. Um, Because uh, cause just like me, right? So I was, I was doing heating and cooling, right? Doing whatever I was doing. The friends that I had then, that's still what I am now. When I was in the military, I was a sergeant. Oh, I'm in charge of a bunch of people, blah, blah, blah. The people that I was in the military with, I'm still that guy. When I was working at these vocational schools and these colleges, project managers, all, this other, all these other little jobs that I had, I'm that same person. Now that anybody met me since I've been in Master IT, that's the person I am. But unfortunately, like I said, depending on where somebody met you at, that may be where they're always trying to keep you at, unfortunately. Uh... Uh, CNBC said, uh, live, live in New York City, Brooklyn. Many companies trying to bring people back to the office. You must be from there. You know what? I actually, you know what? I just was looking at my analytics. What did Judd tell me? Either Judd or Christina, um, one of them told me that my analytics, that's one of my biggest markets as far as um, people to watch my videos. So shout out to um, New York, uh, Brooklyn, uh, especially. One thing is, I've never been to New York. But um, I'm trying to figure out as far as what I found is that people that live in New York, or excuse me, people that's from New York, they die hard, live in New York, want to stay in New York, no matter what the cost of living is. My thing or just my question to you is just like, how is the cost of living and what do you think about that? And have you ever thought about uh, living somewhere else? Because um, like I said, to New Yorkers, New York is the greatest place in the world. And maybe it is. I, I've never been, but I was just wondering, how does that how does that work? Because same thing with California, just the cost of living is, is kind of crazy, man. All right. So Luke or Winslow. Oh, this is uh, his advice to Luke. Uh, Luke, if you know networking AWS, networking cert, most people don't really understand how networking works in AWS, especially hybrid or migration projects. I would say in general, you can go uh, with Amazon Web Services, um, but just networking in general, that's another thing, gang. Uh, Wins Winslow uh, brought that up. Um, you're on this channel, right? So there's people on here commenting, oh, everybody must be trying to get into tech. Everybody must be smart as hell. Everybody must be trying to get some certifications. Nope. You are in the majority. I promise you. I mean, shit, the minority. Uh, I promise you, most people are not trying to level up. I promise you, right? 
Um, I don't know how many subs I have, to be honest, but I bet you I would have a hundred thousand, maybe a million. If I was on here just cracking jokes and doing pranks and shit, I would have a bunch of followers. A bunch, I don't even care about that, but I'm just saying a bunch of followers, a bunch of subs, so on and so forth, because most people just want to be entertained. Most people are not trying to figure out. And another thing is, um, if anybody's watching this, if you failed an exam before, failed um, anything, that happens, man. This shit is not easy. It's not easy, right? That's one of the things that I always tell my students is um, failure is kind of part of the process. Um, but if you're not failing, you're not trying, right? If you want to meet somebody that's super happy, well, they not might be happy, but it's just, oh, I don't never fail. I don't never, because they're not trying shit. They're doing the same thing over and over and over again, right? Um, and you got to fail uh, to learn, you know, your, your weaknesses and your strengths. Uh, the biggest issue for New York City right now is the commute, since the MTA needs to be more secure for people to go to and from home and work and back with little to no issues. That's another thing you got to worry about, the subway, crime, all the other stuff. But um, like I said, people that are from New York love New York. And the people from New York love this channel, so I love whoever loved me, so shout out to New York. Uh, hard to keep employees in check when they're at home. Mm. So that is true. Um, I wouldn't use that verbiage, <laughs> but it's hard to kind of see. Well, not really. Um, not not really just Ryan, to, to, to be honest. Uh, like I said, I think instead of companies worrying about, is this motherfucker typing? You know, oh, it's been three minutes before he, before he was, uh, since he was typing. They need to just look at the task. Hey, this is how long these six tasks should take. This is what you're going to do for the day. Don't worry about the hourly or none of that. That's what it worked for on um, the people that I work with. So I delegate the task to them. I need you to do this, this, and that. And that's what they do. Now, if they get finished, now, one thing I will say is the only drawback to that, which is understandable, if I give somebody some uh, some tasks and they finish them, they're not about to tap in with me. They're not about to be like, oh, they're going to rob anything else. You know, they're just going to go ahead and do them. But you know, I kind of delegate stuff to kind of know, like, okay, I need these people to do this, these people to do that. All right. So Luke said, I have, I just started uh, studying for Network Plus. All right. Good, good, good. Keep going, man. LinkedIn is a great tool to use as online resume compared to physical resume. So CBN uh, is damn near my co-host today. Thank you. Um, that's a great um, idea, a great tip, because a lot of times when you go into interviews, when you do certain stuff, they're going to look at your LinkedIn, right? Your LinkedIn is to pretty much mirror your resume, because like you said, your LinkedIn is a digital resume. Now, as far as you go back, that's kind of up to you. But a lot of times what I do, um, it's been a while since I, you know, had a job, but I got a bunch of students that, you know, I help. Um, with that and got a, a few resume writers to help me with that as well is a lot of times just focus on the stuff that pertains to the job. If you're going for a network engineer job, nobody's going to give a damn that you worked at the Piggly Wiggly or worked at 7-Eleven or worked at Checkers. That don't matter, right? So just make sure that you have everything that's focused on um, what you did at that job that allow you to kind of display your uh, expertise, right? Another thing is don't be full of shit. If you didn't do something, it shouldn't be on your resume. If you can't fully explain something, it shouldn't be on your resume, right? If you said that you were like Luke, I was a cable installer, cable technician. What cables were you installing? Um, I was installing Cat5 or Fiber. And they say, what is Cat5? And you like, uh, and you can't really explain it. It's like, oh, damn, this guy is, is full of shit, right? So just don't do that just to not waste your time and not waste anybody else's time. I mean, another thing is um, you don't know how small the circles are, right? So you don't want to go to a company and just have a terrible interview, not because of nerves, not because you were just genuinely like, damn, my nerves got me, but literally you and their line, they don't know if you tell them the truth, so on and so forth. Um, you may not know who that recruiter knows. You may not know who that tech guy knows. You He may call all around like, man, if a guy named Rob come in there, tall, light-skinned, got glasses, don't hire him. He's he's a fraud, right? Um, 
And another thing is, even though I'm a proponent for certifications, right? A proponent for certification, that's how I won. That's how my students are winning. Don't just be getting certifications just to get them, right? Um, not to name names, because this person is wonderful, a great person, I, I guess. But it's literally somebody on LinkedIn that they got 50, like 50 some certifications. That's crazy. That don't even make sense. Then you just got a bunch of different certifications that I don't know. How can you actually be specialized in 50 different things? Right. That's pretty much if, if I got 50 certifications, just in my mind, maybe this person is way smarter than I am. All I was doing was taking tests. I ain't who the hell, you know, got that had 50 different jobs. Right. Anyway, like I said. Um, that's why a lot of students in my program, they get A plus, net plus, and security plus. And then we got a higher tier program that has some hacking and some penetration stuff in it. But you got to get this shit first. You got to get this stuff first. And you got to work in the field for at least a year or two. Them three pieces of paper should be what you need to get into tech and to keep on rocking out. And then once you get that experience, then you can go ahead and go to the other stuff. Just getting these pieces of paper is great, but you got to have a hand on experience as well. Say rents in uh, New York City is getting uh, too high these days now. I bet, I bet, I bet. Tony B, how are you? Thank you so much. Thanks for the inspiration. My bad, Joe. All right, so uh, just Ryan, I can't live in New York. I can't lie. New York is super fun to visit, but the cost to live is too high. So I'm glad that we talking about that. So we got inflation. Uh, we got all this different stuff. Just give me one second. Just let me make sure. Okay. Just have to make sure that my sugar booger didn't need nothing. All right. So uh, what were we talking about? Oh, inflation, right? So inflation and cost of living, all this other stuff. Don't move. Let me see. Okay, don't move from Texas to New York. Don't move from Texas to New York. Don't move from Texas to New York for a job opportunity because you have to look at the cost of living. Once again, uh, New York is awesome. Uh, Texas is awesome. But let's say like you're making 60 grand in Texas. Okay, great. And then you get a, a job offer in New York for 90 or 100,000. You winning, right? No. 60,000 in Texas is pretty much equivalent to like 90 grand in um, New York. And another thing is you have to look at the different ways of life. Uh, Texas, uh, more homes, more, um, a little bit more openness. Uh, New York, more apartments, uh, more crowded, a little bit more closed in. Now, depending on if you like moving and shaking like the city, bam. And then, like I said, New York um, is, is absolutely awesome, but you have to actually look at, okay, what is more beneficial, right? Just like somebody in New York may be like, hell no, I'm not about to go to Texas for 60 grand, but um, they may not know that it's pretty much, you're pretty much going to be making the same amount of money and you probably can get more house, more everything here. But um, if you are where you're from and you like where you're at, you may have to make just a few sacrifices, okay? Uh, same with Georgia regarding rent. Rent is uh, going up everywhere, right? Uh, but the thing is, it's uh, a lot different. Trust me, Georgia rent ain't got nothing on uh, New York rent, I'm pretty sure. Uh, if New York didn't cost so much, I would move in a heartbeat. Also, I don't know if you recognize, but I'm in your course and I'm loving it. Man, this email Judd going for the A+. I knew your damn name looked familiar. So, just so you guys know that I'm not a fraud, damn near every time I have a live, I have a couple students in here so uh, uh one of my students is your name justin just say yes or no uh i think your name is Justin. i think that's justin they enrolled in the program um and he's about to go take um his a plus all right good luck as long as you did what you needed to do then you'll be good okay you'll do you, you'll be good the kevin samuels of it uh oh i hope not well i don't know he was a, that's another thing um gang so perception is everything um so whether you like them, you didn't like them. Perception is everything. The the bad stuff, the crazy stuff, it seemed like that's what always got a blur. That's what always got um, kind of uh, popularized, right? 
But a lot of times he was just as hard on guys as he was on girls. And then to me, you got to kind of look at the caliber of people. Somebody that's calling a stranger for relationship advice that they never met, they kind of tell you, you know, where they at. So um, that was kind of strange. All right. So Tony B, what does she say? Or he can't, you got, you got to forgive him. My glasses are dirty. I can't. This is a girl. Okay. I'm not sure if this was mentioned previously. Do you recommend taking any IT entry level position while studying to certify? All right. So um, all this is just advice, right? None of this shit is law. None of this stuff is you have to do. None of this stuff is um, law, like I said, right? I would, I always tell people this, depending on where you're at and your life, so on and so forth, but yeah, I would. I'm at the point in my life that I understand the value of experience. If it's the help desk, if it's an internship, if it's whatever, right? It may not be paid. It may not be $100,000 a year, which is every which everybody thinks they're going to get after them uh, watching two YouTube videos. The education is the important part, right? So, for example, I'm at a point in my life where, praise the most high, I don't need a job. Um, I don't need to do certain things. But even me, if it's something I want to learn, I'll shadow somebody, I'll intern, I'll pay them. Hello. I'll pay them to you know get their expertise. So uh, that's kind of like you got to look at that as a paid internship. Go ahead and get entry level job, rock out, kind of get to see the nuances. But one thing I will say, if you're getting a job just to get it, no bueno. While you're up there, you need to be networking. You need to be rubbing elbows with people. OK, my main goal is to be on the cyber team. Right. Well, go talk to them guys or go talk to them girls. I want to be a network engineer. Go in the network closet, see what they got going on. Don't touch anything, but just go in there and see what they got going on. Right. And another thing is have zero expectations. None of these people may want to talk to you. None of these people may not help you. But a lot of times you be, you can be able to just see what to do or not to do just by observing, just to see, OK, I see how you did this. OK, I don't like that. I don't like this. Right. Um, even this, right? Just me. Uh, you can take um, the things that you like about what I do and implement them in what you do. And the shit that you don't like, then, you know, just don't do those things. It's just like me. Um, I try to focus on the message more than I focus on the messenger, right? Uh, he must study for search 17 hours a day. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Just, but I'm just saying it's wonderful. It's great. Education is always a good thing, but I'm just saying don't get caught in that loop. Like I said, the Zero to Hero program could have, I was, I was one point I was thinking about adding some more search, but I was like, okay, they get these three, right? They should be good to go. And then they can start getting the experience, right? But like having 20, 30, 40, I don't fucking even, I only got like 12 or 13 search, right? Um, so I, I, which is any, anything more than that, it just kind of like, I don't know. And it looks weird to me as an employer. If I'm if you got 50 certs, I'm like when was you working? Where did you work at? Why did you get all these certs? But it is what it is, man. Keep on messing up. Uh, CBN Tech Talk and CBN, we not we weren't being rough on New York. It just kind of got caught in the loop a little bit. I would I would be clear here if you if you I would be clear here if you get certifications with no work experience becomes a waste of money okay um winslow uh search plus projects if not in the field yet you should have five to ten projects to fill out um and an hour interview also age don't matter i was 38 when i landed a junior devops role good job man i will agree on that now of course um there is ageism i guess but the skills is going to always override that. Uh, for example, a lot of times I, um, I uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I experience ageism, but in the reverse. Because a lot of times when I'm working with people, whether it's coaching, mentoring, people getting in the program, people are either the same age as me or older than me, right? And it's kind of like, because uh, you know, older people might be like, oh, I don't know if this guy, but once they find out I know what the hell I'm talking about, it does not matter. Your age, your race, all that shit go out the window. If somebody know that you can get that you can get them to where they need to get to, they don't really care about none of that. For example, one of my mentors, one of my business coaches, 
is 20, how old is he? Like 26, 27, right? Younger than me. So it's just like, I don't give a damn how old he is. No, oh, you, you young, you too young. You, shit, do you know what you're talking about? That's all, that's all that really matters right at the end of the day. Okay, Earl says, no matter what you do, don't move to California. Jacobs, okay, 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 okay. I do remember, I do remember. All right, so good luck on your exam, man. Let me know uh, when you pass. Hey, do you guys accept the vet tech program from the VA? I'm trying to join up. So um, I got one of my um, one of my guys working on that now. Uh, time is kind of a luxury that unfortunately I don't really have. There's been a bunch of people asking me about vet tech, some other program, just all different types of programs. So we're kind of in a process of trying to uh, figure out how to accept that so you guys can um, go ahead and use your benefits for um, training. Just uh, stay on top. Not stay on top of me, that shit. Excuse me. Just uh stay up. Just if you <laughs> if you catch a live, just um, you know, just just remind me about it. Um, but we've been working on it because there's been a bunch of people asking me about that. Uh Kevin Gamble, Kevin Samuel is the GOAT of this era. Uh engineering cannabis and IT. I have seen a lot of boot camps focus on tools, tools but less on the foundation or skill because the tools change. Hmm. Very, 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 very true. So things change so quickly, you may become an expert. That's really good, man. You may come a, become an expert on a certain software and a certain tool, and then sh the shit change, and they're either obsolete or they completely change the configuration. And literally, if you are an expert in that one tool, on that one thing, you ain't got a job no more and ain't got a skill no more. So like you said, you kind of want more of the foundational stuff so you can kind of be somewhat of a jack of all trades. So the name of this channel is Master IT, um, which is catchy, which is cool. But just to be honest, in tech, you'll never, ever reach a level of mastery. You're not going to master this shit. It changes all the time. Now, if it was consistent, if it was um, always the same, it would be too easy. That's another reason why um, people um, get inside the Zero to Zero program. And that's one of the reasons why. This program is a little bit more involved um, than other courses and other training because this shit changes and we up, we update the damn training all the time because we have to because things change. Some stuff that used to be true is now false. Some stuff that was false is now true, right? So you just got to keep on um, keeping on. And another thing is if you want to be in tech, you got to learn to love. Learn to love. You got to love to learn, right? Uh, even me, I, ain't, I, can't, I can't be an expert. I can't be a master because shit is always changing, right? I just got to be um sharp enough and skillful enough to teach it to these guys that's another thing is um this i for one i never do any training i never go into a program i never do any of these things with anybody who hasn't done what i'm trying to do right so you know i've been teaching i got all these certs and i've actually worked in the field right um i always tell this example all the time so i got my mba right so i got uh my mba and the only reason Literally, the only reason I got it, for one, legacy, nobody in my family ever did it. Two, the military paid for it. If I had to pay for it myself, I wouldn't even have a bachelor's because I haven't used my bachelor's or my master's, to be honest. It's just pieces of paper that look cool for me. I'm not saying that that's true for you. That is um, for me. So um, I don't know why the hell I said that, but let's go to the next thing. <laughs> I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. Uh, needed this info. Working outside is getting unbearable. Man. Marlon, if you in Texas, you better get your shit together because literally it felt like the sun was walking down the street. It was it's, it's been crazy hot. And I don't know what you do, but that was one of the reasons that I actually um, had to you know pivot and do from what I was doing years ago. I used to do heating and cooling in uh, Virginia. Right. So in Virginia, super hot, super humid in a fucking attic that was 140, 130 degrees. It's no bueno. If you work outside, it can definitely be. It can be rough, man. All right, uh, Jacobs, when you do pass, just go ahead and give us a nod. Um, and then, like I said, once you pass the second part, uh, we'll do an interview with you on the channel because uh, uh, one of the other students that finished the whole shebang bang uh, I'm about to interview him. You can be the next one. Uh, I've been talking to a few people out of tech. Any plans to open up affiliates again? So the affiliate program, um, 
maybe maybe not i may open a open a, uh, up the affiliate program again um we just got so many damn affiliates that i'm just trying to figure out compensation and just the thing that to make you win but for you though um remind me as well uh, uh come back to me we're gonna start doing a referral program for students though i think that would be um a little bit more better for for you and for the program all right so uh just let me know but right now focus on the damn um exam and go past that exam and make it mama proud um marlon's in mississippi damn all right so shout out to you man shout out to you um at least you know you're doing what you got to do you, you got a job so you got to be grateful for that but um yeah hopefully you can um do something where you um in ac just a little bit <clears throat> joshua how often did you study throughout the day when preparing for the exam? Let's say if you had to take the test in the next four weeks, that's up to you, man. Uh, that's completely up to you. Um, don't matter how long I study. It's about um, you, how long you study, how you absorb information, so on and so forth. Uh, MC Drama Bear, <laughs> working on AWS certification. Great, man. Good luck, good luck, good luck. Uh, Jacobs, like I said, as uh, long as you get... Um, I'm interviewing everybody got A plus and up. Um, right now, I'm just knocking out the people that um, pass the zero to hero program that got A plus, net plus, and security plus. But if you got A plus at a minimum, I'll go ahead and get you on the channel and we can talk about your journey. Last but not least, and will I be down? And I will be down to refer to one of my coworkers join your course after I told him. My man, my man. All right, gang. So um, I think I'm going to close it out. Damn, mouth getting dry, uh, arm starting to hurt. But anyway, thank you guys so much for taking time out of your day to rock out with me. I really hope that um, a few of the things I said today was beneficial for you, um, allows you to keep on doing what you need to do. Like I said, every week I'm going to go live uh, no matter what, um, try to talk about some pertinent information I think you guys need to know. Um, thank you so much. Like I said, for anybody that supported with um, super chats and that type of shit, just thank y'all so much. Um, other than that, I see you in class. Hey, gang, this is Dwayne, and these are the three things that you have to do to land your first IT job. So, first thing you want to do is figure out what field do you want to be in and what lane do you want to be in. Do you want to do networking? Do you want to do cybersecurity? And once you figure out that lane, acquire that knowledge for you to break inside that field. You want to be a developer? You probably need to start coding. You want to be a help desk lead? You need to get really good at troubleshooting. You want to be an ethical hacker? You need to get really good at hacking tools as well as policies and regulations in regards to data security. No matter the field that you want to break into, you're going to have to educate yourself. With the internet, there is a wealth of information at your fingertips. You can listen to podcasts, you can read blogs, you can watch videos such as this one on YouTube or LinkedIn, or you can even enroll in a course. Forgot to tell you, I'm Dwayne from ITMagicKey.com and I have a multitude of courses that help people just like you break into IT. Number two is networking. There's a saying that says your network equals your net worth. A lot of times it's just about the people you know. You have to have the skill set, you have to have the knowledge, but you also have to be top of mind with the people that matter. So if you are an ethical hacker, if there's an ethical hacking position, you should be top of mind. People should, you know, the hiring managers, whoever is the decision maker should say, hey, this guy or this girl, it would be a great fit for our organization, right? So networking, don't be afraid, don't be shy, um, don't be weird either, right? Uh, just connect with people and build a rapport with them, right? So if they need something, be there when they need something. If they need advice, advise them, uh, help them out, and most likely they'll help you out. And with the internet, it makes it super easy. It, you don't have to be uh, super awkward, you don't have to go to meetup events if you do that that's cool too or you go to meetups and stuff but you can connect to anybody you want to just by being on your cell phone so i would say that you can start networking right here if you want to be an ethical hacker start um connecting with people that are ethical hackers uh, matter of fact i'm gonna tag a few uh people in the it space that i think you should be following and that i think um, could help you along in your journey so those could be your first couple connections but after that start connecting with 
recruiters in, um, in your city. Start connecting with um, other IT pros in, in your city or in the city that you want to uh, be located in. Or they don't have that be in your city. Just if they seem like they're knowledgeable, if they seem like somebody that you can gain some um, insight from, I would definitely say start connecting. So pretty much, um, even if you're an introvert, even if you don't like talking, no big deal. Just connect with these people, you know, tell them your backstory. And a lot of people, especially here um, on LinkedIn and uh, and the uh, YouTube community, um, really um, will help you out. Also, um, you know, I know Facebook, you know, some people like it, some people don't. But there are a lot of really, 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 really strong communities on Facebook as well as far as IT um, is concerned. So you can go ahead and try that out as well. So go ahead and get on Facebook. Um, I actually have a Facebook group as well. I'll put the link in um, the description and you can head over there and get inside of a community of people that, you know, want to see each other win. So with networking, pretty much reach out to as many people as possible that are in the field that you want to be in and just start um, talking. And maybe, you know, through advice, through tutelage, you can, you know, figure out new positions. You can figure out uh, new skill sets and pretty much just help you along your way. You need the team. You need a team, whether you're running a business, whether if you're looking to, uh, for a job, you need a team of people around you that's going to be supportive and help you along the way. Next up is going to be making sure that your resume is optimized, making sure that it gets seen by the right people and that when it gets seen that it has eye catching things and it actually tells your entire story. Somebody should be able to look at your resume and tell if you will be a good fit for the job or not. So a lot of times the mistake that people make is just pretty much having a resume. This is my resume, no matter what it is, right? If uh, it's a plumbing job, here go a resume. If it's a if it's a damn uh, uh, job to be an astronaut, here go a resume. If it's a job to be um, a cybersecurity analyst, here go a resume. You should have a tailored resume for each position. Okay, um, I actually put another link in the description below because um, I have. A quick little trick, a quick little tip that will help you get past the resume bots. If you aren't aware, there are, you know, to increase or decrease time, I guess, um, there's scanning software that scans to see if you would be a good candidate before you even talk to a human, right? So if you don't have certain keywords and if you don't have certain phrases inside of your resume, you will never see a real person. The software says, hey, this guy or this girl isn't a good fit, so they just pretty much scrap your resume. So you can go ahead and look at that um, to figure out how to get past the resume box, right? But one of the major things is, like I said, tailoring your resume to the actual position. So make sure that you're not just, you know, got a cookie cutter resume and you're just throwing it to um, every position. Every position, you should definitely um tailor your resume you got to apply to maybe hundreds of jobs you know to really get the job that you're looking for to really get the position that you're looking for so don't get complacent oh i filled out one or two applications you know you may have to uh fill out hundreds you know thousand applications then like i said um with the quick little fix that i have um and you already got a resume and a lot of times you can just upload your resume to an application it kind of may sound like a lot, but you can easily, easily, especially if you ain't got no damn job, you can easily do a hundred. I mean, that is going to be your job. It's finding a job. You can easily do a hundred resumes, a uh, hundred uh, applications a day, hundred applications a day. Um, if you don't have a job, that need to be, you know, you need to be doing it. A um, hundred applications a day. And then to piggyback off what I said before, meeting or connecting with five to 10 new people a day. All right. Um, so optimize your resume and if you're still not getting any traction to seem like stuff isn't working, I would advise um, enlisting the services of a resume writer, a career coach. Um, I'll actually tag a few um, that I, that I um, use for my students and um, yeah man just you know go the extra mile to make sure that you get the job of your dream. I know I said I was only going to do three but I'm going to give you a bonus tip. Another way to land your first IT job is by shadowing, 
right? Let's say wherever you work currently, if you currently have a job or even if you don't have a, a job, whether it's a mom and pop shop or Google, everywhere, every um, section, every business has an IT um, office, has an IT team, whether it's one guy or if it's 50 people, right? And you won't get paid probably, and you may have to do this before work or after work, but you can shadow those people just to see what the day-to-day -day is like, right? So you can see what does the networking guy do? What does um, the chief information officer do? What does the security analyst do? For one, to see, do I actually want to do this? You know what I'm saying? To see, about, do you actually want to do this job? Because sometimes, you know, people look at the money, oh, I can make $100,000, or I can make 50, 60, whatever, whatever your, you know, uh, pay rate is. And they're like, oh, that's cool, but they don't see that the work that goes into that. Or they're like, oh, I don't really want to do this, right? So a lot of times, if you go ahead and talk to the IT team leader, talk to the people in IT and say, hey, would you mind if I just came over here and maybe shadow one of you guys for 30 minutes a day or 45 minutes a day? Um, so on and so forth. Like I said, this is probably gonna have to be done um, during you know your off hours because I'm pretty sure your boss or wherever you know you work for is gonna want you to uh, be do you know being nosy in the IT department and you ain't doing what you actually getting paid for, right? And a lot of times that doesn't have to be inside your organization because maybe you like I don't want you know to be overshadowing them and then maybe my job I think I'm looking for another job. So sometimes you can actually you know shadow or you know ask for internships. Um, at other organizations just so you can see the inner workings. So just a brief um, recap. First thing you need to do is educate yourself. Second thing you need to do is um, get a robust network. Third thing you need to do is um, optimize your resume. And then last but not least, you can shadow or do internships. So this is Dwayne from ITMasterKey.com. If you have any other suggestions, any tips, Go ahead and um, leave it in the comments. Make sure that you like the video. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you subscribe and head over to itmasterkey.com if you're looking inside of a course. And other than that, I'll see you in class. Hey gang, it's Ron from itmasterkey.com and my job is to get each and every one of you guys certified. So I'm sitting here at the airport and I was thinking about something. So you have to forgive me if the audio quality isn't superb. I apologize. But I just wanted to get this to you guys while it was fresh on my mind. First things first, hopefully you guys are having a great day. Hopefully everything is working out great for you. If not, make sure that you taking some steps to change that. I'm seeing a recurring theme in general. But one of the things that I can kind of annotate or analyze or really look at is my YouTube comments. Now, I don't moderate my own comments. Luckily, I have other people that moderate most of the comments. And every blue moon, they're like, hey, Rob, you might want to look at this. Or, hey, Rob, this is kind of the sentiments right now. Or, hey, Rob, this keeps on coming up. This might be a good idea for a video, so on and so forth. But... One of the members of my team pointed out a couple people, right? Because thank, luckily, you know, I have some pretty thorough people on my side and they had several people. One guy that's been commenting since 2019, a lady that's been commenting, I want to say since 2020, and then another, we don't know if it's a guy or a girl, that's been commenting since 2018. You know, guess what they've been commenting? Studying for blank right now. And it's the same test. It's the same exam. It's the same blah, 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 blah. And it was funny. They put together a timeline. Like, you know, the first post, taking, um, taking A plus in three weeks, wish me luck. Six months down the line, still studying for A plus. Nine months down the line, still studying for A plus, and then the comments change. You know, with the pandemic and everything, you know, I don't know if right now would be a good time to look, man. I've said this once, and I'll say it again. You don't have all the time in the world 
You just don't. You don't have all the time that you think you have. However you are right now, however old you are, right? Just think about back to high school. Think back about your first job. Think about prom. Think about things that may have been five years ago, but it feel like it was a few months ago. Time for me now seems that it's, I don't know, seems like one day is is a week, right? It seems like it's only a few days in a month. It's January, then it's February, then it's March. So that's why I'm so protective of my time. That's why I'm so anxious when it comes to time, because I know once it's over with, it's over with. You can't replenish time. You can't get any more time. So I, for one, try to squeeze as much out of every day as I possibly can. And I just could not imagine being the type of person or being a person that's literally saying the same thing year after year. Literally, one of these people commented on my very first, and I appreciate you know the support, but it's like, damn, I wish you would show yourself the same level of support. You just keep on watching these videos just to watch them. But anyway, comment on my first video that I ever published on the Master IT YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed, shame on you. Go subscribe right now. I'll give you a couple seconds. Master IT YouTube channel. Google it. Click it. Big ass red button says subscribe. Click it. Thanks. So people that come in on my first video still come in the same shit in 2022. My first video was posted, I want to say, uh, 2017 or 18, maybe. And they still come in the same. They still studying for the same test, still studying for the same thing, still saying that they can't wait to, you know, join my program, blah, blah, blah. And it's not even about the, the joining my program thing, because I, for one, know that just in general, you know, just off of numbers, just off of analytics, the vast majority of my listeners, the vast majority of my subscribers, the vast majority of people who comment, like, post, watch every story that I put up, most of them will never join the program. Most of them will never do anything. And it just is what it is. You know, I, I do my job. Hey, this is what I got. You can take advantage of it or not. And another thing is this. And I said this before, and I'll continue to say it. With some stuff, I know the future. And in the future, you're listening to this. In the future, you will be saying something like, damn, I wish I would have got certified sooner. Damn, I wish I would have joined the Zero to Hero program when it was still around. Because believe it or not, gang, I pivot. And when I pivot, I pivot pretty hard, right? Um, I pivoted from civilian to the military, out of the military back to a civilian, to a a multitude of things, a cybersecurity engineer, a network engineer, a project manager, um, a CTO, or this or that, Pip, then pivoted back into education. It's just that you have to take advantage of things when they're available. And I just know for myself, I'm not going to be doing this forever again. Um, the Zero to Hero program is not going to be around forever. And it's going to be so, that's going to be like the, the running thing. Damn, I wish I would have found him sooner. Damn, I wish I would have sent him. Like, shut up. You, 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 you saw it. It was there. Um, and another thing is the time thing and also the lack of belief that a lot of you guys have in yourself. There's so many people that would rather take the air quote safe route and work at a fucking warehouse for 10 years, getting 35 cent raises every year. It's because, oh, I know that job won't be there. 
Uh, I know it ain't going to change. Uh, I know, you, like, come on, man. You have to push yourself. Um, and then another thing is if you fail or it don't go right, if you in your 30s, 40s, you got time, man. You got time to 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 to, to come back. Now, what's going to happen is if a lot of you guys continue to, to, to wait, have children, have more children, have certain ailments, you're going to become less and less risk adverse, right? You're going to be adverse, like your risk tolerance is going to be low as hell because you're going to be thinking about all the things you could possibly lose, right? So, for example, you know, I didn't wait. I hardly wait for anything. Like, as soon as I get an idea in my mind, I try to execute on it because now that I have children, I'm not sure if I would open up a business. I probably would still be, you know, working a, a job, a good job, a great job, uh, because, you know, I've gotten the skills that I need to, to to get to the bag. But I don't think I would have had the wherewithal or I would have had the courage to start a business um, with children. I may be selling myself short, but I'm just not sure. I might have still did it. But if you would have asked me before I started a business, you know, a year before that, if you're like, would you ever start a business? I probably would have told you no. And so, like I said, um, this podcast, the YouTube channel, the Zero to Hero program, it's all meant to give back. Right? It's all meant for a legacy to help you get to where you want to get to. But at the same time, it seems that some of you guys just, you know, can't get saved. Some of you guys just are addicted to losing, addicted to poverty, addicted to mediocrity. You know, nobody gives a damn about your excuses. You can't go, you can't take a damn test. That's going to make you some money. I don't, I don't get it. And another thing is some people, depending on the certification, depending on, Blah, blah, blah. Oh, it's only going to get you, uh, you know, X, Y, Z, or you can, you need to start here. You need to start, like to, thinking about like, look, these things are guaranteed and it's not a one time thing. These certifications are guaranteed to get you some money, some, some, some money over a long term, some money over the long call, get you a job, get your foot in the door, get you to a place where you at least have the ability to make six figures so many people you know focus on the six figure thing and the reason that comes up so much in tech is because it's an actual possibility if you're working at a, a warehouse or you're working at fedex or you're working at uh delivering packages or doing uber eats or doing um even you know skill stuff you know even um in healthcare and um a lot of these roles you're not going to make six figures. And if you do, it's after 20 years. It's after all these promotions, it's after all this crazy stuff. Right. If you do what you need to do in tech, it don't even have to be six figures. You know, you could be making a comfortable living with the skill set that you can take anywhere. Right. That gives you the flexibility to do stuff from your home. For example, you know. I just told you I'm in the middle of the airport doing this right now. Waiting for my um, waiting for my flight. And that's another thing. Like I said, I'm always into execution because I don't know what tomorrow brings. I don't know what's going to happen. So that's why I always try to pour into my students, of course, but primarily my coaching clients because they get on the phone with me for a specific, I got a, this specific issue and I would like some guidance on it. And I pour into those people all the time and it reinforces, you know, that I need to do what I need to do. Because. Like I said, I can't explain it, but I just feel like. Many of you, I just know it. I just I've been seeing thousands of you guys just aren't prepared for success or aren't prepared to do what's necessary to become successful. It's like it's crazy that these people are scared to study for a test. And then, you know, when I was coming through, I didn't have it accessible. Nobody was accessible. Like there's so many people on YouTube, so many people that are willing to give you the game. Now, are you willing to receive it? Or are you, you know, 
wanting them to do shit for free. That's another thing I noticed is that with YouTube and all this other stuff, people um, are so used to free and trying to figure out why they can't get anywhere. Like, I'm sorry. For the most part, some free shit is not going to get you to where you're trying to get to. I know firsthand, trust me, and my dealings with trying to accomplish different things, I've tried the YouTube route. And there's some great information on YouTube. But if you're really trying to win, eventually you will see like, OK, there is a ceiling to this shit. There is a. There's something missing. You can just feel it like uh, I, I feel like this could be faster. Or I feel like it could be more valuable information. And that's one of the things for me, like I said, and then with the time thing. I'll always pay for some pay for some guidance, pay for a shortcut, pay for something that's going to reduce my time and reduce my errors. And whenever I'm trying to execute, like, okay, does this person know what the hell they're doing? Perfect. Here goes some money. Or if you got a program, if you got, uh, if I can get on a call with you, so on and so forth. The days of somebody, you talking about you going to buy somebody a coffee or you just, can I just pick your brain? That shit over with. That's over with. If you want a mentor, you got to understand this is a stranger for most likely, because just like um, anything else, just because you watch some videos, just because you like some, you don't know these people. But you want them to, to, to take time out of their day to talk to you about your problems and your issues. And that's just not the way things go. And then, like I said, um, this is only for, you know, high level performers, though, high, people that are trying to go to the next bracket. If you cool where you at, hey, amen. This shit can fall on deaf ears. No big deal. But if you're really trying to win, I'm telling you, and it doesn't have to be me. Um, but you need to get you some type of coach. Right. And then, like I said. People come back to me again and again and again and again, because. The amount that you have to invest, the value far away is that. That's why I don't have any gripes or any embarrassment or any. I'm not shy about the shit that I do. Yeah, I got a whole program that you can enroll in. Yeah, I got coaching calls and all of it costs money. All of it. And I'm here to help people, which is why I believe the most high blesses all my endeavors. But I'm not about to do this shit for free. Come on, man. I got thousands of posts on Instagram. Hundreds and hundreds of free training on YouTube. But if that ain't enough for you, I don't know what to tell you. I, I, damn, you want to take the test for you too? Like I said, I appreciate all the support. But unless you're a student or a coaching client, beyond, you know, this the stuff I post, I don't owe you shit. Not even a conversation. And that's how you have to move, right? You have to have a singular focus. You have to have a different type of drive, right? And not getting off track, but I'm going to get back on track after this. Another thing is I found is that supporting people, right? Uh, tipping people, uh, paying people, which you should pay them, so on and so forth, always comes back. It's the law of reciprocity, right? If you super cheap at the restaurant and the bill come out and you give them motherfuckers two or three dollar tips, that's why you want to get any money. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't believe in yourself. You don't believe that that money going to come back. Now, I'm not just saying you got to, you know, get some shit off the dollar menu and you get a person $20. No. What I'm saying is appreciate what people do for you. Appreciate people's time. And what I found, uh, the, the best way to show your appreciation is to get somebody some money, man. That's the, that's the whole thing. That's another thing that um, as far as the certifications, that's why the certifications that I push are the certs that I push because I know that it can lead to some money. It's not just, I just this isn't that type of program. We're not on that type of time where, oh, you got a piece of paper and, you know, you should be proud of yourself. You should, I should be. No, you got to provide for your family and yourself. Right. And then, like I said, I'm just big on expediting the process. I'm actually looking right now to see what coaching program, what guidance, who can I connect with, who can I get with to go to the next level. Right. Because I think that no matter what your age is, no matter where you are, 
you always need some type of guidance, right? You always need to connect yourself with people that are moving and shaking. And then, like I said, a lot of times what I'll do is if I want to, if I need something from somebody, if I want to connect with somebody, you know, I see what they got going on and I support first, right? So, okay, let me see. Okay, they selling shirts or they selling books or they selling coaching slots or they selling programs or they got this event and I'll pop up. And then me, you know, just being a genuine person and having a, you know, decent personality, you can get people to help you along your journey. Cause that's the thing. You can't do this shit by yourself, man. You, you, I wouldn't advise you to do it. This is not a, this ain't boxing, right? And even them, even if you're a boxer, you still got a trainer. You still got training partners. You still got people got to spar with. You can't just go to the gym. You on the damn heavy bag. And you think that you about to show up and uh, fight Mike Tyson, uh, you know what I'm saying? Or, or somebody like that. It just don't work like that. You need to cut out all distractions. You need to stop fucking around and do what you need to do or not. That's the whole thing. If this upsets you, if this is kind of like, uh, then just do what you've been doing. You know, and uh, hey, if, if it makes you happy, more power to you. And like I said, I'm talking to people that want more, right? If, you, if you're good where you're at, man, I'm happy for you. But I'm not. I'm definitely not. And anybody that's around me, I don't allow them to be comfortable. That goes for family, friends, whoever. If you're around me, you're not about to just be complacent. You're not just about to be, oh, okay, I'm good. I made it. No. Success is a journey, not a destination. You got to keep on doing what you got to do. Everybody around me is grateful, but nobody's complacent. I, ain't, I don't have time for it. And even students, right? And coaching clients, I'm going to give you the game. I'm going to help you, but I'm not going to do the shit for you, right? And I'm not going to give a damn more than you do. This is your life, man. This is your life. That's it. You are accountable for where you are and where you end up at. And believe it or not, 30 days of grinding, 90 days of grinding will change your entire life. Change your routines. Change your habits. Change yourself. You know, if you're the exact same way you was in high school, that's no bueno. If every time you meet somebody, somebody tell you, man, you ain't changed a bit. That's not a compliment. You ain't you 38 and ain't talking about you ain't changed since you was damn 14. Come on, man. I just know that if I had access to the things that you have, you guys have access to. I would be a lot further along in the race. So like I said, that's why when I do see somebody, when I do get wind of somebody that seems like they really winning or really doing something I would like to do, I try to align myself with them. And if it don't work out, it don't work out. If I if I can't get close to them or if I'm not feeling their vibe or they're not feeling mine, no big deal, right? There's a plenty of other people. But like I said, if you do find somebody that seems like they align with how you feel and you halfway like them and things seem cool. Why wouldn't you want to be on their team? Right. And why wouldn't you want to get the tutelage? Why wouldn't you want to know the obstacles that they had to go through? So you wanted to go through the same thing. I'm going to be honest, right? One of the things that keep me doing this is I know you guys can do it. I talk to grown men all the time. Low self-esteem, low confidence, low whatever. Just because, you know, they haven't, they've never had anybody push them. They never had anybody tell them, you can do this shit. And the reason I'm telling you guys this is because I'm sure you don't do this anyway. This might be your first time hearing me. Don't put me on a pedestal. I'm just a hard worker. I ain't fucking super smart. I'm not a genius. I'm not, I ain't gonna say I'm not better than nobody because I'm better than all these other instructors, but 
you just got to do the work and just be consistent. And whatever you're trying to do, it's going to happen. You know, the, the you know, if you build it, they'll come. And all you got to do is keep building the foundation. The opportunities will come. The the if you're looking for a significant other, that person will come. If you're looking for money, it'll come. Want a new house, it'll come. But you're gonna have to work your ass off every day. Every day. Um, and just giving you an example. Let's say that let's just say hypothetically, I'm way farther along in a race than you. Financially, edu- education, whatever, right? And I'm working harder than you. How the hell does that make sense? Does that make sense to you? How the hell does somebody that's outperform you in all areas is still working harder than you? They didn't already won. You ain't even in the damn race. You ain't got your shoes tied. You over there still drinking water, stretching and shit. And they done won the race. Come on, man. You got to catch up. And like I said, stop worrying about shit that don't matter. If you're not winning right now, man or woman, you shouldn't be watching Netflix. If you're not winning right now, man or woman, you shouldn't be watching every game on Sunday. Then the next morning, watching all the highlights from the game that you already saw, like you a fucking ESPN analyst or something. These are millionaires running around on this football field, living a dream while your fat ass is on the couch talking talking about them, what they need to do. They won. All that hard work is why they're on the field and why you watching them, why you a spectator. Crazy thing is you a spectator to, to those games, but you also act like you a spectator to your own life. Newsflash, you're in control of all this shit, man. If you want to get certified, go get certified. If you don't, then don't. But don't blame nobody else. Because like I said, where I'm at right now, I'm responsible for it. Of course, God lighted the path, but I had to walk. I had to walk it. You understand? I had to do the work. He lit the path to show me, you know, what's possible. But the stuff was real blurry, real blurry. Couldn't really see what it was. I, mean, I know something down there. I guess, I guess I just got to keep on walking this path. I got to keep on doing what I got to do. And then, like I said, you know, you can use your excuses as, you know, soft little pillows to, to lie on and cry yourself to sleep. Or you can get your ass up and do what you got to do. Because I am I promise you this. Whatever the task is, whatever the goal is. I promise you, and this is what I found, and I still suffer from it my, from myself uh, as far as procrastination, but all the shit I be worrying about and, oh, man, I don't know if it's going to work out. Or, oh, man, I got to do this. I got to do that. Once I actually do it, it's never as bad as I thought. Never as bad as I thought. So just take that with you for today. This is the Master IT Podcast with Rob. Hopefully this reached who it needed to reach, touch who it needed to touch. Make sure you like this, share it to at least two social media platforms so we can get the message out. And if you're looking for training, you already know you can go to itmastery.com and apply to our flagship program. If you want to do a one-on-one with me, which I think is what a lot of you guys need. If you're not necessarily looking to get certified, not necessarily looking to get into tech, but just looking to level up in all areas of your life. You know, we can hop on a phone call and as direct as I am on this podcast, I'm going to tell you exactly what the hell you need to do, what you're fucking up on, what you need to work on, and we can kind of give you a roadmap to be successful. Other than that, I'm going to see you in class. Hey gang, in this video, I'm going to tell you exactly what you need to do to get certified. Hey gang, it's Ron from ICMasterKey.com and my job is to help each and every one of you guys get certified. So I don't want to waste anybody's time, right? Don't want to waste your time. So what I'm going to do is tell you the truth right now. If you don't want to get certified, specifically if you don't want to use Master IT 
for training to get certified, this video may not be for you, okay? So if that's not you, go ahead and click off. Good luck on your journey. So this is the most commonly asked questions I get about the Zero to IT Hero program. So stay tuned so you know exactly what to expect when you enroll. So how long does it take to finish the Zero to IT Hero program? So the program is self-paced, meaning that you can go as fast or as slow as you like. But most students usually finish the program in about three to four months. So usually, recently, people have been finishing in 90 days, which is three months. So be looking at about three to four months of study time to get all the certifications that's within this program. Another question I get is, is there any live training? So believe it or not, the best instructor this side of Mississippi, your favorite instructor, me, yours truly, actually is adding live training to the Zero to Hero program. Yep, you heard me right. Once a week, one time a week, we'll meet together as a family. Everybody's in the program and we'll go over the exams, the certification. Every week, we'll pick a different certification to talk about and to kind of give you that edge when you go inside of the exam room. And just because I want you guys to win, it's at no additional cost. Now, most times when programs add additional features, add extra stuff, they add to the price tag. I decided that this year and moving forward, I want you guys to win and pretty much there's no way for you to lose if you have self-paced training and you can rock out whenever you want to and you have live training, right? You got the source, but if you got any questions, any comments, any concerns, I got you. So when you enroll, when do you actually start? Right now. So go ahead and cut this video off, click enroll and you will start right now now there is no grace period there is no 24-hour hold there is no process as soon as you are enrolled as soon as you are deemed applicable fill out the application we accept you you will be able to start training right now like literally after you enroll you have complete access to everything that's in the zero to zero program so how long do you have access to the program so the program is self-paced right but you have one year you have one year to complete everything that is in the program why because it shouldn't take you more than a year especially when students are getting finished in three to four months also with these exams updating all the time and all this different type of stuff we want to make sure that you are in the proper window so one year you got an entire year, which is more than enough time, double, triple the amount of time that you actually need to get certified and finish the program. But to make the stuff real clear, you get one year access. Now the program includes a myriad of different certifications. A question that I get a lot of times is, can I go in any order I want to? You're an adult, you can do whatever you want to. But what we found is that we've created a certification success roadmap. And if you follow that roadmap or students that follow that roadmap are a lot more successful. So can you go in any order? Yes. Do we recommend that you go in any order? No. If you follow that roadmap, you'll be successful. So what if you're rocking out in a self-paced course and you have a question? Is there anybody that you can ask? Yes. There's always somebody there. So in every lecture, in every program, in every course, you can actually leave a comment or a question. And within 24 hours, somebody will respond to that question. Don't wanna wait 24 hours, no big deal. We have a community chat. We have a group of students just like you. I'm in a group chat. And also it's everybody in the Master IT team in that group chat. So if it's not me that grabs, the question and answers it. It's gonna be one of the team members or maybe even one of your fellow students. So you'll always have somebody there to answer any questions that Say you Say that have. you enroll and the course isn't what you want it to be. It's not what you expected. That usually is not gonna happen. I'm almost guaranteeing that's not what's gonna happen, but let's say that it does. We have a 14 day money back guarantee. So if you enroll into the program and you say, hey, I'm not feeling within the first two weeks, we will refund you, no questions asked, right? So within the first two weeks, I don't like it. We'll give you your money back. We'll wish you well. Another question I get all the time is, is it free? We also provide bonus courses. So the core of the program is gonna be CompTIA certifications. The ITF Plus, the A Plus, the Net Plus, and the Security Plus. Some of the most popular certifications in the industry. But to kind of sweeten the deal a little bit, 
we actually added Microsoft training. So you'll get Microsoft training for networking, Microsoft training for security, and Microsoft training for operating systems. Why do we choose Microsoft as additional bonus training? Because as of right now today, Microsoft operating systems are the number one operating systems in the world. We also introduced something called exam insurance. Now, sometimes when we take the exams, we're nervous. We got into a fight with our spouse. We got a flat tire on the way to the exam center and we're just not in the right frame of mind when we're taking the exam and we end up failing the exam. That's why we introduce exam insurance. If you purchase exam insurance, we'll give you one additional retake for each exam. So to give you peace of mind, when you go in the exam room, if things don't go the right way, don't worry about it, just go take it again. Since we want to make sure that this is accessible to everybody, we have flexible payment options. So if the total cost of the course is too much for you, you can actually have a payment plan, a flexible payment plan that will allow you to stretch out the payments throughout the duration of the actual program. So again, this video should answer any question that you have. I got one question for you. When are you enrolling? If you want to enroll, just go to itmatchkey.com, click the three little dashes on the top right corner if you're on your mobile. If not, then the options will be displayed on the top bar. All you have to do is click apply to the Zero to IT Hero program. You will answer a few questions. And if you qualify, then you'll actually get a chance to hop on the phone with me and I'll go through what the next steps are, everything in the program, and just to see if the program is really for you. Because if the program isn't for you, I'd rather you not enroll and I'll actually guide you in a different direction for a program or some people that can help you better than we can. I just want you to win, and even if I can't assist you, I'll help you and guide you to somebody that can. So other than that, I'll see you in class. Hey gang, it's Rob, and in this course, we wanna talk about cloud computing. So no matter if a company is big or small, they're gonna be moving towards cloud computing. So it's probably a good idea for you to learn a thing or two about cloud computing. So that's where this course comes in. So in this course, we're gonna learn about cloud concepts, business principles regarding the cloud, compliance, technical operations of the actual cloud, and cloud security, and a bunch of other stuff. But that's gonna be the main stuff that we're gonna focus on, right? So we're gonna hit all the objectives on the actual exam. We're gonna learn about cloud computing. You're gonna go from uh, thinking that, you know, cloud computing has something to do with the weather forecast to, you know, actually understanding um, that it's some servers, some other things that's involved in cloud computing. Other than that, I'm gonna stop running my mouth. We're gonna go ahead and start the class right now. So in our first domain, we're gonna talk about cloud concepts. We're gonna talk about service models, deployment models and characteristics of the cloud. So I just got a few suggestions. I just got a few requirements for you guys. Just make sure that you have fun, make sure that you learn and just make sure that you keep going and keep grinding and that you get all this knowledge in this course. All right, let's go ahead and dive right into it. Hey gang, welcome to day one of your Cloud Essentials journey. So let's get the big stuff out the way. What exactly is the cloud? So the cloud, super simple, straight to the point, is somebody else's computer. Yep, that's it, that's all. With cloud computing, you have access to cloud servers and cloud computers anytime you want. And you can put anything you want on those cloud servers and those cloud computers at any time you want, as long as you have a connection to the internet. So let's talk about a few cloud service models that you guys need to know. So the most popular and the most common are gonna be SaaS, PaaS, and IaaS. So the first one we wanna talk about is SaaS, or Software as a Service. So SaaS makes things super simple and super easy for the user. It requires zero installation, and it's always there when you need it. So a few examples of SaaS would be Gmail, Dropbox, Slack, Netflix, YouTube. All of these will be considered SaaS service models. So with SaaS, it pretty much puts zero burden and zero responsibility on you. Everything is already there for you with a SaaS or a software as a service model. Now, this is what I want you to do. I want you to drop in the comments 
some examples of SaaS software and the SaaS thing that you use. I already named Netflix and YouTube and a few others, but there's a myriad, there's a bunch of them. There's a bunch of other examples that we can use. Make sure you drop a few for me in the comments. So next up, we're gonna talk about IaaS or infrastructure as a service. So unlike SaaS with IaaS, you're gonna be depending on somebody else's whole shit bang of bang. You're gonna be depending on somebody else's computer, somebody else's network, somebody else's processing power, right? So with IaaS, you're pretty much borrowing somebody else's machine, somebody else's server, right? Let's say that you don't wanna buy a server that has 20 terabytes of storage, 100 gigs of RAM, and a super fast 32 core processor. Say that you're doing something that's really intensive, you're trying to edit 100 videos at a time and you don't wanna buy a $10,000 computer. If you don't wanna do that, you can actually rent or have a monthly prescription or just pay as you go with a IaaS. So you're pretty much borrowing remotely somebody else's device, somebody else's server, so you can actually implement the things you wanna implement. So a few examples of this would be Oz or AWS, and also Microsoft Azure. Just like we did with SaaS, instead of you giving me examples of products or software that actually would be I ask, I want you to give me a scenario. In the comments, drop or formulate a scenario on a reason why you would use IaaS. Jane wants to do X, Y, Z, so this is why she would use IaaS or infrastructure as a service. So PaaS takes IaaS to the next level. So PaaS is platform as a service. So PaaS actually allows you to customize everything from the ground up. So IaaS, Pretty much you get what you get. Pass, you can pretty much create whatever your imagine and budget, imagination and your budget can actually handle. Pass is where that will come in because it includes developers. So if you're creating an app, developers will code everything and code is just the language and the framework and what makes everything work in the background. Okay, I want this button to do this and then I want it to open this web page and then I want it to be a video that pops up. Just whatever the application, whatever you want it to do, it would be everything in IaaS, but on top of that, it would include DevOps and developers, which is just development operations, right? A coder will come in or a developer will come in. You would pretty much lay out, this is what I want my application to do. And they would literally make exactly what you want. Okay? So SAS, IaaS, and PaaS. Make sure that you drop in the comments a scenario. What's a scenario? You should already know the drill by now. What's a scenario that somebody would use PaaS for? What, what would be a reason an organization or a person would want to actually use PaaS? All these service models have different pricing structures. Some of them may even be free. Some may be crazy expensive. But a lot of times you can do pay as you go, pay for use. So pretty much pay as you go, meaning that, okay, I only use 10 gigabytes of information or 10 gigabytes of resources. I was only on there for an hour and then they would charge you for that time. Or it may be charged by capacity or it may be a lease. Okay, I'm gonna have this web server for an hour or a month or a week, or it may be a standardized contract that says, okay, you can have these web servers from these from eight to five, for six months, so on and so forth, okay? Now when it comes to cloud servers, you have a few different options when it comes to how they're deployed. When you deploy a cloud server, you can do it in a couple of different ways. So one is a public cloud, and pretty much that's self-explanatory, meaning that anybody that has a internet connection can connect to that cloud. So that would be Dropbox, Google Drive, Netflix, those types of things will be considered public clouds. Now the inverse of that would be the private cloud. That's what you mostly use for organizations, meaning that everybody that works at IT Master Key or Master IT has access to this cloud. Everybody else does not have access to this cloud. All right, so public, everybody, private, somebody. Now there's also a mixture or a hybrid version of this where people have access to everything. So there's a part of the cloud that's public and there's also a part that's private that only members of the organization and selected personnel have access to. Now last but not least, let's go over a few components or features or expectations when it comes to cloud computing and cloud servers. All right, again, when it comes to cloud servers and the cloud, there's certain expectations. So the cloud should be 
elastic or have elasticity. What that means is that at any time I should be able to increase or decrease resources, right? Meaning that, okay, maybe I have a higher workload today. Let me put a few more GPUs on here, graphic processor units, but let me put a little bit more storage on here. Let me put a little bit more of this or a little bit more of that, right? So if a cloud has elasticity, I can do that whenever I want to. So when I need more resources, I can get them. When I need less resources, I can do that as well. The most important part of that is because organizations don't wanna pay for things that they're not using. Remember we said before, things uh, may be pay as you go, especially if it's pay as you go, or it may be pay by the hour. If you're getting paid by the hour, you don't wanna get clocked for hours that you're not even using those servers. Make sense? All right, next up, you wanna make sure that the cloud has scalability that is scalable. Elasticity is more worried about right now, what's going on right now. Scalability is more worried about what's going to go on in the future. With scalability, it wants to ensure that as we grow as a company, as we add more resources, we can actually make sure that everybody's performance stays the same and stays consistent. Last but not least, which is super important is availability. The cloud needs to be available. You need to have as much availability as possible. 99.9999999% of the time, people need to be able to click on a cloud and make sure whatever they need access to, they have access to. And we can talk about ways to improve availability, or we are gonna talk about ways to improve availability later on in this uh, course. Hey gang, you made it through your first lecture with me. After this, go ahead and knock out the quick quiz and go on to the next lecture. All right gang, in this lecture, we're going to talk about networking concepts. So the reason we want to talk about networking concepts is because without a network, you can't connect to the damn cloud. So y'all ready to get into it? Let's get straight into it. So I'm going to share my screen with you guys. When it comes to connecting to the cloud, you can do it two different ways. You can connect directly or you can do it through a VPN. So a VPN is a virtual private network. Say it with me, a virtual private network, a VPN. So just like um, the slide says, a VPN allows you to connect to something private via a public connection. So walk with me. You have your public internet at your home, right? But you wanna connect to your work network. So what happens is you use your public network, then you connect to a VPN, and then the VPN will connect you to your private network or your work network. Why do you want to do this? The main purpose of a VPN is to hide the traffic, to encapsulate the traffic, I hope you all like my hand signals, uh, to secure the traffic, to block the traffic from anybody else being able to see or to hack or to capture the traffic going from you to wherever you're trying to go to, all right? So it secures all the information going from you to somewhere else. That is the purpose of a VPN, okay? So story time, like your story, here we go. Jim uses his home Wi-Fi to connect to his company's private cloud storage. The VPN ensures traffic is encrypted between these two points. Make sense? All right. All right, now let's talk about access types. So there's a couple of different protocols. There's a couple of different ways that we can actually connect with a cloud. There's a couple of different protocols that come into play. And these are a few that... Um, you need to know. All right, so just to back all the way up, our protocol is just rules, regulations, and standards, just to make things a little bit simpler. So the first thing we got is RDP, Remote Desktop Protocol. So RDP allows you to remote into another device. Remote just means that it's somewhere that you're not physically at. All right, so you can remote into another PC, you can remote into another device. As long as that device gives you access and says, yes, yeah, cool, but it's got this girl to come on, RDP is what allows that to happen. So remote desktop protocol allows you to connect to a remote device via your network connection. Many IT support professionals use RDP to assist with customer troubleshooting issues. So it doesn't make you lazy if you use remote desktop. And a lot of times, like I said, you can't even use remote desktop. Um, without somebody actually saying, yeah, it's okay. Now, sometimes in some organization, um, depending on what your level is, what your clearance is, uh, how much uh, privilege they're giving you, you, sometimes you can actually just 
you know, get on somebody's computer willy nilly without even telling them that you're going to get on there. Now, here's a lesson. Here's another story. Why would you not want to do that? Why would you not want to remote into somebody's computer without telling them? Number one, people are going to freak the hell out. They're going to, if their mouth start moving, the stuff starts opening and closing, I'm getting hacked. I don't know what's going on. So just make sure to say, hey, man, hey, Jim, I'm going to be on your computer. I'm trying to upload some or download some, or I'm trying to update something. Okay. Next up, uh, secure sale, also known as SSH. The SSH protocol uses encryption to secure the connection between client and server. So that's another layer of encapsulation. That's another layer of tunneling to actually put that information. So look at uh, the data that's going on the network as if it's in a tube, right? So it's already in the internet tube, and then we put in another tube, and we put in another tube to encapsulate it away from people being able to sniff it, people being able to look at it, people being able to manipulate it, okay? All user authentication, commands, output, and file transfers are encrypted to protect against attacks in the network. So last but not least is one I'm pretty sure you guys know of is HTTPS, all right? So HTTPS is a secure version of the internet. So HTTP is before all websites, right? HTTPS is pretty much the standard now. Pretty much any website should be running off of HTTPS. So that's a secure version of the internet, all right? So an easy way to figure out if uh, internet is using HTTPS is just to look at the beginning of the URL, AKA the website name, or a lot of times there'll be a little lock in the corner that'll show you, hey, this is a secure website. Our HTTPS is used to encrypt all traffic to and from a website. When uh, you log into a bank and you're verified, if it's not already HTTP, it should flip over to HTTPS, all right? But most websites now, before you even verify, before you even authenticate, most websites now are HTTPS. All right, so last but not least, firewalls. All right, so a firewall is not optional as far as I'm concerned. You need to have firewalls set up on your network and on your devices. So a firewall, simply put, it lets in the good stuff and stops the bad stuff. So a firewall looks at all the information that's in that tube. And if it's some information that looks dirty, that looks weird, it blocks and says, hey, you can't come in here because I don't want you to mess up my device and my network, okay? All right, last but not least, since we're talking about networking concepts, this is pivotal. Without this, it would be super hard to get on the internet, like super hard, right? So a domain name server or a DNS server resolves IP addresses to website names. So what the hell is an IP address? So an IP address is just the address for your device, for your website, everything on the internet needs an address so I know where to send it, so the device knows where to send it, so on and so forth. So whether you're on itmaskey.com, ESPN.com, nationalgeographic.com, each one of those websites has an IP address. So when I click on nationalgeographic.com, my computer knows, oh, okay, I know where this guy wants to go. Because remember, uh, computers don't look at words, they actually look and perform off of numbers, right? So DNS. Domain name server. So you pretty much type in itmagicy.com and it resolves or it looks to see what the hell IP address is itmagicy.com um, assigned to. So just to put this in uh, layman's terms, if I haven't done all, uh, already, you need an address on your home for FedEx, the mailman, uh, the police to know where you live at, right? So if you don't have an address on your um, home, it's going to be pretty hard for Amazon to know where to deliver those packages. All right, so that's pretty much your IP address is your address on the network. So when something is sent, they know that it's supposed to go to you. All right, one more time, story time. Janice visits icmagicy.com, whose IP address is 888.9. The DNS server receives Janice's Request and sees 8.8.8.9 correlates to icmagicy.com, and then bam, the school's homepage uh, pulls up. All right, gang, so right now we're going to talk about storage types. There's a few different types 
of storage when it comes to cloud servers and cloud computing. So you got object storage, file storage, and block storage. So we're gonna go in reverse. Let's start from the bottom. So block storage. Block storage is actually the oldest and the simplest form of storage. And the way it stores data is in blocks, hence the name. Next up is object storage. So object-based storage differs from other computer data storage architectures that it lets you manage objects rather than file systems. So what's a file system? A file system is what you're using right now. A file system is just the way things are organized, the way that things are structured, the way that things are set up. So let's go right in the middle. File storage. So a file system gives you a lot more customability. Customability? If that's not a word, I apologize. I promise you I graduated high school, but it's a lot more uh, customizable is a better word to use. Customizable. So you can create, delete, modify, and read and write files. And then things are set up in a hierarchical system. Pretty much there's something that is above something else. So we got the top level hierarchy and then things tree off or branch off from that hierarchy. So a super simple uh, way to break this down is something called uh, NTFS. So on a Windows uh, operating system, there's something called NTFS, New Technology File System. And a new technology file system is a hierarchical system. And that is the way things are set up, how the files and the folders are set up and it allow you to create, delete, modify, read, and write. Sound good? Now storage features. This stuff is pretty straightforward, but let's talk about it anyway. So a lot of cloud providers and just storage in general has a way for you to compress files. That way it'll make upload speeds or download speeds or just transporting that data a lot quicker. So you can compress a file that's two gigs, maybe into 500 megabytes, so on and so forth. And then once you expand or once you uncompress or decompress that actual compressed file, all the contents and everything that was within that compressed file would be in there. Another thing that's really good is deduplication. So a lot of cloud services have something called deduplication, which just makes sure that there's no extra copies of the same files, because you don't want to have a hundred of the same file taking up a lot of space on the cloud server or just on your device or just in general. Because remember, a lot of times with uh, cloud services, you're paying for capacity, you're paying for hourly rates, you're paying for a lot of resources. And over time, different files, different videos, different things, if you got three copies of something that is two gigabytes a piece, right? You got four gigabytes of room that's taken up for something that you don't really need to be taken up because it's a copy of a copy of a copy. So deduplication, just make sure there are no duplicates on the actual uh, system. All right, so uh, last but not least, we talked about this already a couple of times. So capacity on demand pretty much means that if you want a little bit more capacity, we can do that for you. If you want a little bit less, we can do that for you. So whatever you're looking for, as long as you got the, the budget, if that's the type of contractor, that's the type of provider you're going with, you can have that type of capacity on demand. All right, last but not least, one big thing with cloud services is worrying about disasters, disaster recovery, just bad stuff happening, blackouts, just uh, things not being available, so on and so forth. So a way to prevent this, a way to make sure that everything runs smoothly, just in case there is some kind of disaster, we got hot and cold sites. So simply put, I work here and my hot site is across the street. Whatever I have at my hot site, the exact same thing is over at, excuse me, whatever I have at my main site, the exact same thing is at my hot site. So literally if something crazy happens, power goes out, the damn building fall apart, I can go across the street and do exactly what I was doing here at my hot site. Hot site is an exact replica 
of whatever your main site is. Now a code site can vary from just having another building to having a building with some of the equipment in it or having a building with all the equipment, but it isn't set up. Having a building with all the equipment is set up, but ain't no electricity in there, so on and so forth. So with a cold site, one of the main critical functions of your site isn't set up quite yet. So like I said, a lot of times a cold site may just be another site with minimal amount of equipment, minimal manning, and sometimes it may be as bare as just a building. Now, there is an in-between, and between that, something called a warm site. And we're going to find out about that in story time. Got a story? Want to hear it? Here we go. Mike works for CyberNet's Incorporated Headquarters. CyberNet's server room has caught on fire. So Mike runs over to CyberNet's warm site and begins to boot up all systems and ensure the air conditioning is set at the proper temperature and humidity. So a warm site is closer to a hot site than a cold site. So a warm site, like I said, could be that we have the equipment, we got power, we got water, but the operating systems aren't on the actual servers or the network engineer isn't there or um, things like that. So basically I'm almost ready, but not ready. Like I said, a cold site can be so drastic that it ain't nothing but just the building. So a warm site at minimum is gonna have the equipment and you may have to do a few things just to get it up and running with um, to make it a warm or make it a hot site. So um, I don't know what the hell I'm stuttering so much. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I need to go to eat a snack or some shit. I don't know. Anyway, uh, so um, hot site um, means that everything is good to go. Warm site, almost. Cold site, it varies, right? It could be just a building. It could be a building with equipment. It could be a building... Uh, without no running water, without no electricity. But the differences are, or one major difference is, is that a hot site is the most expensive. Why do you think that is? A hot site is the most expensive because it's literally, imagine, okay, wherever you live at, if it's an apartment, if it's a home, if it's a homeless shelter, no judgment. Uh, imagine you having to pay two mortgages, two mortgages, two car payments, two electric, uh, electricity bills, two cell phone bills, two internet bills, so on and so forth, right? Now, a hot site is the best uh, as far as getting your things back up and operational, but it's going to be the most expensive. All right, gang, so we went through um, that really quick lecture, and our goal, as always, is to get you guys certified. So make sure after this, you take the quick quiz and go ahead and go to the next lecture. Now, gang, when it comes to cloud and cloud design, you want to have redundancy. So this is a word, a big word that's to come up already, but it means something really, really simple. So it means that you have a backup to a backup to a backup, because we already know things happen, things break, things blow the hell up. So we just want to make sure that we have some kind of backup to make sure that if things go left, we'll be able to pivot and continue operations, okay? So when it comes to cloud design, redundancy is extremely important. This means that the more redundant devices you have, the more tolerant your cloud design will be to faults. So faults would be servers breaking, lines breaking, power going out, just faults. Just things that you don't wanna happen, but are inevitable, things that's gonna happen anyway, all right? So this is gonna allow you to be up more than 99% of the time, okay? So pretty much when somebody clicks on the cloud or pretty much when you get on the internet, you expect for it to work. So 99.999% of the time, it needs to work. And the way that that availability happens is through redundancy, all right? So story time. Want to hear a story? Here we go. Janice is a network engineer for Fox Corp. She wants to make sure that the cloud servers are available no matter what. So she ensures that the main server has a backup server. The backup server is connected to an UPS or uninterruptible power system or supply. The additional server ensures the cloud remains running if the primary server goes down. The UPS ensures both servers continue to work in case of a blackout. So UPS or a UPS or uninterruptible power supply will be hooked up to critical servers. So if there is a blackout, if something crazy happens, those servers won't be damaged from power spikes or no power at all. 
So those ups will be connected to those so you can power them down correctly and save things that you need to save and move whatever you need to move to wherever it needs to go to. And the redundancy comes from the backup server, right? So if the main primary server blows up, don't worry about it. We sit straight to the backup server, okay? So redundancy, redundancy, redundancy. Said it three times because redundancy just means several things that are the same, all right? So availability comes from redundancy. We are right now, so we're still uh, hoping to get our uh, the data recovery done this week. Lieutenant Bill Ungru is the tech guru at the St. Bernard Police Department. His digital know-how has spared officers here a lot of pain other departments are dealing with right now. The records management software from a company called Securus isn't working. And that created the question of what are we going to do at this point? And fortunately, we had our old software, which we call CPR, Computerized Police Report System. For now, St. Bernard is using their form software from almost two decades ago. They also have backed up information on hand to help them continue operating. Yesterday, a group of police chiefs from across Hamilton County sat down exclusively with WLWT. They shared their concerns as a massive server failure left them with lost data and no reporting system for nearly two weeks now. Just uh, standard reports that we would have to take for cars being broken into are taking officers hours longer than it used to. Officers at more than 20 police departments across Hamilton County are having to work around it. For many, that means stacks of handwritten reports piling up, zapping time and money. Any spare time you have, you're coming back to do paperwork before going out and handling the next call. To balance cost and efficiency, these departments stored their data in the cloud on the company's servers. They say they were assured there would be numerous backups. This cost is an issue when you're dealing with municipalities because unless you've got grants available, funding is just, you'd rather put your money into officers and get them out on the street. But some chiefs say this data catastrophe could cost more than money. It could put safety and court cases at risk. The Hamilton County Prosecutor's Office usually has access to the system, and for now they are working with the affected departments to keep the information flowing in other ways to make sure cases go on as normal. Hopefully, they'll figure out what happened and make sure it doesn't happen again. All right, now, departments we've spoken with say they spend between $3,000 and $17,000 a year for this service. Now they're standing by for their data to be restored, which they hope will be completed in days. In the unfortunate event of a disaster, be it user error, a technological failure, or a real-life disaster, it is important to look at your RTO and RPO. Say you own a nice new boat. Sadly, there is a disaster and your boat springs a leak. How much time do you have to plug the hole before the water takes over? If it takes one hour for the boat to fill up with water and sink, but you repair the hole in 10 minutes, your boat has survived the leak. This is the same as the RTO, Recovery Time Objective. RTO indicates how much time you have before the system has to be back up, running, and functional for your users. Say your recovery time objective is five hours and disaster strikes. If the system is back running within three hours, you have met your RTO. If you crash the boat, you have an excess or deductible. This is the amount of money you're willing to pay in the event of an accident. That excess in insurance is similar to your RPO regarding disaster recovery. Your RPO, recovery point objective, is how much data expressed as time you are willing to lose in the event of a disaster. Say your recovery point objective is one hour's worth of data. There is a disaster and your primary server is destroyed. However, your standby database was updated within the five minutes. This is within the recovery point objective as potentially only five minutes worth of data is lost. So man, we're gonna learn about business principles regarding the cloud. So cloud assessments, different cloud providers, cloud migration, and cloud adoptions, and a lot of other stuff. But that's going to be the main things that we focus on. So as always, make sure that you have fun. Make sure you soak up all of this knowledge. Let's go ahead and get right into it. So a cloud assessment assesses if the cloud is a good idea for you. So when choosing a cloud structure, you need to make sure that the cloud meets current and future requirements. So you figure that out by a three-step process. So you do a feasibility study, then you do a gap analysis, then you do a baseline. So we're going to do a quick little story time. If you want to hear a story, good, because here it comes. Ricky is a cloud engineer and is currently looking at implementing a new cloud infrastructure. 
He decides to determine if the new cloud idea is feasible by running a feasibility study. During this study, he looks at economic, technical, legal, and scheduling considerations. He then analyzes the gap between where the company is now and where it wants to be in the future. Lastly, he runs a baseline test to see how the cloud performs under normal conditions. So to run it back really fast, a feasibility study, just make sure that things are feasible. So economically, can we afford it? Do we have the technical capabilities to do it? Legally, <laughs> can we do this? And scheduling considerations, do we have the time to even make this happen? Uh, next, the gap analysis is real. It's literally that simple. Where are we at right now? Where do we want to be in the future? And how do we fill in that gap? Who do we need to hire? Who do we need to fire? Who do we need to get a loan from? So on and so forth. Then a baseline is pretty much a screenshot of how the network, how the cloud looks, how the employees look. When everything is running good, that's a baseline. And then you can actually look at things to see, okay, usually, under normal operations, this is how things work. Today is kind of weird. Why is it like that? That way you always need a baseline. Uh, when we start talking about security, when we start talking about networking, we always have to have a safe spot. We always have to have a home. We always have to have a baseline to kind of gauge where things are. That way you'll know if you're veering off a little bit to the left or to the right. Route? Right, to the right. So story time, that was real quick. A feasibility study, you know what that is. Gap analysis, we talked about that and what a baseline is. All right, so another super important thing just in general in IT is reporting and documenting everything. So documentation is of the utmost importance and can be a lifesaver for a cloud engineer and the organization. Documentation should include the following. So diagrams. So sometimes saying something, writing something down doesn't really click. Right. So sometimes you need to show people a visual representation of what you're talking about. So having a diagram, especially when we're talking about IT, makes stuff a lot simpler. Because remember, the cloud is nothing but a bunch of servers, a bunch of other computers. So if you set up a diagram, instead of telling people this server is in room A and this server is in room B, they can kind of get a better picture if you lay out an entire diagram of what servers serve who, who they're connected to, what department it is, so on and so forth. Um, reporting. So you should always have constant reporting, have constant analytics, have constant data to figure out if things are okay or if things aren't. If you don't have reporting, you kind of don't know what's going on. You kind of just winging it, which is always no bueno, which is always not a good idea. So there should be constant reporting on computing power, networking and storage. These reports should be compared against the baseline and company benchmarks. So benchmarks pretty much mean certain thresholds, certain standards, certain things. This is a benchmark. This is what it is, all right? So a benchmark baseline. We talked about a baseline before. Baseline is just normal operations. Then benchmarks are a certain standard, a certain rate. This is a benchmark, okay? Uh, points of contact. This is super important too. So you should, you should always have points of contact if things are above the threshold, if we aren't meeting certain benchmarks, if certain things aren't working, you need to be able to get a hold of who you need to get a hold of. And one of the big key things, especially if you're um, a big player in the organization, if you are a shot caller, if you're a boss, uh, you need to know who the key stakeholders are, right? So the key stakeholders would be major investors, people who have a really big stake in the cloud operation, a big stake in the organization. So a key stakeholder would be somebody who has a vested interest in um, the cloud succeeding. Now, uh, a help desk employee or the front desk receptionist wouldn't be looked at a key stakeholder because of that. Okay, she may lose her job or he may lose their job, but if the CEO or the cloud blows up, the CEO may lose, you know, his whole career, his reputation, so on and so forth, may lose millions of dollars. So a key stakeholder is a really pivotal and important person. And another thing, uh, POCs, you need to have a directory. So everybody knows who's a call. Okay, this is the director of IT. This is the director of finance. This is the owner of the company. So when you're going with different cloud providers, it's different costs. So if you are a project manager, if you are the person with the company credit card, if you are the owner, these costs are super important, right? 
super important to your bottom line. So there's a couple of different types of expenses that you may incur, right? So expenditures is just a fancy word for expenses. Okay, so an expenditure isn't necessarily a regular expense, though. It's not just like, okay, we're spending this money. It's looked at more as an investment. So if you're upgrading stuff, if you're buying new stuff, if you're doing stuff to improve the business, that would be referred to as capital expenditures, right? So that could be buying a new warehouse, buying a new plant, buying a new office building, buying new servers, upgrading from... Cat five, cat six to fiber, getting some new networking teams, getting a social media um, campaign person, just stuff that's going to improve the actual business. Would business, what a B, business <laughs> that's going to improve the actual business would be uh, capital expenditures for the business. So, operating expenditures, that's pretty much what it takes to actually keep the lights on, literally, right? So what are the operating expenses? How much does, do I have to pay for employees? How much do I have to pay for insurance? How much do I have to pay for lights? How much do I have to pay for my cloud provider, my internet service, so on and so forth? So what do I have to spend? What are my monthly bills to keep the actual business running? So there's two types of costs, right? You got variable costs and when you got fixed costs. So on the safe side, fixed costs are the best because this is what it's going to cost every month. Variable costs can vary. So maybe one month is $100. The next month is $10,000. So you want to make sure that you kind of reduce your variable costs and have as many uh, fixed costs as possible. So just like this says, fixed costs remain the same from month to month, while variable costs are tied to production levels and can vary based on current production, okay? Okay, the licensing model. So a licensing agreement. A licensing agreement is a contract between the licensor and the licensee in which the licensee gains access to the licensor's intellectual property. So um, you can license out different stuff, right? So, um, for example, Disney. Disney owns a bunch of stuff. Disney owns Goofy's logo. It owns Mickey Mouse logo. It owns all of the Disney characters. It owns those, right? So, um, let's say a video game, right? So, a long time ago, I don't know if this is still rocking or not, uh, but a long time ago, it was this game called Kingdom Hearts, right? And it had a bunch of different characters from a bunch of di different Disney movies. So whoever developed that game actually licensed those characters from Disney. All right. So if you don't get a license agreement, if you don't ask, uh, hey, man, can I use this stuff? Then whoever that licensor is, whoever the owner of that stuff is, can sue you, right? Um, let's even use um, a example that's a little bit closer to home. So just like me, I am the owner, I'm the founder of this course that you're going through, right? So I license some of this material and other courses to colleges, to vocational schools, and they use my material for their students, right? If I didn't give them permission to do that, I would sue them for sure, for millions. And then I would quit doing this and I would go a uh, sale across. The, I don't know what the hell I would do. I wouldn't quit. I'd probably be doing this until um, I can get my Lambo. Anyway, uh, so you got different types of uh, licenses. You can BYOL, which stands for bring your own license, or you can do a subscription where you will pay month to month. All right. So bring your own license offers much more flexibility as opposed to subscriptions. So bring your own license offers reduction and removal of upfront costs. So if you own your own license, if you own your own stuff, you don't have to worry about upfront costs, right? You don't have to worry about that type of stock, um, increased freedom of use. So even with a license, right? You still have restrictions, just like me. In certain stuff, if I license my stuff out to people, it's like, hey, you can only use it with this amount of people. You can only use it with this group of people. You can only use it for 90 days. You can only use it for a year, however long it is. That model is uh, comes with restrictions when it's subscription. Just like when I, if I license something from somebody else, it's going to come with restrictions. 
Um, another thing usually with bring your own license, you have in-depth tracking and reporting. A lot of times if a subscription, all that reporting and all that data is usually going to go back to the licensor as opposed to the licensee. Okay, last but not least, this kind of sounds kind of crazy, but human capital, all right? Human capital is a measure of economic value and an employee skill set. So this is super important in today's climate. Right. A lot of people are losing their jobs. A lot of people are having to find different work because they might not be as valuable as the employer would like them to be. And unfortunately, if you have the wrong organization, they may not improve your human capital. They may not be concerned with improving your skill set. But I know that you personally are improving your skill set because you're right here with me learning this stuff, right? So when you're ever inside of an organization, you want to be improving your human capital. Once you become the leader of an organization, you want to make sure that you're working with your people, improving their skill set. A lot of times, organizations are scared that they're going to spend too much money. They're going to teach a person a bunch of stuff and they're going to leave. You can't really think about it like that. You want to make sure that you train people and make sure that they're sharp and they're the best um, people for the organization. So it's like I said, you want to invest inside your people. Organizations should make a concerted effort to ensure their teams are improving their skill sets. This can be done by the following training and promoting personal development. So don't be scared that uh, somebody's going to get so sweet that they're going to leave. Just make sure they keep on pouring into themselves, right? So um, just like when I was um, in the military, uh, I was literally in charge of, I think the most people I was ever charged of was a thousand people at one time. And of course, I couldn't do it with every person, but every time I uh, contacted or every time I came in contact with somebody, I was trying to, you going to school? What you doing? Um, are you working out? Uh, are you reading? What are you doing? So you want to make sure that you've got the best people on your team. So human capital is basically just, like I said, employee skill set. The more human capital you have, the better your team is, the more sharp they are. All right, let's go ahead and get to the next video. All right, gang. So when you become the boss of all bosses, when you're in charge, you kind of want to think about a few different things when it comes to adopting a certain cloud strategy or a certain cloud provider. Or if you're thinking about pretty much creating an all new cloud strategy of your own. So one thing is time to market. So time to market is just a fancy way of saying, how long is it gonna take for us to make it and then actually deploy it and start using it? Next thing is skill availability. Do I have the group of people here already that can actually make this or I might have to find another team or is it whatever I want can I even afford that group of people that's going to need to create the cloud the way I want it to be created uh, support if you deploy the cloud if support is needed if something breaks how does that work how is it going to be provided is that going to be in-house or are you going to use a third party or you're going to go search out for someone else uh, managed services. So are the servers and the stuff on the servers going to be managed by you or is it going to be managed by somebody else? That's something that's super important. Are you going to have an in-house IT team or is that going to be delegated to somebody else? Another thing, uh, two words that's going to come up a lot um, if you've been in IT for any amount of time, if you take uh, IT certification, especially a CompTIA certification, open source and proprietary. So some vendors are proprietary, others are open source. So proprietary means that, hey man, this is our stuff. You can only use this stuff with our stuff and things that we approve. You can't make no changes, can't do nothing extra. This is our stuff. Open source means that you can improve stuff, take away stuff, add stuff, pretty much do what you want to it if it's open source without worrying about getting sued or worried about anybody writing you any kind of nasty letters. Proprietary means that, hey man, this is our stuff. Don't belong to nobody else. We only want you to use it with what we say use it with and how we say use it. Open source, you can kind of do whatever you want. So um, we talked about documentation a little bit in the previous lectures. So this, is some documents that are super important. So we got an SOW and an SLA. So SOW is a statement of work. So it's a detailed overview of 
the whole shebang and bang. So that's kind of like, okay, this is what we're going to do. Do you agree with the budget? Do you agree what we're going to do? Do you agree with the time frame we're going to do it in? So um, it's a way to share what the project entails with those who are working on the project, whether they are collaborating or contracted to work on the project. So the statement of work is pretty much just a document that summarizes what's going to happen, who's going to do what, just so everybody has a clear understanding of what's supposed to happen. Now, another super important document is a SLA or a service level agreement. So a service level agreement is the particular aspects of the service quality availability responsibilities that are agreed between the service provider and the service user so for example let's say you got a cloud provider and you sign an sla with them they say hey we'll create the cloud we'll create the infrastructure but we will not deploy it the service level agreement that's what their level of service is we're going to create it but it's up to you to deploy it and maintain it makes sense so service level agreement is what level of service um, you and whoever you're talking to is going to provide. The SOW is just a statement of work. This is what's going to happen. Does everybody agree? Okay, evaluation. So this is super important. So after you sign the SOW, SLA, figured out who's going to do what, everybody's been paid, everything's okay, you need to have an evaluation period to see is what I'm doing, uh, what we decided to do, is that working? How do we evaluate that? How do we equate that? Is everything working to the benefit of not only the user, but also the organization? So once the vendor has been chosen and documents have been signed, an evaluation of the cloud vendor services needs to happen. So usually what you do is have a pilot. So a pilot is pretty much just like a temporary trial. It's kind of like, okay, we're gonna do a pilot program for two weeks. And it's two weeks, we're gonna see if it sucks or if it doesn't suck. If it doesn't suck, we're going to keep on rocking out with it and evaluate it more. But if it's just a total dud, same like we took an L, we're going to stop it, and then we're going to reevaluate what we need to do, where our shortcomings are. Is it on us? Is it on somebody else? So on and so forth. Uh, proof of value. Another thing is uh, making sure that it's actually valuable. Like I said, whatever you set up in the statement of work, whatever you found in the feasibility study, all that stuff should be from the proof of value. That's how the cloud would actually prove that it's valuable and that it was a good idea. A proof of concept is pretty much the same thing. Okay, the way we set up the infrastructure, the way we thought things were gonna go is that what actually happened in real life. Last but not least, you need to set up success criteria. What does success look like? Is success that it's only available 70% of the time or is success that it's available 99% of the time? Is the success criteria that we stay under 50,000 or is the success criteria that we don't go over 500,000? In this lecture, we're gonna talk about access control. So when we talk about the cloud and we talk about anything, one of the number one things that you want to make sure is that a person is who they say they are, right? So the cloud makes accessing your data convenient. Unfortunately, most times, the more convenient something is, the less secure it is. So for this reason, just like I said, you want to make sure that somebody is who they say they are. So you can do this through identity access control. So one cool thing, after somebody authenticates, after somebody puts in their password, after somebody verifies that they say who they are, there's something called single sign-on. So that means that you are authenticated by one platform, but you actually have access to several platforms. So just like that picture on the left, it says sign in with Google. So a lot of other platforms, you can sign in with another platform. So just like if you sign into Facebook, you can sign into your Instagram via Facebook. You already authenticated through Facebook, so you can sign in with the same password, already have access through single sign-on through your Facebook account. You don't have to put in a new password, right? Um, just like a lot of platforms allow you to sign in with Google, if you sign into your Gmail, you can actually sign into another platform. So a way to keep things super, super safe is doing multi-factor authentication, which means that somebody can't just put in a password and get authenticated and gain authorization to a platform. They're going to have to use several different things to authenticate. So multi-factor, not factor, multi-factor authentication, all right? So a user will have to use multiple factors, two or more, to gain access to a server. Example, 
password and key card or fingerprint and password. So understand the factors are as follows. Something the user is, something the user knows, something the user has. Something the user is will be biometrics. So fingerprints, iris scans, those types of things. Something the user knows would be password or a pen. Something the user has would be a key card or something physical, okay? So it has to be two or more of those factors for it to be multi-factor. Something the user is, something the user knows, something the user has. In the comments, I want you to drop an example of multi-factor authentication. So two or more of those factors, give me some uh, good ideas in the comments. Another thing that's a really big deal is data analytics. So data analytics kind of gives you a good picture of what's actually going on. Cause you may feel that certain things are happening or this is why you're having a, um, a good year in your organization. This is why you're having a bad year in your organization but data analytics will show you, hey man, this is where you're messing up. So data analytics is a science of analyzing raw data in order to make conclusions about that information. Analyzing this data allows cloud providers to provide a better experience for users. So you can see exactly how long people are staying on, when does it seem like people are logging up, when are people having issues or they having certain issues when they're logging in or having certain issues when they're trying to log out or are they having a long time actually trying to get inside the platform. It allows you to give a better user experience um, to the end user. So these next two terms are something that comes up um, a lot. Um, machine learning and artificial intelligence. So machine learning is a branch of artificial intelligence. It's focused on building applications that learn from data and improve their accuracy over time without being programmed to do so. So uh, machine learning, real simple, is a machine that learns how to do processes better over time. So after it does something 100 times, it makes little tweaks, it makes little adjustments and says, okay, I think I can shave off maybe 30 seconds of us building this application if I tweak and do this. So machine learning, it actually learns on its own, right? So as it does things repetitively over and over and over and over again, each time it tries to do it more effectively and more efficiently. So that is a part of artificial intelligence. And the main overarching theme or the main reason for artificial intelligence is allowing a machine, a program or software to do human-like tasks. So it's artificial intelligence, all right? So it's something that a human used to do or would do, but a machine or application is actually doing. So AI makes it possible for machines to learn from experience. That's what we talked about with machine learning, adjust to new inputs and perform human-like tasks. So basically with machine learning or artificial intelligence, over time, uh, especially like um, if you have a repetitive task as far as, uh, let's see, like if somebody's on an assembly line and they're putting together certain cars or they're putting together certain machinery, the person is pretty much going to do the same thing every time. As far as the AI and the machine learning put together, over time, it's going to be doing the same thing too. But eventually it's going to start making little tweaks and it's probably going to eventually end up being a lot faster and a lot more efficient than um, the human is, right? So that may sound scary. I don't know. Terminator, I don't think it's going to go that far. Uh, if it does, uh, we've got bigger things to worry about. But um, in short, if that's the reason why I'm glad you guys are in this class. And hopefully you're going to get more certifications because with artificial intelligence and machine learning, a lot of those repetitive tasks that people don't want to do anyway, but they're getting paid um, to do are going to get replaced by um, artificial intelligence and machine learning because most um, assembly jobs now anyway are by robots and stuff like that because like I said a, a person doing it over and over and over and over again they can get tired they can get sleepy they can mess up not be paying attention they could get hurt not so much with the machine so um, another um, thing I want to talk about is big data so big data means that if there's just a ridiculous amount of of data, like instead of a gigabyte, let's say that you have a hundred zeta bytes. You just got a uh, amount of data that's almost humanly incomprehensible. Like I can't even understand all this stuff. There's specific software that is meant specifically for big data. So if you have big data software, is that you have an a, a, just a 
a, a ridiculous amount of stuff and a ridiculous amount of data that you're trying to uh, figure out uh, certain similarities, trying to figure out what is this data really saying? What is what is the different categories? Uh, what do I what can I get from this data? What is the information? Because there's so much information, you don't even know where to start. Right. So that is what um, a big data program uh, will do and it'll allow you to see um, your business or your organization from a whole. You can uh, actually uh, compare it to uh, other organizations and trends because you may have 100 years worth of data and it's going to be kind of hard for you to sift through that stuff. Um, let's talk about the blockchain. So um, with the boom of cryptocurrency, this technology has become super duper important and has kind of come to the forefront. So uh, with cryptocurrency, I'm pretty sure you heard of Bitcoin, maybe Ethereum, uh, Litecoin, uh, cryptocurrency. This is not a damn uh, cryptocurrency course, but just really fast. Uh, cryptocurrency is a digital currency or a digital currency where you can buy, sell and trade without an uh, intermediary, intermediary such as a bank. All right. So. The underlying technology of cryptocurrency is blockchain. So um, a blockchain is the simplest um, time, excuse me, in the simplest terms, is a timestamp series of immutable records and data that is managed by a cluster of computers not owned by a single entity. This allows the flexibility of not always relying on the big guys, such as Google Drive, Azure, 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 etc. Blockchain can provide market efficiency, security and transparency, and decentralized benefits. So market efficiency through the blockchain. The blockchain shows you exactly where stuff came from, right? And then you don't have to wait. You don't have to ask for permission. You don't have to do any of that. And it's security and transparency because you know exactly who the uh, who sent it, who it's coming from, and security through the blockchain because all the information is encrypted. All right, so it's supposed to be encrypted. It's supposed to be kept safe. And then decentralized is what I was talking about. No one person actually governs the blockchain. No one person can cut you off. Not one person or one entity or one organization has uh, complete and total power. First up, artificial intelligence or AI. What is it? Artificial intelligence is simply any code, technique, or algorithm that enables machines to mimic, develop, and demonstrate human cognition or behavior. We are in what many refer to as the era of weak AI. The technology is still in its infancy and is expected to make machines capable of doing anything and everything humans do in the era of strong AI. To transition from weak AI to strong AI, machines need to learn the ways of humans. The techniques and processes which help machines in this endeavor are broadly categorized under machine learning. Machines learn in predominantly two ways. Their learning is either supervised or unsupervised. In supervised learning, machines learn to predict outcomes with help from data scientists. In unsupervised learning, machines learn to predict outcomes on the go by recognizing patterns in input data. When machines can draw meaningful inferences from large volumes of data sets, they demonstrate the ability to learn deeply. All right, again, let's talk about migration types. So when you're thinking about moving to the cloud, when you're thinking about upgrading the cloud, when you're thinking about moving from some old stuff to some new stuff or just starting from scratch, there's a couple of different ways to do that. So we got rip and replace, we got lift and shift, and we got phase. So uh, rip and replace is the most uh, labor intensive. So it's pretty much starting from the ground up. You rip out the old stuff and you replace it with some new stuff. All right, so it's a complete redesign of the application from scratch using only cloud native components. So that's the most labor intensive. Most times it's the most time consuming because you're pretty much starting from the beginning. Lift and shift. So this one uh, is migrating your application associated data to the cloud with minimal or no changes. So it's pretty much we're doing what we're doing, what's been working. Well, let's just move it to the cloud. All right. Instead of having um, all our stuff physically here, let's move it to a cloud infrastructure. Let's have it hosted by somebody else. Let's move our stuff to the cloud. So lift and shift is usually um, the least time consuming as well. And a lot of times it's the least expensive. So rip and replace is probably going to be the most time consuming and the most expensive, while lift and shift is going to be the exact opposite. Then there's a different, or last but not least, is a little bit of both, is phase. So 
This breaks down a cloud migration into phases such as planning, plotting, and commissioning. Now, this can be just as long as rip and replace, or it can be shorter. But most times you're going to get a better experience if you do phase, right? Because you're pretty much going to plan out everything, every little minor detail. Okay, first, let's plan it out. All right, now let's do a test pilot program. Then after that, we actually deploy it to make sure that it works for everybody. Talk about cloud operations. We're going to talk about DevOps. And we're also going to talk about the financial impacts that can come about when we talk about cloud computing whether that means implementing cloud computing or the impact of not implementing cloud computing and the maintenance and all the things that go into actually maintaining a cloud infrastructure. Sound good? So you already know what I'm gonna say. Make sure that you have fun, make sure that you keep grinding and make sure that you soak up all of the game that's inside of this domain, all right? That rhymed, good job. Let's go ahead and dive right into it. Let's talk about data management. So data, is super important right that's pretty much what the cloud is made up of whether it's your baby pictures or whether it's some top secret documents that the government don't want you to see um it's a bunch of data on the actual cloud servers so replication is super important replication improves redundancy Re something that's redundant meaning that it happens over and over and over and over again now um, if that's you getting cussed out, it's probably a bad thing. But when it comes to data, you want to replicate it and want it to be as redundant as possible. So if something gets damaged, if something gets deleted, if something gets corrupted, you have a backup to whatever that data is. So if it messes up, you can come back up pretty quickly because you replicated that data a bunch of times. Another thing that's important is locality, right? So the location of the data, where is it? How far is it away? Um, that could improve or make latency worse. And latency is how long things take because something is super far away. It may take a long time for you to connect. Or if it's overseas or out of the country, things might be happening in that country and at a location that you're not aware of, whether it's earthquakes, natural disasters, conflicts, certain things that may go on that that cloud server or management system may not be available as much as you'd like. So make sure that you know the locality. Um, another thing, like we said, redundancy is important. And that redundancy a lot of times comes from having multiple servers, having multiple copies of data, and how and when you back up. So you want to make sure that you're not backing up stuff all the time. Let's say that you have um, a petabyte of data. You don't want to be backing up all of that data at one time. And also, you don't want to be backing up that data when there's a lot of people on the actual cloud network. So we've talked about data and data analytics. You will look at those analytics to see when are people on at um, the most busiest times, and then you will make sure that you're not backing up stuff at those times. Because like I said, you don't want any conflicts, you don't want anything weird to happen. So after looking at those analytics, you will push out a uh, memo or push out a note and say, hey man, at this time, we're going to be backing stuff up. So certain areas of the cloud may not be available, so on and so forth. So people will know exactly when um, the stuff is going to happen, right? So you can either back do a full backup. You need to do a full backup from time to time. But just remember, that's going to be the most time consuming. And that's going to be everything. It's going to be backing up everything. An easier way or a better way would be to do a full backup. Then after that, do either a differential or incremental backup. Now, those types of backups, it's just going to back up the new stuff, right? So instead of backing up the whole shebang and bang, it's just going to back up the stuff that's new since the last full backup, all right? So these three things are important replication, locality, and your backup methodology. So availability. So you just want to make sure that when somebody click on the cloud or click on a folder that it's actually available. Nobody kind of wants to hear you know, stuff is down. Now things happen, like I said, if it's, you know, every once and every once and again, that's cool. Like the biggest things go down, Instagram goes down, uh, YouTube goes down from time to time. But if, you know, two or three times a week, you know, stuff is going down and stuff is having issues, that's going to be a problem. So you want to have different zones. Zones improve fault tolerance. So fault tolerance is how tolerant your 
organization, your network, your cloud is to faults. Faults can be errors, outages, so on and so forth. And you want to make sure that you have a network and a cloud server that's as fault tolerant as possible. Because if it's not fault tolerant, it's going to be a lot of outages. You'll have a lot of pissed off users and you won't be able to have uh, access to your data as well. So you can increase uh, fault tolerance through having several data centers that have independent power, networking, and cooling. So you have redundancy, right? You have your local cloud servers, then you have redundancy, then you have, maybe that's in Chicago, then you have a backup of that cloud center and server in Nebraska, then you have a backup to that cloud server and center in Detroit, you have a backup to that one in, what's another, in New York, right? So that way, if the main server blows up and breaks and that network goes down, that building sets on fire, you have another backup. If that one have, blows up too, you have another one. Just remember, you want to be as redundant as possible. Now, when you become the boss of all bosses, you want to make sure that you're paying attention to costs because the more centers that you have and the more independency that these different zones have, the more costs you're going to incur. So another thing is uh, the geographical uh, redundancy. So geographical redundancy or geo redundancy will replicate your data and store this backup data in separate physical locations just in case one site fails. So that's pretty much what we just talked about. All right. So geographical redundancy, having each zone, having each structure, having each place pretty much be independent of itself. So if something happens somewhere else, it won't directly affect that one. Because if it did, there would be no part of having redundancy or you wouldn't have redundancy. All right, so when it comes to the cloud or it comes to anything, you always wanna make sure that you're optimizing as much as possible. All right, so there's two different ways we do this. We can do auto scaling or we can do right sizing. So auto scaling, it automatically does this. It automatically adjusts capacity to maintain steady, predictable performance at the lowest possible cost. Now, right sizing takes that a step further. So right sizing takes cost effectiveness, I just said that, a step further by continually analyzing instant performance and usage needs and patterns and then turning off idle instances. So basically meaning that if we're not using this, we're not going to get charged for this. We're going to turn it off. If we're not using this virtual server, if we're not using this virtual machine, if we're not using this part of the network, let's just shut that uh, part of the network down until somebody else requests it, until somebody else actually needs it. So we're not getting caught calls. So we're not getting charged for those costs. Makes sense. So optimization is super important. Let's talk about provisioning. So there's a buzzword called DevOps. So DevOps combines development and operations. It's a mixture of both. So this kind of provides a seamless experience for users. This allows for continuous integration and delivery. So we can integrate new features. We can integrate new options and still deliver those features without any interruption or anything like that. So something that makes DevOps a lot easier and a lot more seamless and a lot less of a heavy load for organizations is something called infrastructure as code. So we talked about past SaaS. Let's talk about infrastructure as code. So a cloud infrastructure can be provision or deprovision. So we can make it or we can dismantle it. So depending on the low, IAC automates a lot of the processes to take the developers out of it. So just so you know, when you need to make an application, when you need to create a cloud, there is some code that goes behind that. And a coder is a developer, all right? So a developer, coder, pretty much an interchangeable term. So when you use infrastructure as code, you're kind of using a template, you're kind of using a pre-made structure or infrastructure, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So this process eliminates the need for developers to manage servers, operating system storage and other elements every time they need to test, develop or deploy software. So infrastructure as code pretty much uses a foundation that we kind of know already works and we can just deploy it. We can go ahead and do what we need to do because it should already work. So we're gonna use this code as our infrastructure. It works for this other organization, it worked for this other place. So let's use it here and it should work. So infrastructure as code is gonna make things a lot easier. So when you're developing a software, when you're developing 
software for the cloud, just in general. A lot of times what you want to do is make sure that that program or that service runs in a sandbox. So a sandbox is a technical term that pretty much means that this program, this software is going to run in isolation away from everything else. So the things that happen inside of that sandbox shouldn't affect the things outside that sandbox. So when developing cloud software or an application, a technique called sandboxing should be used. This allows programs to run in a separate environment and not interfere with other programs if errors occur. So after you finish creating the application, the software, setting up the cloud, you want to see what kind of load can it bear. So you need to kind of know the threshold. You kind of need to know the baseline to see, okay, once we get to this point, it's probably going to break, all right? Because you always want to know that so you can just keep that baseline so you can keep things running. So if you need to upgrade or throttle back or throttle up, you can do that. So you want to place it under a load to see, okay, how much can we put on this application server program, whatever, before it breaks so you know that before you actually start doing it in real time. Because if you do it in real time, it's going to be all bad. All, 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 all bad. Another thing is called regression testing. So regression testing pretty much sees, okay, is everything okay? If everything is not okay, let's regress or let's go back to when it was working. So let's say we upgrade some products, upgrade some features, add a couple of things, and then things start going crazy and acting weird. That's what regression is for. It actually sees, okay, have we optimized? Is everything okay? Is anything suffering after we made those recent changes? Last but not least, API integration. So API application program interface is a set of routines, protocols, and tools for building software application. API integration is a connection between two or more applications via their APIs. That lets those systems exchange data between each other. So this is a really quick lecture. API, we went over infrastructure as code. Just remember, infrastructure is code. We want to uh, kind of drive that home. Infrastructure is code, makes things a lot simpler. Auto makes a lot of processes, so you don't have to do a lot of the heavy lifting as a developer. So in this domain, we're going to talk about cloud security. So cloud compliance, cloud security, how to safeguard against attacks, and just how to set up a cloud so it'll be as advantageous and as secure as possible for the user as well as the organization. Hey gang, we'll be doing something a little different in this lecture. Let's go through some scenario-based questions. So let's break down some scenarios and see how you guys would actually go after it. We're going to be talking about some finance stuff, and I just want to see how you guys would handle these situations. Master IT has been conducting tests on a brand new algorithm to increase response time on an app. The very next bill seems to be significantly higher than expected. Which report should be analyzed first? Okay, gang, hopefully you picked network reports. So depending on the load put on the network, depending on how many people are using the network, a lot of times what's going to happen is that if the response time is lagging, if it's not as fast as you want it to be, it's probably because the network has been overtaxed. So that means that a lot of the servers are working a lot longer than they have to. Uh, a lot of the data plans that we have may be going overboard. So that would be an indication. And that would be the first thing I would look at. Okay, are we over our baseline as far as the network? And then you can look at your network report and it will tell you, okay, usually every day or every month we use this amount of bandwidth, we use this amount of gigabytes, so on and so forth. And if we're over that, we can try and figure out, okay, is it certain times or is it certain people or is there a certain department that this is going over? And then we can go ahead and move from there. Julius wants to ensure batch jobs are completed in a cost-effective manner that is much faster than what we've been doing. Which of the following would be the best solution? Okay, hopefully you guys picked utilize spot instances. So what that means is that only for right now, only for right now, okay, we got all these jobs, we wanna batch all these jobs together, we wanna bundle all these jobs together, so we're just gonna use this spot instance for right now. 
it's only going to be active we're only going to have to pay for the time that we actually using it so if we utilize a spot instance we don't have to worry about a subscription monthly this is going to be a one-time shebang and bang after we get finished with this batch job it may be 20 jobs at once once we get finished with that we can shut down the spot instance and we won't have to pay for it anymore and that would be the most cost effective solution jerry is a new cloud admin for a small startup he decides to use spot instances to reduce overall costs with the cloud infrastructure what is a critical factor that the instance must handle all right one of the most critical factors is the application needs to handle unpredictable instance terminations which means that if an instance is just stopped abruptly if it's automatically turned off if it's just something power goes out it needs to know how to handle that termination it needs to know that okay that termination lost power that termination lost connection let's stop charging that person and let's report back and let's figure out what's wrong and let's start fixing it so it needs to be able to handle unpredictable terminations because things happen and if it has an error that it can't recover from that's a bad thing because remember we want it to be fault tolerant as possible so we want it to be as tolerant as possible to faults and if the application can't handle unpredictable instance terminations it's going to be a bad day for everybody involved probably if you are using a perpetual license for an application which of the following would be the most cost effective in the cloud Okay, gang, for this, the most cost effective would be BYOL. BYOL, as we remember, is bring your own license. E-U-L-A is end user license agreement. That, that wouldn't really apply to this. Subscription most likely would not be as cost effective as bring your own license. And then fix most definitely wouldn't be because there is no variables. It's just the price is the price. So BYOL, BYOL or bring your own license usually takes a lot of the extra cost out of it. And that would be the best thing for this scenario. So um, one thing I want to point out is that when you're actually in the exam room, when you're actually taking the test, make sure that you pay attention to the questions. If you can see, most of the questions would say, what's the first thing you should do? What's the best solution? What is the most cost effective make sure that you're paying attention to that and don't jump to conclusions before you fully understand the question and the answer all right gang when it comes to security one thing that you want to try and figure out is how you're going to handle risk all right so risk is defined as someone or something that could cause a problem or loss risk associated with cloud computing needs to be assessed frequently daily quite often so an assessment or an app when it comes to assessments you want to look at your assets right what assets do i have how much do they cost and what risks are associated with having those assets right so you want to have an inventory how much does this stuff cost what are the risks associated with having these assets and if these assets break from these risks what's going to happen so different risks have different categories or different levels so you have low risk so it's, if a low risk happens if something happens that's low risk it's not going to completely cause a failure. Nobody's going to die. It won't be catastrophic. Medium risk or moderate risk would be, okay, this is an issue. There may be some business impact. There may be some loss of revenue. There may be some loss of connectivity. There may be some loss of availability of data, of the cloud. Now, high risk is something that's catastrophic, right? If a high risk thing actually occurs and you don't have a way to deal with it, that could be business failure that can mean loss of life that could mean complete eradication or deletion of data so you have to categorize different risks and figure out how to handle them right so there's a couple of different ways you can handle risks you can try and mitigate them you can accept them you can try and avoid them or you can transfer them so mitigation just means okay i know this is a risk let me try and figure out some processes, some protocols, some ways to lessen the impact of this risk. All right, so you try and reduce the threats and the impact associated with that risk through mitigation. 
Now, acceptance a lot of times is when it's just something that you can't avoid. It's just like something like, I, I don't know what to do. So basically, let's say like you have a um, an event uh, company, right? So you put on events. Most of the events are outside. One thing that you have to accept that's a risk is that it may rain. It may be lightning. You know, some stuff may be uh, damaged with the rain. You have to accept that stuff, right? And at the same time, you can actually avoid that risk altogether by not doing anything that is in the stormy season. So maybe not holding any events in April, or if you look at the forecast and say that, hey, it's going to rain, let's not do it at that time. Well, sometimes, you know, things happen out of nowhere, just start raining, and it may be something that you need to accept. Now, avoidance, right? I just use that example with a planning company, but sometimes if you avoid a risk, it can be a lot more expensive than you would think, right? So let's say that in the cloud, right? You know it's a risk to have data that is unsecure, to have data that is accessible to everybody. Just, you know, it's your baby pictures, your birth certificate, uh, your tax returns, everything is in this folder, but everybody can use it, everybody can see it. There's a lot of risks associated with that. And if you just say, hey, I'm just gonna avoid it, and I ain't gonna worry about it, it won't be that big of a deal that can have a high risk of pretty much stuff going uh, completely bad for you. Now, transfer, uh, which is last but not least of how you would deal with risk would be like insurance, right? So you're transferring the risk to somebody else. So let's say that we had that um, event plan in place and we said, hey, we're gonna get all this stuff insured. So if the stuff at the venue or the stuff at the event gets damaged, the insurance company is gonna pay for it. You're transferring risk when you get auto insurance, you're transferring risk when you get homeowners insurance. Transferring risk just means that all the risk, if something go left, somebody else is gonna be paid for, if somebody's gonna, somebody else is gonna pay for it, somebody else is gonna be responsible for it. All right, so talking about risk, um, you wanna look at this from a high level view, right? You and your team and everybody wanna look at what are all the risks that we, can think of what are all the risks that may happen. Because sometimes you may be so busy, you may have other things to do, that you don't even think about all the risks associated. You know, somebody else may be able to point out a risk that you weren't thinking about. So that's what a good risk register comes in, right? So a risk register is a document that continues or contains the information about identified risks, results of risk analysis. So results of risk analysis, when you do the risk analysis, that's when you should come up with the risk and then the category, is it a lower risk, is it a moderate, moderate risk, or is it a high risk? As well as risk response plans. So you got the impact of the risk and you also got a response. So, okay, this is what's gonna happen. If this happens, this is how we need to respond. So that's gonna be prevent, I cannot talk today. Is everybody okay? Am I okay? I don't know. So anyway, <laughs> you have two different uh, responses. You have preventative, and then you're going to have retroactive, right? So preventative is going to try and be like, okay, this is what we're going to do to prevent it, whether it's mitigating the risk, transferring it, accepting it, so on and so forth. And then the retroactive is going to be, okay, after it actually happens, after everything goes left, what are we actually supposed to do? Who are we supposed to call? What are we supposed to document? What are we supposed to turn on? What are we supposed to turn off? All right, so you also use a risk register to monitor and control risk during the whole project life cycle. All right, gang, to make things run smooth in your organization, you need to have standard operating procedures. Pretty much when this happens, this is what we do. So this is a standard of what we do. You know, when we're doing actual work, we got SOPs. What's the SOP for security? What's the SOP for communications? What's the SOP for data? What's the SOP for employee relations, so on and so forth. So you have standard operating procedures to make things easier for the boss and everybody underneath them. So pretty much everybody is on the same page. So a SOP guides current and new employees on how to perform their duties and the way the organization intends. So I know all you guys are super smart, but when you start working at NASA or Google, you can't just go in there rocking out doing whatever you want to do. It's going to be standard operating procedures, who you need to talk to, what files you need to open, what documents you need to sign, what you need to say, what's important, what's not important. You can't just rock out, um, even if it's in your own organization, just to make things fluid and everything run smooth, everybody needs to be on the same page. So there's a couple of different 
policies and standard operating procedures that you need to follow just to make things pretty easy. So one of the big ones is access control. So access control is a method of guaranteeing that users are who they say they are and that they have the appropriate access to company data. So if a person is who they say they are, you can go ahead and authenticate them, make sure that they know who they are because you don't want the janitor having the same access control as the damn CEO. That would be um, a bad idea. Communication. So that pretty much would just be like chain of command. That would be, okay, let's handle stuff in-house before we go all the way to the top, right? So just like whatever job you work at, you probably have a direct supervisor. You probably need to go to that crew chief, to that shift leader, to that human resources person, to that supervisor, right? Instead of going to the head of HR or going to the head of the company or going to the CEO. All right. So there's pretty much a chain of command just so communication flows freely. Right. Because sometimes if you go around people that can create animosity um, that can actually get you in trouble. So long story short, just make sure that you understand the communication policies. Who am I supposed to talk to? If that doesn't work, where do I go after that? So on and so forth, just to make things run smooth. And then you got to think about it. A lot of times, even though this may not be something that we enjoy, a lot of times you're around these people more than you're around your own family. So you want to make sure that there isn't any bad blood or any weird stuff going on. So just make sure you understand the communication policy. So with security policies, one of the biggest things is incident response. When something goes wrong, what the hell am I supposed to do, right? Just to make sure that nothing goes weird. So when you get a new job, a lot of times you have to sign a lot of paperwork. A lot of times you don't even read a lot of paperwork, but you should. So just to make sure that if we got an attack, what am I supposed to do? If I trip over one of the server wires and all the servers go down, who do I talk to? Who do I call? What am I supposed to do? If I'm going to go on vacation, what am I supposed to, what am I supposed to do? Is there something I can't talk about as far as security is uh, related? Can I talk about my project that I'm working on? You got to make sure that if there's an incident, if there's a breach, if there's a loss of data, if there's a loss of power, what am I supposed to do? So you got to make sure that you have those things in place. Now, change management. So change management is pretty much what you think it is. Change management is the management of a change. Now, being human, a lot of times you get into a routine and you don't like change. You're adverse to change. So that's why change management is a thing. It tries to make the change as fluid and as seamless as possible, and then to make sure that nothing is interfered with or nothing is completely jacked up during the change and after the change. So it's pretty much, what do we do before the change? What are we supposed to do during the change? And then what are we supposed to do after the change? So change management is a structured approach to implementing change in an organization, it includes preparing for, managing, and reinforcing the change. So when changes occur, resource management needs to be monitored closely. These resources can include tangible resources such as hardware, infrastructure, networking devices and storage media, and intangible stuff such as software and licenses. So this is pretty much straightforward. When there's a change, you need to make sure that you know what resources are gonna be needed. So, okay, are we gonna need more of these resources or less? And then, like I said, just making sure that the people that's gonna be a part of the change are pretty much kept in the loop. They know exactly what's going on and that you know nobody's showing up like, damn, what the hell? What's going on? Why are we changing this? Why are we moving stuff there? What's going on? What am I supposed to do? You want pretty much everybody that's a part of the change and that's going to be affected by the change to be in the loop so they can prepare for it. And then they can actually be in the change, help the change, help the change move on a little bit quicker and reinforce the change once it's implemented. If people are part of the change, they're, they'll be less resistant to it. There'll be less like, oh, why the hell are we doing this? Right? So you just want to make sure that you make them a part of the process. Hey gang, believe it or not, this is our last hurrah. This is our last lecture. This is our last domain. And no better way to end it other than talking about security. So let's get straight into it. So when you're talking about security, there's two different types of things that you're going to run into. A threat and a vulnerability. So a threat is any type of danger which can damage, steal data, create a disruption, or cause harm in general. Now, on the other hand, a vulnerability is a weakness in hardware, software, personnel, or procedures which may be exploited by a threat in order to achieve their goals. So understand a vulnerability is something that's a weakness. A vulnerability can be lack of employee training. When we talked about in the last lecture, 
An employee not knowing how to respond to an incident could be a vulnerability, right? Because they're not knowing how to respond. Because you know, when every time or any time something happens, an incident, time is of the essence. You have to make sure that you respond as quickly as possible to mitigate as much damage as possible, okay? So a threat and a vulnerability. So a vulnerability is something that's looked at as a weakness or something that you didn't shore up or something that can be exploited by a threat. A threat is anything that's actually and actively trying to harm your organization, trying to harm you and trying to do something that's gonna be detrimental to you, your employees, and just the overall well-being of the organization. So a way to minimize the impact and mitigate the impact of threats and vulnerabilities, you can do a penetration test, right? So a penetration test is when a hacker, and if you're in my Security Plus class or any of our other cybersecurity classes, you already know a hacker is not always a bad thing. There are good hackers and bad hackers. So a ethical hacker can do a penetration test for you and a penetration test will actually show you what is wrong with your organization's security posture. So a penetration test, you would have an ethical hacker, me, somebody else, you would have an organization come in and they would actually try to hack your organization. They would try and hack the cloud servers. They would try social engineering on your employees. They would try various ways to penetrate your network security, right? No matter how many layers you have. And then with that information, they will say, hey, man, this is how we got into the servers. This is how we got past the firewalls. This is how we did this. This is how we did that. And with that information, you will use that to shore up the vulnerabilities. So any threats that may happen, you should be able to circumvent them. Makes sense? So a penetration test is pretty much you have somebody, you pay somebody to break your network, and then they tell you how you broke it so you can fix it. Now, a vulnerability scan is pretty simple. So it pretty much just scans your network, scans your organizations, scans all the little small facets of your organization to show you some vulnerabilities. So as you grow, as you scale, as you add new employees, as you add new devices, there's more vulnerabilities. You have a bigger attack surface, okay? So you wanna make sure that you're looking at all the vulnerabilities constantly. To be honest, daily, you need to make sure that you're looking at all the vulnerabilities that may pop up and how you're gonna actually mitigate them. Now, a penetration test, you don't have to do that every day, every week, but at least quarterly. I would say every three months, you need to be having a penetration test just to make sure that your data and your organization is safe. Because just remember, a hacker's job is to hack. A hacker's job is to exploit. So whether they're doing good or they're doing bad, that's what the main thing is. They're working uh, continuously and tirelessly to exploit stuff and that can be detrimental to your organization because just remember not only are you worried about your data if you're head of organization you're worried about your employees data as well as your customers data as well because that can come with lawsuit and all type of stuff but if it's just you solo dolo you want to worry about your information because there's always somebody trying to get into it okay threat vulnerability penetration test and vulnerability test so data security, there's a couple different types of data, right? So we got public data, simple, that's available to everybody. Private data is available to somebody. So that's only select people have access to that information. Then another level would be sensitive data. So that takes private data a step further. So sensitive data should be encrypted, it should be kept safe, it should be inaccessible and protected from other people that do not have permission to access it. So private data is quote unquote private and it's not supposed to be looked at by other people, but if people get it, they can look at it. Now, sensitive data should take that a step further, like I said, so if people even get that data, they shouldn't be able to look at it because it's encrypted. So it should be under lock and key, whether that's a password, whether that's just encryption, it scrambles up the information to where it's hard to detect what it even says. There should be extra steps taken that if somebody doesn't have explicit permission to look at that data, they shouldn't be able to do so. Now, as far as data to keep it safe, to keep it on the up and up, you want to go with the three-step process or just three main ingredients to make sure that this stuff is going to be the way that you want it to be. 
So first thing is it needs to be confidential, confidentiality. So that's what we're saying about the sensitive stuff. You want to make sure that the data is encrypted. And with a password, with a with a phrase, with a pen, you need to have an extra layer of security to make sure that that data is always safe. And another thing, sometimes you don't want the data anymore. Sometimes you don't need the data anymore. But if that data fell into the wrong hands, it may det be detrimental to you or to, depending on your level, it may be you know, a danger to the United States as a whole or to the United Kingdom as a whole or to whatever your host nation is, it may be a danger to them. So another step is sanitation. So when we say sanitation um, or sanit sanitization, not sanitation, sanitation is the garbage man. We talk about sanitization. So sanitization, we know a lot, a lot about that thanks to Corona. Uh, so sanitization just means that you pretty much wipe the information clean. Nobody should be able to detect that there was any information there. Nobody should be able to recover the information was there. So when you sanitize data, that means that you wipe it clean, right? Get rid of all the bacteria, get rid of all residue, get rid of everything. When you sanitize information, there is no inf information. Nobody would know nothing was there. So confidentiality, integrity. Integrity means that the data is kept the same. There is no integrity flaws. There is no changes. There is no manipulation to the data. So as I talked about before, we would go deeper into this with our security courses, but there's something called a man in the middle attack. This won't be on the test, but just to give you a, a little bit of context. So there's something called a man in the middle attack. With a man in the middle attack, that would actually change the integrity of data because I would send you an email and a man in the middle attack was standing between me and you. So the email will go to the man in the middle, which is a software or a person. They will manipulate the information and then it will go to you. Sometimes they don't even manipulate the information. They may just snoop and say, oh, okay, this is what the email says and just use that information. They sell it, they manipulate it. They don't do anything with it. They just do espionage, so on and so forth, right? So integrity just validates that this information is the same way it was sent and it hasn't been changed. Availability. We talked about availability a bunch of times and we talked about backup and recovery options as well. So availability, just make sure that the stuff is available. So that can be done through redundancy, such as backup or if stuff is all the way bad and we got to recover it, Okay, where the, where the drive's at, where's the other site's at, when we talk about geo-redundancy, stuff like that, that would help in the recovery options and the backup. So if you want the full shebang bang when it comes to data, you want to have confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Hey gang, in this video, I'm going to tell you exactly what you need to do to get certified. Hey gang, it's Ron from icmaskey.com and my job is to help each and every one of you guys get certified. So I don't wanna waste anybody's time, right? Don't wanna waste your time. So what I'm gonna do is tell you the truth right now. If you don't wanna get certified, specifically if you don't wanna use Master IT for training to get certified, this video may not be for you, okay? So if that's not you, go ahead and click off good luck on your journey so this is the most commonly asked questions i get about the zero to it hero program so stay tuned so you know exactly what to expect when you enroll so how long does it take to finish the zero to it hero program so the program is self-paced meaning that you can go as fast or as slow as you like but most students usually finish the program in about three to four months so usually recently people have been finishing in 90 days which is three months. So be looking at about three to four months of study time to get all the certifications that's within this program. Another question I get is, is there any live training? So believe it or not, the best instructor this side of the Mississippi, your favorite instructor, me, yours truly, actually is adding live training to the Zero to Hero program. Yep, you heard me right. Once a week, one time a week, we'll meet together as a family. Everybody's in the program and we'll go over the exams, the certification every week, we'll pick a different certification to talk about and to kind of give you that edge when you go inside of the exam room. And just because I want you guys to win, it's had no additional cost. Now, most times when programs add additional features, add extra stuff, they add to the price tag. I decided that this year and moving forward, I want you guys to win. 
and pretty much there's no way for you to lose if you have self-paced training but you can rock out whenever you want to and you have live training right you got the source but if you got any questions any comments any concerns i got you so when you enroll when do you actually start right now so go ahead and cut this video off click enroll and you will start right now there is no grace period there is no 24-hour hold there is no process as soon as you are enrolled as soon as you are deemed applicable fill out the application we accept you you will be able to start training right now like literally after you enroll you have complete access to everything that's in the zero to hero program so how long do you have access to the program so the program is self-paced right but you have one year you have one year to complete everything that is in the program why because it shouldn't take you more than a year especially when students are getting finished in three to four months also with these exams updating all the time and all this different type of stuff we want to make sure that you are in the proper window so one year you got an entire year which is more than enough time double triple the amount of time that you actually need to get certified and finish the program but to make the stuff real clear you get one year access now the program includes a myriad of different certifications a question that i get a lot of times is can i go in any order i want to you're an adult you can do whatever you want to but what we found is that we've created a certification success roadmap and if you follow that roadmap or students that follow that roadmap are a lot more successful so can you go in any order yes do we recommend that you go in any order no if you follow that roadmap you'll be successful so what if you're rocking out in a self-paced course and you have a question is there anybody that you can ask yes there's always somebody there so in every lecture in every program, in every course, you can actually leave a comment or a question. And within 24 hours, somebody will respond to that question. Don't want to wait 24 hours? No big deal. We have a community chat. We have a group of students just like you. I'm in a group chat. And also, it's everybody in the Master IT team in that group chat. So if it's not me that grabs, the question and answers it. It's going to be one of the team members or maybe even one of your fellow students. So you'll always have somebody there to answer any questions. That Say you that have. you enroll and the course isn't what you want it to be. It's not what you expected. That usually is not going to happen. I'm almost guaranteeing that's not what's going to happen, but let's say that it does. We have a 14 day money back guarantee. So if you enroll into the program and you say, hey, I'm not feeling within the first two weeks, we will refund you, no questions asked, right? So within the first two weeks, I don't like it. We'll give you your money back. We'll wish you well. Another question I get all the time is, is it free? We also provide bonus courses. So the core of the program is gonna be CompTIA certifications. The ITF Plus, the A plus, the net plus, and the security plus. Some of the most popular certifications in the industry. But to kind of sweeten the deal a little bit, we actually added Microsoft training. So you'll get Microsoft training for networking, Microsoft training for security, and Microsoft training for operating systems. Why do we choose Microsoft as additional bonus training? Because as of right now today, Microsoft operating systems are the number one operating systems in the world. We also introduced something called exam insurance. Now, sometimes when we take the exams, we're nervous. We got into a fight with our spouse. We got a flat tire on the way to the exam center. And we're just not in the right frame of mind when we're taking the exam and we end up failing the exam. That's why we introduce exam insurance. If you purchase exam insurance, we'll give you one additional retake for each exam. So to give you peace of mind, when you go in the exam room and things don't go the right way, don't worry about it. Just go take it again. Since we want to make sure that this is accessible to everybody, we have flexible payment options. So if the total cost of the course is too much for you, you can actually have a payment plan, a flexible payment plan that will allow you to stretch out the payments throughout the duration of the actual program. So again, this video should answer any question that you have. I got one question for you. When are you enrolling? If you want to enroll, just go to itmatchkey.com, click the three little dashes on the top right corner if you're on your mobile. If not, then the options will be displayed on the top bar. All you have to do is click apply to the Zero to IT Hero program. 
you will answer a few questions and if you qualify then you'll actually get a chance to hop on the phone with me and i'll go through what the next steps are everything in the program and just to see if the program is really for you because if the program isn't for you i'd rather you not enroll and i'll actually guide you in a different direction for a program or some people that can help you better than we can. I just want you to win, and even if I can't assist you, I'll help you and guide you to somebody who can. So other than that, I'll see you in class. <laughs>